Quicksilver by Dean Kuntz, performed by Todd Habercorn. Dedication. Draw your chair up close to the edge of the precipice, and I'll tell you a story. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part 1. Getting to know me. 1. My name is Quinn Quicksilver, or QQ to the mean kids when I was growing up. But I can't blame my parents because I don't know who they are. Soon after birth, I was abandoned on a lonely highway, seven miles outside of Pepto, Arizona, where 906 people pretended that the place where they lived was actually a town. Swaddled in a blue blanket, nestled in a white bassinet made of plastic thatching, I had been placed on the centermost of three lanes of blacktop where I was found shortly after dawn. Although you might not think that this was about as bad a start in life as one could have, I assure you it could have been worse. For one thing, this was coyote country. Had one of those creatures found me, it wouldn't have suckled me as did the wolf that saved abandoned Romulus, the founder of Rome, but instead would have regarded me as a grub hub delivery. I could also have been run over by an 18-wheeler and turned into pate for vultures. Fortunately, I was found by three men on their way to work. The first, Hakeem Kaspar, was a lineman for the county, as in that Glenn Campbell song I've always found lovely but weird, though at the time I was discovered on the highway. I hadn't yet heard it. The second, Bailey Belshazzar, worked as head mechanic at one of the country's first wind farms. The third, Caesar Melchizedek, was a blackjack pit boss in an Indian casino. According to a newspaper story at the time, Hakeem tucked me snugly in the passenger side footwell of his electric company truck and drove me to the county sheriff's office, with Bailey and Caesar following in their vehicles. Why they felt it necessary that all three should turn me into the law the newspaper didn't say. And this was all I knew of those men until years later and running for my life. I visited one of them with the hope of learning some small detail that might be a clue as to who or what I am. With a safety pin, a small envelope was fixed to the blanket in which I was wrapped. Neither Hakeem nor Bailey nor Caesar had dared to open it, evidently because they had watched too many years of CSI shows and feared that they would smear the kidnappers' fingerprints. Either they thought I had been snatched by some fiend who lost his nerve and left me to the mercy of fate on that hot morning, or they figured someone had nabbed my parents and were demanding a ransom for me. When the sheriff tore open the envelope, he found only a card on which was printed Quinn Quicksilver and my date of birth. In those days, no one in the state of Arizona had the surname Quicksilver. Nevertheless, everyone at once assumed that was my name. I have been saddled with it ever since. Of course, Quicksilver is another name for the liquid metal Mercury, which was named after the Roman god Mercury. He was the messenger of other gods, valued for his tremendous speed, the guy could accelerate like crazy. And though Quinn is a variation of Quentin, it also derives from the Latin Quintus, which means fifth, or in certain contexts, five times. So perhaps it wasn't my name, but a cryptic message meaning accelerate five times. Though you will not find this advice in any book about caring for a newborn any more than you will find the instruction, marinate in olive oil with basil leaves. I then became a ward of the county, the youngest ever dropped on that child care agency. No foster family was willing to take in a three-day-old whose only possession was a soiled swaddling blanket and who had, in the words of Sheriff Garvey Moncton, strange blue eyes and an eerily direct stare for such a tiny little cock. Consequently, I was sent out of county to Mater Misericordiae, an orphanage run by Catholic nuns in Phoenix. By the time I was six, it became clear that I was not adoptable. Among adoptees, infants are the most desirable age group, 
and they are usually placed in stable homes faster than you can say coochie coochie coo. This is because babies are generally cuter than older kids, with the possible exception of Rosemary's famous baby, but also because not enough time has passed for them to be screwed up by their birth parents. Each grinning infant is a personality waiting to happen, and therefore amenable to being sculpted into a reflection of those who adopt him. Although I was cute enough and willing to be shaped like clay, there were no takers for Quinn Quicksilver. My failure to find a forever home was not for a lack of trying on the part of the good sisters of Mater Misericordiae. They are as indefatigable and cunning as any order of nuns on the planet. They designed a marketing plan for me, prepared a fabulous PowerPoint presentation, and sold me to prospective parents as aggressively as Disney sells animated films about princesses or adorable animals. All to no avail. Years after the fact, I learned what explanations some would-be adopters had given for taking a pass on me, but... Perhaps I'll share their comments later. The orphanage was also a school, because kids six and up often had to live there until they were 18. The sisters who served as teachers were superb imparters of knowledge, and the kids knew better than to resist being educated. If you didn't live up to your potential, you would spend a lot of time washing dishes, peeling potatoes, and doing laundry, none of which was a task assigned to you if you were a diligent learner. The students of Modern Misericordia School always won city and state spelling bees, debate club matches, and science fair prizes. As a consequence, many of us were beaten up by some of the state's most accomplished young intellectuals. Generous supporters of the sisters provided college and trade school scholarships to those who wanted them, of which I wasn't one. I aspired to be a writer. Profound intuition told me that the wrong university creative writing program might hammer out of me anything original about my style and convert me into a lit bot. Sister Agnes Mary managed the placement office for those who weren't submitting to higher education. When I turned 17 and a half, she used samples of my writing to snare a job for me with the publisher of Arizona, a magazine about the wonders of the state and its people. I wasn't yet trusted to write about contemporary citizens, who were far more easily offended than were dead folks. Instead, I was assigned to research and write about interesting figures and places from the state's storied past, as long as I avoided brothels and bandits. On my 18th birthday, after just six months of successful employment, I was able to afford a studio apartment and move out of the orphanage. After 18 months at the magazine... I made a fateful mistake and have been in flight from dark forces ever since. I find it eerie that within a day of making that mistake, a full week before the consequences of it became clear, I had my first episode of what, for a while, I came to call strange magnetism, as if someone was writing my life, not the story of my life, but my life itself. Someone who knew the time was coming when I would need a substantial amount of cash in order to escape capture. This was a Friday in early May. Having completed my assignments for the week, I took the day off, intending to avoid exercise, load up on wicked carbs, and stream old Alien and Terminator movies until my eyes began to bleed. Instead... I grew restless before I'd eaten a single chocolate-covered donut, and I felt strangely compelled to get in my vintage Toyota and test the bald tires by driving out of the city into the desert. I distinctly remember saying to myself, What am I doing? Where am I going? Then I stopped asking because I realized that if I spoke in a slightly different voice and answered with a destination, I might be a case of multiple personality something to which I never aspired. Where I was going turned out to be not a ghost town, but a sort of ghost crossroads, not from the days of cowboys and prospectors in the 19th century, but from the 1950s. A section of a state highway had been made superfluous by an interstate. A Texaco service station, a restaurant, and a large Quonset hut of indeterminable purpose were left to be worried into ruins by a merciless desert sun, wind, insects, and time. 
I'd been there once before, six months earlier, getting the flavor of the place to write a little mood piece about it for Arizona Magazine. The big sign mounted on the roof of the restaurant had been faded by decades of fierce solar rays and had been shot full of holes by good old boys who thought that mixing strong drink and firearms was an entertaining way to pass an evening on little traveled back roads. Generally speaking, they had no wives to object and no girlfriends to offer more appealing distractions. Research had taught me that the restaurant had been called Santanello's Roadside Grill. I parked on the fissured, sun-paled blacktop, took a flashlight from the glove box, got out of my car, and approached Santanello's. The windows had been broken out long ago, and the front door had rotted off its hinges. Inside, lances of sunlight slashed through east-facing windows, forcing the shadows to retreat to the west side of the dining room, where they gathered as if conspiring. The booths, tables, and chairs had been sold off in 1956 along with the kitchen equipment. Wind had blown debris and decades of dust inside. No herpetologist I queried had been able to explain to me why a couple of dozen snakes had slithered here to die, mostly rattlers. When I had come exploring on the previous occasion, I'd freaked out until I realized they were air-dried, fossilized, lifeless. Nevertheless, on this return visit, I stepped carefully among them and went into what had been the kitchen. Although everything of value had long been stripped away, splintered wooden crates that had once held oranges and other produce were heaped against one wall, along with all manner of empty food tins. On my first visit, I had stirred through that flotsam, hoping that something in it would give me a hook for a poignant paragraph about how the Santanello's ship had run aground on the jagged rocks of progress, their lifelong work and dreams for a better future having been pirated from them. In those early days of my magazine career, I was as enthusiastic as a puppy, capable of a rare but embarrassing mixed metaphor in my earnest efforts to shake readers into an emotional response. That was long ago, and I am much more mature now that... As I write this, I've spent a year struggling to stay alive, while gradually uncovering and adjusting to the true nature of the world. Anyway, on that initial exploration, as I'd stirred the flotsam in the kitchen, something bright had reflected my flashlight beam and caught my eye. When I reached to pluck a scrap of yellowing paper off the object to fully reveal it, a disturbed tarantula erupted out of the debris and scampered up my arm, I knew the creature wasn't poisonous, that it wouldn't bite, that its kind were said to be gentle. That it was supposed to be the Mahandas Gandhi of arachnids. But when a hairy spider the size of a soccer ball, or so it seemed, is coming for your face, the fight-or-flight response kicks in big time. I staggered backward, managed to knock the beast off my arm, and lost all interest in whatever bauble had glittered in the trash. Now, inexplicably, I was back, searching with my flashlight, not for the tarantula, to which I didn't feel the need to apologize, but for the item from which the spider had frightened me away. I found it, a very old coin, judging by its sheen, pure gold. As I turned the heavy coin between my fingers, I marveled that my subconscious must have recognized what it was on the day of the tarantula and must have held that knowledge for months. However, why I would suddenly be impelled to return here after all this time was even more of a mystery than how such a coin had come to be in an abandoned restaurant and a once busy crossroads that now led nowhere in four directions. I left the lifeless snakes to rest in creepy peace and returned to the city, where I visited a shop that bought and sold everything from French antique furniture to Meiji period Japanese bronzes. The owner, Julius Shimsky knew everything anyone could know about all things old. Coins, stamps, paintings, not least of all because he was 89 and had spent his life learning. Julius had a monk's ring of white hair, eyebrows as lush as albino caterpillars, blue eyes as clear as the water in Eden, and a face that had not lined with age but had smoothed into a semblance of what he must have looked like just before his bris, 
In a profile of him in Arizona, he had explained his pink-cheeked appearance by saying, when you fill yourself with knowledge about any subject, it plumps you. I didn't write the profile because Julius wasn't dead, but after I read it, I began stopping by his shop now and then to chat. The place is more than a shop, really. It's a two-story, brick-clad, concrete-and-steel building, designed to be so fireproof that even the devil couldn't get it to take a destructive spark from his finger. The shop's stock is worth millions, so to be admitted, you have to have an appointment or be known to Julius. In either case, entry is through a bulletproof glass vestibule, where you're scanned for a weapon before being buzzed through the inner door. When Julius was just 41, working out of another location, he was robbed at gunpoint and pistol-whipped, whereupon he built a fortress of a shop because, as he said in the profile, paranoia I can live with, but not a bullet in the head. On that Friday, his granddaughter Sharona was staffing the front room, which made me feel doubly lucky when I saw her from the glass vestibule. With her jet black hair and dark eyes, an exquisite arrangement of features, she is one of those women at whom you can't look for long without losing the ability to speak coherently. Or at least, I can't. She's thirty, eleven years older than me. So, from her perspective, I'm hardly out of adolescence. While from my perspective, she's my dream girl. Among other things, she's a philatelist, which isn't as sexy as it sounds. She knows everything there is to know about collectible postage stamps. Like her grandfather, she is a knowledge sponge. I can't imagine why she's not married. Although she treated me with the affection that an aunt might show for a favored nephew, I fantasized that one day I would do something. Maybe save a family from a burning house or take a gun away from a crazed terrorist that would cause her to look at me in a much different way and see me as the romantic figure of her dreams. She waved and then buzzed me through. I passed by the cluster of Tiffany lamps and the Japanese gold lacquer boxes that dated from the Taisho through the Heisei eras and went to the sales counter where she stood. A display of highly collectible wristwatches lay between us. If I had been more attuned to the menacing melody that Destiny had chosen as background music for what was coming, I might have seen those watches as an omen that time was running out for me. Instead, I regarded Sharona with a smile that was probably more like a boyish grin, and declared, You look so Friday, when what I meant to say was that she looked lovely today. She smiled that aunt-to-nephew smile. No one has ever said that to me before, Quinn. What does Friday look like? Well, just like you. Elaboration seemed essential, so I kept going. Friday is the best of days, don't you think? The work week is done, and Monday is still in the distant future. So, for a while, we're free. Of course, I've got the day off, and you don't, so... Maybe you see the whole situation in a different light, but to me, right now, this week anyway, Friday is great. Friday is beautiful. There, I'd actually said it. I had told her she was beautiful, even though she might need a translator to have my meaning properly conveyed. She cocked her head at me. You're really wired, Quinn. How much coffee have you had this morning, dear? My Uncle Meyer was an eight cups a day man and ended up with a bleeding ulcer when he was just 34. Three days in the ICU. Oh, not to worry, I'm a two-cup man. That's all it takes to charge me up. A good Jamaican blend. In fact, I didn't often drink coffee. I favored caffeine-free Pepsi or Coke, but I worried that she would think I was still a boy if I preferred a soft drink to a good cup of Joe. I was ashamed of myself for lying, even if about something as inconsequential as coffee. To avoid plunging deeper into the swamp of deceit, I produced the gold coin from a pocket. Why I stopped by is, I found this. I think it might be worth something. I'm mainly a philatelist, though I know a lot about Tiffany, Art Nouveau, and Art Deco. Grandfather is the ace numismatis. I so much liked the way philatelist sounded when she said it that I wanted to ask her to say it again, but I restrained myself. You know where Grandfather's office is. I'll intercom him and let him know you'll be stopping in to see him. Julius's office was at the back of the building, on the first floor. 
I passed through a storeroom of treasures and found him at his Art Deco desk, which I knew was by a ruleman, because he had once told me its history when I asked if I could buy one like it at Ikea. He was examining a cockroach with a jeweler's loop. What's that? A brooch, he said. Why would anyone wear a cockroach brooch? He looked up from the loop and raised his bushy eyebrows. It's not a cockroach. It's a very different species of beetle, a scarab. It's made of silver, tarnished at the moment, and adorned with some of the finest sapphires, rubies, and emeralds it has ever been my pleasure to see. Cockroach, scarab, beetles are beetles. I don't like bugs. Scarabs were sacred to the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. That's probably why their civilization didn't last. Uh, look what I found. He put aside the jeweled scarab in the loop to examine my coin. Where did you get this? I told him a version of the truth without lying, leaving out the tarantula because I didn't want him to tell Sharona how I'd been scared off by a mere spider. Is it worth something? At retail, from a collector... It would bring forty thousand dollars, maybe a few thousand less. I was gobsmacked. I'd been hoping for maybe a hundred bucks. Holy moly, pudding and pie, I declared, which is something we said at the orphanage to avoid a crude exclamation in the presence of the nuns. I guess I better find out who it belongs to. Julius frowned. Belongs to? From what you told me... I'd say it belongs to you. It's not as if anyone who ever owned that restaurant is still alive. Anyway, if I remember the article you wrote for the magazine, all that property was eventually condemned and taken under the public domain laws. Then the county owns it. Or Washington. There'll probably be a finder's reward. I'd been standing by the desk all this time. Now Julius pointed to a chair and said, Sit down. You're lightheaded. When I said I felt fine, he told me to sit down again, this time more sternly than I'd ever heard him speak. He said, What might the government do with $40,000? Buy a hand soap dispenser for one of the Senate restrooms? Add two feet of new track for a train to nowhere? Listen, son. If you were anyone else, I'd offer 26000 Maybe a smidgen more. But I'm pretty sure in a month I can sell this to a collector for near that price I mentioned, so I'll take some more risk and come up to 30000 Young as you are and poor as you are, this is a blessing you should just thank God for and get on with your life. Maybe I was too innocent for my own good. Or maybe I didn't want him to think I was all that young. Meaning too young for Sharona. If she suddenly became enamored of me, whatever my absurd reasoning, I said, I'm not so young, really. I mean, I've got a nice job, my own apartment. I've got prospects. Son, if you're not young, then I'm older than dead. He leaned forward in his chair, balancing the coin between his thumb and his forefinger. Say you'll take the money, or I'll flip it. If I flip it, then if it's heads, I'll flush the coin down the john. And if it's tails, I'll also flush it down the john. You're joking. Try me. But what kind of choice is that? He got up from his chair. It's the only one I'm offering you. I won't participate in your reckless confusion. And if you think I'm too old to keep you from taking this away from me before I can flush it... You'd better be wearing a metal cup and be prepared for other injuries. In retrospect, I think that the idea of suddenly having $30,000 scared me. I'd come into the world with nothing and had lived on the orphanage's dime for 18 years. Even with my job at Arizona, I'd never had enough money to worry about losing it. I didn't want to prove to be a fool by misspending 30000 because then not only Sharona would write me off as a loser, but so would any other woman with a brain. So, I took the 30000 Julius paid me 29000 with a check and gave me a 1000 in cash so that I could replace the bald tires on my rust-bucket Toyota right away 
and even have a small celebration. I went directly to the bank and made a deposit. Because my bank and Julius's were the same, they phoned him for verification and made the funds available the next day, Saturday, which had by then become my choice for best day of the week. The following morning, after I had showered and had a bowl of Cap'n Crunch, I was seized once more by the strange magnetism that had drawn me to that ghost crossroads. This time, I was impelled to return to the bank and withdraw four thousand dollars in hundreds and twenties. I didn't spend a dollar of it. I took it back to my apartment, secured it in a small Ziploc bag, and tucked the bag under a cushion of my only armchair. I recalled having read an article that recounted a time when banks had failed, and I supposed I was just being paranoid about losing my newfound wealth. On Monday, during my lunch break, I returned to the bank and withdrew two thousand more and put it in the Ziploc bag. After I withdrew three thousand more on Tuesday and another three thousand on Wednesday, I had begun to scare myself. No, I didn't feel that I was out of control. Rather, I sensed that I was preparing myself for something more than the collapse of the bank. That somehow I knew trouble was coming, as I had known where I would find a valuable coin. Thursday, I alarmed myself further by being unable to resist the urge to buy a small suitcase and pack it full of two changes of clothes and toiletries. I put the suitcase in the trunk of my car and left the vehicle in the long-term parking section of a downtown garage, paying a week in advance with cash. I also withdrew another four thousand from the bank, where they must have begun to think that either I'd become a compulsive gambler or was enthralled to a gold digger. When I reported to work Friday morning, two Ziploc bags, each containing eight thousand dollars, were fixed to my bare chest with adhesive tape. I wore a loose shirt so it wouldn't appear that I had begun to develop breasts. By this time, I was no longer certain of my sanity. A week had passed since I'd come into all that money, and since I'd begun to prepare to be a fugitive. Being compelled by intuition to make such preparations didn't mean my intuition must be reliable. Most people under a compulsion to do unusual things were, in fact, as screwy as a squirrel on methamphetamine. I had to wonder if my fear might be irrational and might have arisen from guilt related to selling a coin that didn't belong to me. Having been raised by nuns, I'd had all the shell knots drummed into me in the kindest but most insistent way for eighteen years. It was reasonable to assume a surfeit of moral suasion had sensitized me to transgression to such a degree that I would feel guilty for keeping a dime found in the street. So the threat was surely imaginary, a pinball of anxiety ricocheting around in my disordered head, or at least that was a theory I entertained, until the thugs showed up at lunch. Two. Two fry cooks who might one day be as famous as Andy Warhol saved me from a pair of well-dressed men with bad intentions. I ate lunch five days a week at a place across the street from the magazine's offices because I was a creature of habit, because the joint was clean and the food was good and it was cheap. The Bean family owned the operation. Hazel Bean was a fifty-year-old divorcee whose husband, an attorney. Had run off with a client for whom he had won a ten million dollar judgment in the death of her husband, Darnell Ickins. The jury had unanimously agreed that a police officer had responded with excessive force when he shot Darnell six times after Darnell attacked him with a pneumatic nail gun and skewered him four times. Hazel would still accept a lawyer as a customer, but she would never greet one with a smile. Her children, Phil and Jill, twenty-six-year-old fraternal twins, were excellent fry cooks, working the griddle and grill with style. Even though it was not their destiny, they were born to be artists. Phil dyed his spiky hair purple and shaved off his eyebrows, while Jill dyed her spiky hair green and, at all times, wore black pajamas with red shoes. They had not yet been able to sell a significant number of paintings because, as they explained. The art establishment valued the marketability of the artist's image as much as or more than his or her paintings, so the big breakthrough depended on finding the right look. Lately, Phil and Jill had been giving a lot of thought to shaving their heads and having themselves dyed blue, from top to bottom. 
Anyway, I usually crossed the street to Bean's Diner toward the end of the lunch rush, so I could sit at the counter without being crowded into a conversation with another customer who might want to talk about something as absurd as politics or something as evil as, well, politics. I was more interested in hearing about art and the art world, of which Phil and Jill had such extensive and enthralling knowledge. That Friday, the diner's booths were still full of those upper echelon employees who could linger at lunch without having their fingers smacked with a ruler by the boss, but most of the counter stools were unoccupied. After Jill recounted a fascinating anecdote about the weird, surreal images incorporated subliminally in the paintings of Andrew Wyeth, Phil served up a three-cheese hamburger with lettuce, tomato, and mayonnaise. The French fries were extra crispy, as I like them. I was washing down the second bite of the hamburger with a cherry Coke when two men appeared on the stools flanking mine as if they had materialized at the summons of a sorcerer. I got an immediate bad vibe from both of them. And although I took a third bite of my sandwich, I had some difficulty swallowing it. The new arrivals were dressed in black suits and white shirts and black ties. They wore sunglasses, which they took off and folded and inserted in their shirt pockets in a most impressive display of synchronization. I looked to my left, and the guy there smiled at me. He was as handsome as any male model, with brown eyes that were almost gold, like those of a cat. Something about his smile said it came too easy to him, that he smiled all night while sleeping, that it didn't mean he liked you or was in a good mood, or even that he knew what a smile was meant to signify. To my right, the other guy was a hulk with a hard, flat face and looked as if he had run at top speed into a wall more than once, just for the fun of it. He smiled, too, but in his case, I could see that such an expression required concentration. The one with golden eyes said, Kind of hot out there today. I said, Well, it's May in Phoenix. You've lived in Phoenix all your life, have you? Mostly, yeah. The hard case on my right said, You like Phoenix better than where you came from? Sure, I like it pretty much. I don't remember anything about where I came from. Looking past me at Lefty, Righty said, This young man has amnesia. Lefty traded his easy smile for a look of faux sadness. I'm sorry to hear that. Must be tough. No memory. I don't have amnesia, I assured them. I come from Pepto, Arizona, but I only spent a few days there after I was born. I looked back and forth as the men engaged in synchronized, solemn nodding. Hazel Bean appeared, slapped menus on the counter, and said, Get you guys something to drink? Give us a minute here, why don't you? The handsome one said. She squinted at him, then at his partner, and said, Are you attorneys? No, but we've arrested a few. This didn't please Hazel as it ought to have done. She said to me, Honey, are you all right? I took a deep breath of diner air scented with fried onions and the sizzling beef on the griddle. I don't know yet. This here is a good boy, Hazel told my dining companions. If you say so, Lefty said. Righty added, We have his best interests at heart. A waitress, Pinky Crankhour, leaned past Righty to tell Phil she needed two draft beers for booth four. After giving me a worried look, Phil went to draw the bruise, leaving the griddle work to his sister. When Hazel retreated reluctantly, the man with golden eyes said, So you don't remember what happened in Pepto? I was sent to a Catholic orphanage here when I was three days old. Anyway, not much happens in a town of 906. They've had a growth spurt since then, Lefty said. There's now 912. Though it's becoming a metropolis, Righty said. A little baby abandoned in the middle of a highway would be a big deal, even in the new and improved Pepto. Well, I guess it would be. Listen, what agency are you with? I have a right to know who I'm talking to. The handsome one on my left produced an ID wallet. He was with the Internal Security Agency. 
I'd heard of it, but I didn't know how it was different from the FBI, NSA, DSA, ATF, Homeland Security, or any other law enforcement agency. These days, America was a lot more policed at the federal level than it had been only a decade earlier. Putting away the ID wallet, Lefty spoke softly, as if everyone in the diner was trying to eavesdrop, and maybe they were. See, we could have been waiting for you in your apartment when you came home, but we didn't know what surprises you might have up your sleeve. Surprises? I said, puzzled. Righty whispered, If you try anything tricky here. Tricky? I said. Try anything unique with all these witnesses. It'll be a big story. We don't think you want a big story. Unique? I said, having been reduced to one-word responses. Neither of them said anything for half a minute, merely stared at me in a way that at first I thought was meant to be intimidating, but as I turned my head from side to side, I realized that the hard-ass manner they'd affected was not just who they were as agents, but also as intended to mask their fear. They were afraid of me. In my nineteen years, no one in the world had been afraid of me. Not even once. I'd been beaten up by angry spelling bee losers, for heaven's sake. The brute with the mashed-in face swallowed hard, as if for a moment something had been stuck in his throat. He said softly, The first one we knew like you. This guy named Ollie. We tried to sit him down for a talk in a nice, private place. The one on my left, who had slipped a hand under his suit coat, murmured, Two of our people are in the booth behind us. They've drawn their guns and are holding them under the table. Righty said, With Ollie, we quietly explained our intentions, laid out why it was in his best interest to cooperate. But it was downhill from there, said Lefty. Righty said, He did some really mean shit to some of our people. Their back-and-forth patter seemed as well-rehearsed as an Abbott and Costello routine, though not as funny. I'm not mean, I said lamely. What we want you to do, the brutish one said, is let us cuff your hands behind your back and take you outside to our van. We just need to have a talk, need to understand. We don't want to hurt you. But we will, said Lefty if you go unique on us. So don't get tricky. Righty grunted agreement. He was so hushed that I could hardly hear the voce in his soto voce. We'll shoot you in the head. All four of us. That's what worked well before. The GQ model with golden eyes hissed, Yes, yes, very well. As you might imagine, I was by now so terrified that I worried about the retentive strength of my bladder. Uh, Listen, guys, you're making a big mistake. Whoever you think I am, I'm not. No one watching our little lunch counter drama could have been sure who these men were and might well have thought they were mob thugs to whom I owed money. Later, I learned the ISA is widely despised, so it might not have mattered if anyone had heard Lefty identify his agency. My attention was so focused on Tweedledum and Tweedledee that the diners seemed to fade away into a fog. I suppose they were likewise so focused on me that they never noticed that the diner staff had overheard enough to be alarmed. Being the kind of food service patriots who would stand up for a friend, Hazel Bean's crew had wordlessly coordinated an intervention on my behalf. Having drawn a basket of crisp potatoes out of the deep well fryer, Jill pivoted and threw the hot contents of the basket in Righty's face. Having drawn two 16-ounce beers from the draft spigot, ostensibly to put them on the counter for the waitress who requested them, Phil instead splashed the contents of one mug and then the other into the golden eyes of the man on my left. Just as the guy on my right got an order of fries that he hadn't requested. Behind me, I heard Pinky Cronkauer say, Don't even think about it! as she dumped a tray heaped with dirty dishes into the laps of the agents in the booth. If a week earlier we had been playing a game of what would you do and you had described the Beans Diner scenario to me, 
I would have said that I would most likely spin off my stool, slip and fall on the way to the front door, and be captured by highly agitated ISA agents. Instead, I surprised myself by knocking aside my lunch and scrambling across the counter, availing myself of the cover that it had provided. As I stayed low and scuttled past Jill, heading toward the kitchen, she slipped a spatula under a half-done beef patty, scooped it off the griddle, and sailed it into the face of the guy who was still wiping french fries out of his eyes. In the kitchen were refrigerators and ovens and work tables, as well as Pepe Chavez and Tao Hua. He said, Quinn, my man. And she said, What's up? I said, Gotta run, and sprinted past them. At the back door, I snatched a fire extinguisher off its wall mount and threw open the door, expecting machine gun fire. The guy in the alley was wearing jeans and a Hawaiian shirt, but he was big and alert. He said, Hey there, Boyo. No normal person calls a stranger Boyo, so I figured he was ISA, and I foamed him relentlessly with the fire extinguisher. As he staggered around like Frosty the Snowman, dissolving in the Phoenix sunshine, I ran west carrying the extinguisher just in case I might encounter another overheated federal employee. 3. On the north side of the alley, behind Dirty Harry Clean now, the dry cleaner's van was being loaded with freshened clothes to be returned to customers' homes. The driver, Juan Santos, who often had lunch at Bean's Diner, slammed shut the back doors of the van and saw me coming. With the perspicacity of a first-rate delivery man, he recognized that I was fleeing from a threat, and he waved me toward the passenger side of the vehicle. Get in, let's scoot! He's the law, you'll get in trouble. I eat trouble for breakfast, Juan said. Anyway, he won't see us. I glanced back and discovered that the boyo in the Hawaiian shirt was staggering away from me, disoriented, temporarily blind, with gobs of fire-suppressant foam cascading from him as if he were a hellhound with rabies. None of the other ISA agents had yet made it out of the diner, where perhaps they continued to be obstructed by barrages of food. With reluctance, I dropped the fire extinguisher. Defenseless, I clambered into the passenger seat, pulled the door shut and slid low as Juan started the engine. The air was crisp with the faint but lingering scent of the solvents used to process the racks of clothes in the back of the van, and I sneezed so hard that the cartilage between my nostrils vibrated for a few seconds afterward. Gesundheit, said Juan. Thank you. De nada. At the west end of the alley, Juan glanced at his side mirror to scope the scene behind us. Foam guy just fell into a cluster of trash cans. He turned right into the street. You can sit up now. I think not. The ISA is after me. They have eyes everywhere. The secret police? Semi-secret, I said. Everyone knows they exist, but nobody knows what they do. Why are they after you, Quinn? I have no idea. They said I'm unique. Juan snorted with contempt. I've never known anyone else who had such a variety of snorts, each of which is easily interpreted. Everyone is unique, amigo. If unique is a crime, they'd have to arrest all of us. Maybe they will, eventually. Right now, it's me. You want me to take you across the border? To Mexico? No, no, no. Y you have clothes to deliver. So I'm a day late. Mr. Dai will understand. He's a nice man. Chi Minh Dai had escaped Vietnam as a teenager in the 70s and, when he was just 20, had founded what became a highly successful dry cleaning service. I know good people in Mexico will take you in. That's sweet of you, Juan, but I'd be eternally grateful if you'd just drop me off at the parking garage where I stowed my car. I gave him the address, and he said... That crap Toyota of yours might not make it to Scottsdale. I bought new tires in this terrific air freshener I hung from the rearview mirror. I hate that pine smell. Always reminds me of urinal cakes. It's shaped like a pine tree, I said. But it smells like oranges. Why wouldn't they shape it like an orange? His snort conveyed frustration with the outsourcing of American manufacturing, and he answered his own question. Made in China. That's why. Well, one good thing about your crap Toyota is it's so old it doesn't have GPS. They can't track you by satellite. 
He braked to a stop at an intersection and looked down at me as I huddled below window level. His expression was kind and, so it seemed to me, informed more by sympathy than pity. What's your plan, Quinn? Plan? Well, just to stay free long enough to figure out why they're after me. It has to be some kind of mistake, a screw-up. I just have to get it straightened out. I said I eat trouble for breakfast, and it's true. My sister Maria, she got out of prison, lives with me now until she can get back on her feet. She's a great lady, but can't cook worth a damn. She insists on sending me to work with a hearty breakfast, so I have bowel trouble all day. He paused. As he stared down at me, I swear I saw the moment when his sympathy turned to pity. Maria, before she did what she did, she didn't have a plan either. The light changed, and we cruised through the intersection. I said, what'd she do? To get sent to prison? She mocked a congresswoman by posting several funny memes about her. They said the memes were threats. Were they threats? Yeah, if you think portraying someone as a drunken chipmunk is a threat. Maria did it, but she didn't have a plan for what might come after. Sentenced to a year. Served nine months. Who'd think you'd need a plan for that? Times have changed, Quinn. Before I do or say anything, I have a plan. Sometimes two or three plans. How could I know the ISA would decide I was unique? Who has a plan for being accused of uniqueness? All I'm saying is, you better have a plan. You can't just run forever. For maybe two minutes, neither of us spoke. His silence was the silence of pity, and mine was the silence of fear and confusion. My inability to imagine how even to start making a plan so distressed me, I sought to relieve my stress by changing the subject. Pushing up in my seat, I said, I've always wondered why it's called Dirty Harry Clean now. Juan's snort was of amused affection for his employer. First two years that Jimin Dai was in the States, he worked three jobs and lived cheap, saving his money to start a dry cleaning shop. When he finally took time to see a movie, it was the Eastwood film. He loved it. Saw it eight times. Harry wore some cool suits in the movie, and in spite of all the action, he always looked clean and sharply pressed. G wondered where Harry took his dry cleaning, and he thought everyone else must wonder too. At first, he meant to call his shop G-Men Die Dry or Wet, but he went with the other name so the millions of people wondering who was Harry's dry cleaner might come to Dirty Harry Clean now. His English wasn't as good then as it is these days, so he thought the meaning was clear. The funny thing is, it worked. He has three shops and does more dry cleaning and laundry than anyone in Arizona. You understand why it worked? I said, G-Men Dai had a plan. Exactly. Juan pulled to the curb and stopped in front of the six-story parking garage where I had left my car. Get a plan, amigo. I will, I promised. Somehow, one way or another, I'll get a plan. Thank you for giving me a lift. I realize now it was a big risk, aiding and abetting a fugitive. Juan smiled. He had a warm smile. If it had been any warmer, he could have toasted bread with it. De nada. Anyway... I had a plan. If some ISA types pulled us over, I'd have taken a pistol from under my seat, shot you dead, then claimed you kidnapped me, and I took the weapon away from you. I did not know what to say to that, so I said, huh. <laughs> Juan's smile became a wide grin. His grin was so wide that it made me think of a jack-o'-lantern. I'm joking, Queen. I like you too much to ever shoot you but I wish you weren't so clueless. Dismayed, I said, clueless is kind of harsh. Not really. I like it too much to sugarcoat it. Get your shit together, amigo, but keep your sense of humor, or you'll go insane, like so many seem to have done these days. Opening the door, I said, I will. I'll get my shit together. Another thing. You have a smartphone? I withdrew it from a jacket pocket. Apple. You want me to stay in touch? Not really. I want you to stomp hard on that phone and drop it in the nearest storm drain. It's got GPS. 
They can track you as long as you carry it. But I've got all these apps. I've got weather and maps and podcasts. You want to survive? You've got to be totally street from here on, Quinn. He held out his cell phone. It's a burner, disposable. Nothing fancy. I didn't use my name when I activated it. I can't take your phone, I said. He threw it at me, and I caught it. And one more thing, amigo. You know about 360-degree license plate scanners? Should I get one? He snorted in a prayerful sort of way and rolled his eyes. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, protect this boy. Queen, every police car and a lot of other government vehicles are equipped with scanners that record license plates all around them and transmit in real time to the National Security Agency's million-square-foot data center in Utah. You'll be scanned half a dozen times before you're out of this city. If they want you as bad as you say they want you, they'll be alerted every time you're scanned, and they'll track you down sooner or later. How do you know that? How could I not? It's the kind of thing everyone needs to know in the new America. So I should take the plate off my car? That would be a start. As traffic whooshed past, sunshine flaring off the windshields, I got out of the van and looked in at him. What if a cop stops me because I don't have a plate? Then you're a burnt burrito. Still sure you don't want to take a trip to Mexico? No, I've got to stay here and clear my name. This is all some terrible mistake. After a snort of exasperation, Juan said, Vaya con Dios. You too, I said, and closed the door. As he drove off, I stood there in the searing sun, feeling small and alone. My shadow seemed to be straining to get away, as though it didn't want to end up in a coffin with the rest of me. A Ford F-150 crew cab cruised toward me, bulging tarps full of landscape clippings swelling like bulbous mushrooms in its open bed. Rather than draw attention to myself by stomping on my smartphone in a fit of Rumpelstiltskin rage, I tossed it among those tarps so the ISA might chase it around Phoenix for a while. 4. The cavernous garage offered an elevator and enclosed stairs, but both felt like traps. The vehicle ramps were two lanes wide, two per floor. I walked up to the long-term parking on the sixth level. In those days, I never felt safe in a huge public parking structure. I wasn't concerned about motorists who drove too fast, though some seemed to think they were on a slot racing track. The massive supporting columns would prevent the ceiling from collapsing on me, so I didn't worry about being crushed in rubble. Muggers rarely worked these buildings, for there weren't enough routes by which to make a quick exit. However, such garages always struck me as eerie, especially when I got to the less busy, higher floors. Maybe vent fans produced the faint, whispery sounds that suggested gremlins conspiring under the vehicles as they watched my feet move past. Maybe the lack of natural light and the granite-gray concrete and the silent cars lined up like rows of coffins inspired thoughts of death. Sometimes I felt that I was on the brink of an encounter with something otherworldly, perhaps a tribe of pale, feral children with smoky eyes and sharp teeth. The big city 21st century equivalent of the boys from that island in Lord of the Flies— Later, of course, I'd come to understand that these feelings arose from a subconscious awareness that sinister presences live among us, passing for human. And they aren't restricted to parking garages. The world is their playground. Anyway, when I reached the sixth and highest level, I warily surveyed the rows of vehicles, expecting to see among them a brace of men in dark suits and sunglasses, like the pair who'd flanked me at the lunch counter in the diner. Considering that I had escaped the first crew sent to arrest me, maybe I shouldn't have regarded the ISA as omniscient and omnipresent. However, even though the government is so deep in debt that it's technically bankrupt, and even though a dollar today will buy only what a dime would buy in the 1950s, the feds can still print money almost as fast as trees can be felled to make paper, which means that when they field an agency like the ISA, its name is Legion. I have felt watched where no watchers waited, heard where no listeners lurked, and I approached my Toyota with caution, wishing I had a fresh fire extinguisher, 
and a cloak of invisibility. In addition to my suitcase and a spare tire, the car trunk contained a simple toolkit. I was able to remove the license plate quickly. At that point, I began to act with what some might insist was criminal cunning, though I preferred to think of it as the street smarts of a wrongly accused fugitive. A Porsche stood next to my rust bucket. I removed the plate from it, put it on the Toyota, and then attached the Toyota plate to the fancier vehicle. The owner of the Porsche would incur the cost of ordering a new plate, and until he realized what had happened, he was at risk of having his car stormed by ISA agents hot for vengeance. The chance was small, however, that Mr. Porsche looked enough like me to be gunned down in a case of mistaken identity. Anyway, the ISA didn't want to kill me. They wanted to interrogate me, and depending on what they meant by unique, they might want to put me through a lot of annoying tests, maybe a few exploratory surgeries, but surely nothing worse. Nevertheless, as I drove down through the garage, I knew the good sisters of Mater Misericordiae would not approve of the cost and inconvenience to which I had subjected the owner of the Porsche. Were I still living at the orphanage, they would have me peeling potatoes for a week. If I was slightly embarrassed by what I'd done to Mr. Porsche, and if I was afraid for my future and my life, which I was, then I was also pleased with myself, because I had devised a plan while swapping the license plates. If I'd had a list of the dry-cleaning deliveries Juan Santos was making, I would have tried to find him and thank him for having mentored me regarding the need for having a plan. I was so pleased to have one that I wanted not merely to express my gratitude, but also share my delight. My plan was to drive to Pepto, Arizona, and track down the three men who found me in a bassinet in the middle of that highway nineteen years earlier. During most of my life, I had been as ordinary as mud. However, the strange magnetism that recently compelled me hither and yon seemed to suggest something might indeed be unique about me. Back in the day, perhaps Hakim, Bailey, and Caesar had concealed an important fact, or they might have seen something that seemed inconsequential at the time, but that would be a key piece of the puzzle that was me. They had not been old men at the time, but... After two decades, perhaps one or more of them had died, or they might have moved away from Pepto to a more exciting town, like Gila Bend or Tombstone. I have always been an optimist, because pessimists seldom have any fun, and usually fret their way into one of the horrible fates they spend their lives worrying about. Of course, being an optimist doesn't guarantee you an unrelievedly happy life. You can still lose your job on the same day that your house burns down and your spouse informs you that he or she has shot the sheriff. But the optimist, unlike the pessimist, believes that life has meaning, that there is something to learn from every adversity, and even that the absurdity of such an excessive misfortune will likely seem at least somewhat amusing after enough time has passed. That is why, years after they have lost everything, Optimists are frequently richer and happier than ever, while pessimists often had nothing to lose in the first place. As I piloted the Toyota out of the garage and into streaming traffic in the street, I assured myself that I would find Hakim, Bailey, and Caesar thriving in Pepto. I could be there in three hours, and perhaps would be able to speak with the first of them as early as that evening. For all that Juan Santos knew about the need for having a plan, he didn't know everything on the subject. In 1785, in a work titled To a Mouse, the poet Robert Burns warned, The best laid schemes of mice and men gang afterglay. You don't have to understand Scottish dialect to know he wasn't assuring the mouse that its plans were certain to win it a life of comfort and fine cheeses. I felt rather like a frightened mouse when, instead of taking Interstate 10 south out of Phoenix, as was my intention, I suddenly began switching from street to street. I wigged along on a zigzag course that seemed to have no purpose other than to elude a tail, though my mirrors didn't reveal any vehicle whipping this way and that in my erratic wake. That inexplicable compulsion had overtaken me again, a kind of psychic magnetism drawing me toward I knew not what. This time it was alarmingly more powerful than it had been previously, I felt almost as though the car was driving itself, 
the steering wheel pulling my hands where the possessed Toyota wanted to go. I ran two yellow lights, treating the speed limit as if it were a mere helpful suggestion. If a policeman pulled me over and ran the tags on the car, he would not be so slow-witted as to think that Porsche had designed a down-market version to break into the destitute motorist market. The ISA might even have distributed a photograph of me to the computer in every patrol car in Phoenix. I would be extracted from the Toyota and encouraged to kiss the pavement. Some serious backup would be on the way faster than I could say, I can explain, which would be a foolish thing to say because I had no idea what the hell was going on with me. Then I was on Federal Highway 60, headed northwest toward an outlying suburb aptly named Surprise. Glittering Phoenix dwindled in the rearview mirror, a megaplex of high-rise buildings that looked as improbable as the Emerald City of Oz in the great flatness of the desert. The compulsion that gripped me grew rapidly less intense. I felt that I could pull to the shoulder of the road, take slow, deep breaths, and settle my nerves. However, I didn't want to stop. A strange magnetism still drew me northwest, but I was also motivated by curiosity, by a need to know where I was going, why I was going there, and what all this craziness meant. As it turned out, my journey's end wasn't the town of surprise. I blew by that whistle stop and somehow knew that my destination was in the vicinity of Wickenburg, a little more than an hour from Phoenix. If you prefer your weather dry and hot, if you favor landscapes with a minimum of annoying shade trees, if you find pea gravel no less attractive than grass, if tall buildings oppress you and beige stucco soothes, Wickenburg is the place for you. A pleasant town of wide streets, little traffic, cheap land, and friendly people. In the general vicinity are world-famous three- and four-star dude ranches, where you can learn to fall off of a horse, develop the useful skill of roping a faux calf, take line dancing lessons, play golf, or dress up like a cowboy and drink yourself into a stupor every evening. I didn't know it yet, but as it turned out, I was headed for one of those dude ranches beyond the town limits of Wickenburg. The operation, Sweetwater Flying F Ranch, would prove to be a desolate and desperate place. Eventually, I would learn that it had declared bankruptcy twelve years earlier and been reimagined by the owners as a secret marijuana farm, its barns and stables filled with thriving hemp plants. In those days, everyone thought that marijuana was a narcotic instead of just a lifestyle. When the Drug Enforcement Agency raided the place, the owners proved obstreperous. Guns were produced, shots were fired, blood was drawn, and everyone at the ranch ended up in prison for a long time, with the exception of those who were dead. The IRS seized the property to satisfy a tax lien. As a young man who had been raised by nuns and who preferred city life to the rigors of suburbia, a place as far out there as Sweetwater Flying F Ranch would never have been on my just-have-to-see-it list if I had been in control of myself. Considering the events of the day, I expected trouble when I reached wherever I was going, and that expectation was fulfilled. What I didn't foresee was that my destiny would be found in that place, an adventure-filled life bathed in as much darkness as light, a life shaken by frequent terror but pierced by greater joy. A life of mysteries and revelations waited for me there, and also a recipe for cinnamon pecan rolls that was to die for. 5. The federal highway led to a state route, and the state route led to a county lane that brought me to the long approach road to Sweetwater Flying F Ranch. Two stone columns supported a beam that overhung the entrance, to the beam was fixed a sun-faded sign featuring the name of the ranch and a silhouette of a cowboy riding a bucking bronco. In the distance, the drab gray buildings appeared to have swayed back roofs and canted walls. The blacktop driveway was fissured, crumbling at the edges. Beside one of the entrance columns lay two long-dead coyotes, now nothing but skeletons and dust-matted fur. Maybe they had been shot by some idiot or succumbed to disease, or maybe they had died of boredom. Sweetwater Flying F Ranch creeped me out. 
It looked like a place where a bargain basement nut cult leader like Charles Manson would hole up with a raggedy band of followers who practiced their stabbing techniques on kittens while waiting for some poor fool to knock on the door. A little less than an hour remained before sunset. I didn't want to be here in the dark. Although I didn't have a clue why I was here in daylight, I was nonetheless pulled toward the ranch by a power as irresistible as the sun and moon that attract the tides of the seas. I drove between the stone columns and under the decaying sign. Time, and a lack of maintenance, had done to this place what a Force 5 hurricane might have done to a four-mast galleon in the days of sailing ships. The stone and stucco main building, which once no doubt housed a restaurant and bar and various public rooms, must have been a handsome single-story structure in its time. But it was battered and breached. Sand had drifted against its walls so that one end of it was partly buried in the manner of a shipwreck that had washed up on a beach. The wind had stacked tumbleweed against one wall, where it clung like enormous barnacles. The bungalows, where guests evidently stayed, and the stables were in worse condition than the primary building. At the extreme point of the second loop of the figure-eight service road stood an immense barn that most likely had once been traditional red but was now a rusty pink. The previously convex roof had assumed the concave form of a saddle, and the substrate had shed perhaps half the shingles that had been fixed to it. Nothing about the barn suggested that it contained anything of interest. I cruised past, heading back to the other buildings. As I approached the end of the secondary loop, instead of continuing into the primary loop, I found myself turning left into the lane I had just traveled. With the barn ahead of me once more, I pressed the accelerator. Magnetism. This was not like the pull I had felt that led me to the gold coin, not akin to the gentle but insistent force the moon exerts on tides. I felt as if the barn was the world's largest electromagnet, and I was but a helpless scrap of iron. The attraction wasn't only physical, but also powerfully emotional. I wanted more than anything to be in that barn. Desired it as a maniacal gambler might desire a seat at a gambling table. As a starving glutton might desperately fling himself at a buffet table. Being in that barn was essential. An urgent necessity. The reason I had been born. So if I didn't get into that barn right now, if I didn't penetrate those walls, I would have no reason to exist. Maybe this sounds like passion, a thrilling, libidinous desire, but just keep in mind that the object of my lust was a barn. As I pressed the accelerator to the floorboard, terror rather than testosterone flooded through me. I aimed for the big rolling door, through which once must have passed horse-drawn wagons, bearing dudes and dudettes, headed out on many a quaint hayride. I won't say that the engine of my Toyota was screaming. That sad heap was too old and tired to scream. But it squealed like a pig on the slaughterhouse ramp, as if it knew what was about to happen to it. You can probably figure out that I didn't die from the impact, but I certainly expected to. And yet my foot would not relent from the gas pedal. If I'd had a longer stretch of pavement, I might have passed a hundred miles per hour by the time of impact. But I was going only fifty-eight. There's an old movie about a guy's severed hand that's imbued with supernatural life, and it crawls around with evil intentions. Although it's not an Oscar-worthy production, I was reminded of it in that moment because my stupid foot, though still attached to my leg, seemed to possess a mind of its own. In spite of the fact it had committed me to a headlong collision with the barn, at the last second it jumped from the accelerator to the brake. Evidently, the big plank door had suffered from years of dry rot or some such, for it exploded into dust and spongy chunks and thousands of prickly splinters. Because my traitorous foot jammed the brake down hard, the Toyota fishtailed as it plowed into the barn. A guy in there heard me coming and drew his gun and squeezed off a round that blew out the back window on the passenger side, just before the rear fender clipped him so hard that he tumbled off his feet. As the Toyota completed a full turn in place, as if it were a carousel, another guy came into view, a pistol and a two-handed grip. The car swung to a stop, 
He put two rounds through the windshield. The safety glass dissolved. This time, I was the master of my foot when I stomped on the accelerator. As you must know by now, I am not an angry person. And neither am I given to violence when I am in full control of my extremities. However, there is only so much abuse a person can endure in one day before he goes John Wick on his tormentors. I didn't build up a lot of speed in the 15 feet that separated me from this second shooter, but I hit him hard enough to lift him off his feet and carry him across the barn and slam him into a wall that was not eaten with the same dry rot as the door. Pinned between the car and the wall, the disarmed gunman opened his mouth as though to protest, but spewed a mortal gout of blood instead of words. I threw open the driver's door and clambered out of the car and doubled over, seized by the urge to vomit. John Wick could kill ten guys in two minutes and not even grimace with regret. Of course, he was a professional assassin. And I was a staff writer for a magazine about which the most exciting thing was the exclamation point in its name. Never before had I killed anyone. Although I'd acted in self-defense, I felt cold to the bone, as if some essential spark in me had been snuffed. After all, I didn't throw up, in part because I remembered the first guy I'd hit when the car fishtailed, the one who shot out a passenger side window. He was down, but that didn't mean he was no longer a threat. Shaking, vision pulsing with the hammer blows of my heart, bewildered and alarmed by what happened, I went looking for him and found him lying face down, head turned to one side, bloodied but maybe alive. His gun was nearby. I confiscated it just in case he regained consciousness and felt he had a score to settle. Then I knelt and felt for his pulse. Wasn't one. On closer inspection, I saw that his neck was broken. I had trouble getting to my feet, and I wasn't steady when I got there. I stood over the corpse, wondering at the compulsion that had brought me here. Was strange magnetism a power I possessed, or was I a puppet on a string? Only then did it register with me that both these men were wearing black suits, white shirts, and black ties. They seemed to have the same tailor as the men who braced me in Bean's Diner. I was about to search the guy's pockets for ID when a clink and rattle drew my attention. I took the pistol in both hands, the way I had seen these well-dressed thugs do, and I surveyed the barn. Late afternoon, eastern light ventured tentatively through the place where the door had been, and bolder shafts of direct sunlight dazzled through holes in the roof, but most of the barn lay in shadows. I needed a few seconds to find the source of the rattling. She was sitting on the barn floor, her back to the metal ladder that led to the hayloft, both arms raised above her head and zip-tied to a rung. The ladder was rickety, and when she mumbled and moved in her sleep, the loose rung worked noisily in the side rails. In the gloom, I couldn't see the woman clearly. Considering the Toyota's explosive entrance and the subsequent gunfire, I assumed that she wasn't merely taking a nap before dinner, but must have been drugged. I hurried to the Toyota, opened the trunk, discarded the gun, opened my suitcase and retrieved the small pair of scissors from my shaving kit. When I returned to the woman, her head hung low, chin on her chest as over and over she muttered, Gotta get, gotta go, gotta be there, as if she was late for the same appointment as the white rabbit. I cut one zip tie and her left arm dropped into her lap. As I cut the second tie, her head snapped up and her eyes opened wide. She seized my face with her right hand, digging her fingernails into my left cheek. What have you done? What have you done with him? With her hand clamped tightly over my chin and mouth, I wasn't able to answer her with more than a muffled, Done with whom? Even I couldn't understand what I said. Her eyes shone in the shadows as she demanded more fiercely, Tell me what you've done with him, you freaking Nazi zombie! She let go of me and thrust to her feet and staggered and almost fell but kept her footing. She looked at the gap where the barn door used to be, at the Toyota, at the guy dead on the floor. Then she looked at me again. Her face wrenched with emotion. What have you done with him? Where is Sparky? If she was distressed and a little crazy, I was no less so. I didn't see a dog. Dog? 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 She regarded me as if I just claimed that I myself was a dog. What are you talking about? What dog? Uh, Sparky. 
The noise, things crashing, all the gunfire. He must have been scared and ran away. This woman wasn't merely angry. She wasn't just enraged. She was infuriated. She stepped closer and punched me hard in the chest. Don't jerk my chain, you worthless piece of garbage. Dog. Dog? You know he's not a dog. All I know is they shot at me. Both of them. And I'd never been shot at before. Nuns don't prepare you for being shot at, even though you were beaten up after spelling bees, so I had to do what I had to do. Which is, I ran them down. Given my talk of gunfire and considering her situation, she ought to have been afraid. But instead, my babble seemed to further incense the lady. Her fury became so hot that I thought maybe I was about to witness one of those cases of spontaneous human combustion that you read about in those stranger-than-fiction books that detail weird but true occurrences. She punched me in the chest again. Sparky Rain King, my grandfather. What have you done with Sparky Rain King? I didn't do anything to him. I never met Sparky Rain King. I don't want to meet him. Seems like it's dangerous to know Sparky. In silence, she seethed at me for a moment. She scanned the barn again, and then she looked me up and down. Where's your suit? I don't own a suit. Then you're not one of them? They're all about the suit. How could I be one of them if I don't have a suit? You do know who they are, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know who they are. Internal Security Agency Nazi Zombies. Suddenly alarmed, she said, Oh, shit. I remember now. More of them are coming. She turned away from me and ran toward where the barn door had once been. Hurrying after her, I said, Where are you going? I think I know what they did with Grandpa Sparky. Six. Half an hour before sunset, oblique orange sunlight gilded the prairie grass, painted long shadows across the land, and transformed the former dude ranch from mere rack and ruin into a sinister assemblage of shapes, like half-toppled megaliths erected thousands of years earlier to serve as a place at which to worship cruel gods. Behind the barn stood two vehicles, a new black suburban with government plates and a midnight blue Buick older than my Toyota. They came on foot, snuck up on us, then brought the suburban here afterward. We were too sure we couldn't be found. The granddaughter of Sparky Rain King popped the trunk lid of the Buick. A sixty-something guy was in that cramped space, wrists and ankles bound with plastic straps, hands connected to feet with a trammel. Bridget, he declared. All that noise and gunfire. I thought you were dead. I'm so glad you're not dead. Me too, she said. I used my scissors to cut his bonds, as I had cut hers. His muscles had stiffened. He needed help to get out of the trunk. And what's your name, young man? He asked. Quinn Quicksilver. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Especially for Porky Pig. Pleased to meet you, Quinn. Likewise, Mr. Rain King. Call me Sparky. It's from the old English spirka, meaning to provoke and set in motion. I try to live up to it. Who got shot? No one, I said. Those ISA guys shot at me, but... They missed. Bridget said, He ran them down with his Toyota. A coupe, if you can believe it. Walking back and forth, flexing and stretching, Sparky Rain King said, Quinn, if you're going to be running people down on a regular basis, you'd be wise to invest in a larger, sturdier vehicle. Never having experienced a grandfather of my own, I hadn't spent any time studying the species, but it seemed that Sparky was not a standard-issue grandpa. Yes, he had the wizened face that you might expect, crinkles at the corners of his eyes, white hair, and a thick white walrus-style mustache, but one small detail suggested his outlier status. Each of his largish earlobes featured a tattoo of a tiny, grinning skull. Squinting his steel-gray eyes, he scanned the ranch as the place darkled in the fading light. We're grateful for your Bruce Willis heroics, Quinn. But how did you come to be here? I came from Phoenix. I'm a staff writer at Arizona Magazine. With one eye still squinted and the other eyebrow raised, his expression made it clear that he knew I had avoided answering his question. Seriously? 
You're writing about this dump? No, sir. I came here because... Because? I shrugged. Just because? Just because what? He persisted. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I'm a simple, trusting, gullible old man. Try me. Magnetism, I said. Sparky looked at Bridget. I, too, looked at Bridget. Now that no one was shooting at me and I wasn't busy running them down, it was as if I saw her for the first time. She was beautiful. But even better than that, she was cute. Always before, when I saw something so cute that it made me go all gooey inside, it had fur. Bridget didn't have fur, but I felt as if I was a marshmallow on a stick held over a campfire. After she and her grandfather exchanged meaningful looks and said, magnetism in unison, Bridget glanced at me. Judging by the way she rolled her eyes and sighed with exasperation, she understood that at the moment I was two ingredients short of being a s'more. I turned my attention to her grandfather. Magnetism makes sense to you? Perfect sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It will, he said. What were you doing here? Why would you be in a place like this, the middle of nowhere? We came here to hide for a few days, Sparky said, till we could figure things out, but they found us. Figure out what things? Later, Quinn. Now we better scoot. When the backup they called for gets here, I suspect there'll be so damn many, you couldn't run them all down even if they lined up like ten pins for you, Bridget said. Your Toyota's maybe totaled. Yeah, and there's a dead guy squashed in the grill. Sparky said, You'll come with us. You can drive. We have a lot to discuss. I'll get my suitcase. I started to go around to the front of the barn, then stopped and turned back to them. Hey, if you have a phone, that's how they found you. We're wise to that, Bridget said. We only have an anonymous disposable cell, and the Buick's too old to have GPS. License plates, I said. Nearly every police car and a lot of other government vehicles are fitted with 360-degree plate scanners. They transmit to the National Security Agency's Utah Data Center in real time. Where were you coming from? Flagstaff, she said. Oh, sure. You'd have been scanned a few times along the way. Then maybe they tapped archived satellite video and found where you went from the last time you were captured by a scan. They regarded me with something like awe, impressed with my street smarts, as if I'd been raised by gangbangers instead of nuns. I'll strip the plate off my car, which I took from a Porsche in a parking garage, and we'll swap it for yours. It's not a long-term solution, but it'll buy us some time. They returned to the barn with me, to retrieve their luggage, supplies, and blankets from the hayloft, where they had intended to hide for a few days while they figured things out. The Toyota had no windshield one flat tire, and the tired look of machinery that no longer understands its purpose. It was leaking radiator fluid. When I got behind the wheel, the dead agent pinned between the car and the wall appeared to be shouting accusations. The urge to vomit did not return. I didn't know what these men had intended to do to Bridget, but I was not so naive as to believe that their every action would have been according to the provisions in a neatly typed warrant. Furthermore, I'd seen enough movies about the mafia to know that guys who were tied up and stuffed into car trunks, like Grandpa Sparky, were either going to be crushed and compacted along with the vehicle in a scrap metal salvage yard, or driven to a construction site, shot, dumped in a deep hole, and buried under many yards of concrete, becoming part of an office building foundation. I hadn't already become desensitized to violence, but... For sure, I was coming to terms with the true, dark nature of this world much faster than I would have while writing about our state's colorful past for Arizona Magazine. The car didn't start. Then it did. Coughing. Shuddering. I reversed, and the dead guy slid to the barn floor, out of sight. I needed just a few minutes to unscrew the Porsche's plate. When I carried my luggage behind the barn, Bridget was closing an open suitcase that lay in the trunk of the Buick. Sparky stood near her, inserting a pistol into a holster on his right hip. I heard myself say, You've got a gun. As if this would be news to him. I should have been wearing it when those bastards took us by surprise. I thought we were safe here, 
he pulled on a sport coat. I've had things too soft for too long. I should have remembered. No one is ever safe anywhere. With the Porsche plate on the Buick, as I drove away from the Sweetwater Flying F Ranch with Bridget riding shotgun and Sparky in the back seat, the sun broke like a bloody yoke on the sharp horizon, and the purple of twilight was preceded by the red sky at night thing that is supposedly every sailor's delight. In less than six hours, I'd gone from being just another hungry customer of Bean's Diner to a fugitive hunted by the closest thing the U.S. had to a secret police. Most likely, I would soon be charged with two murders that were actually acts of self-defense committed while in the grip of a strange magnetism that compelled me to rescue a young woman and her grandfather, whom I hadn't known existed until I drove more than seventy miles and crashed through a barn door to free them. When I brought that story before a court, at trial, I'd probably be the first person burned at the stake in centuries. 7. Rumor had it that the ISA employed more agents and support staff than the FBI, although that could have been wild social media speculation. Regardless of the truth, they suffered no shortage of manpower, and the nearest large city where they maintained an office was surely Phoenix. The called-for backup was probably on its way to the Flying F Ranch, both by ground transport and helicopter. Because the elderly Buick was conspicuous, south of Wickenburg, we departed Federal Highway US-60, which the ISA would follow coming out of Phoenix, and we headed east on State Route 74. Eventually, to get around the city, we would weave through a few suburbs, Scottsdale, Tempe, on a series of surface streets and connect with Interstate 10 heading southbound to Tucson. I told them I had been abandoned at birth, raised by nuns, and had a plan that involved driving to Pepto to research my origins. Before I could explain further, Sparky said, We're short of a plan ourselves, and we seem to be in this together, so your plan is now our plan, if you don't mind. I considered Bridget long enough that the Buick drifted onto the shoulder of the highway, requiring me to recover with a sudden hard pull of the wheel. Yeah, that's good. That's great. We're in this together. Whatever the heck this is. Bridget and Sparky wanted to know when the ISA came after me and how I escaped. So I told them about my day, beginning with the unfinished three-cheese hamburger and ending with the barn door that proved to be a mere curtain of dry rot. Then I said... When did you end up in their sights? The day before yesterday, Sparky said from the back seat. We had a nice little house on five acres of pine forest and flagstaff. Bridget said, Deer used to come look in our windows. They were so sweet. Sparky said, They came so often, nearly every day. We gave them names, Comet and Cupid. She said, Donner and Blitzen. He said, We had squirrels that would eat out of your hand. She said, Samson and Delilah. He said, There was a fox so tame it would curl up in its own rocking chair on the porch, while we were rocking away in ours. She said, Cary Grant. That's what we called the fox, because he was so elegant. Movie stars aren't elegant like that anymore. He said, The cougar was a little scary at first. She disagreed. Oh, she never was, Sparky. She was always just a big pussycat. Bridget sighed. The property outside Flagstaff was our little paradise. Then the day before yesterday, Sparky said, Bridget and I were having breakfast when two black suburbans pulled into our driveway and eight men in black suits got out. Bridget said, It was like a chorus line from some musical about funeral directors. They knocked, Sparky said, and I told them to go away. They said they were ISA agents, needed to talk to us, and I told them to go away again. I glanced at the rearview mirror in which Sparky was briefly revealed by the headlamps of a truck sweeping past in the westbound lane. The fleeting light seemed like a mask of a face that peeled up and away, revealing a half-formed shadowy countenance beneath. I said, Those people aren't used to being told to go away. Things must have gotten ugly. Not Immediately, Sparky said. We just put down the automated window shades so they couldn't see into the house. They called our landline and told me they had a warrant. 
I said I wasn't impressed with warrants when their kind have so many corrupt judges in their pocket. They were a little miffed at that, so I said maybe I'd open up for them if I knew what this was about. And the guy on the phone said they had some questions related to what Bridget ordered on the Internet, which was when I knew we were in the soup. To Bridget, I said, what did you order? That's the payoff. First, tell them how it went, Grandpa. As we cruised through a pass in the hieroglyphic mountains, the moon rose like a dot waiting for the stroke that would make it an exclamation point. Sparky was silent for a long moment, and then he revealed that the Rain Kings were not your typical family next door. When I didn't let those bad boys in, they started shouting through a bullhorn. They were rude. They threatened to break down the door if we didn't disarm and come out. It would have been fun to watch them try. The front and back doors had a quarter-inch plate of steel sandwiched between layers of wood, and they were set in a steel frame with high and low deadbolts two inches long. So unless those fancy-dressed fascists could get a motorized battering ram, they were going to be a long time knocking it down. They might have been able to shoot out a window, but that would have taken a while because the bulletproof glass would withstand everything but high-caliber armor-piercing rounds— not the kind of ammo in their sidearms. While they were jabbering their threats, Bridget and I went to the cellar, into the walk-in wine cooler, cycled open the secret door, and vamoosed into the escape tunnel. I thought my amazement gland had been previously squeezed dry for at least a week, but I was wrong. Wow! If the dirty, hairy, clean-now delivery van hadn't been in the alley behind the diner, I'd be locked up in a prison for the criminally unique... I got through on luck, but you had bulletproof glass, a secret door, and an escape tunnel. Are you survivalists or something? No, 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 nothing silly like that, Bridget said. We stay as real as a stick in the eye. But Grandpa has something of a past, don't you, Grandpa? Something of, he acknowledged. Here and there, this and that, you know how it is. He was something then something else, then another something that we don't talk about. Then, when he was 36, 23 years ago, I wouldn't be born for another five years. He became a contractor. I built things, Sparky clarified, perhaps so that I wouldn't think he was a contract killer. By the time I was four, Bridget said, Grandpa realized we might need an escape tunnel. He had a construction company at the time, and he called on only his most trusted employees to work with him on our house without getting permits from the county. When we finished, Sparky said, I gave the guys the company, so they had an incentive to keep their mouths shut. That's when he became Daphne Larkrise, Bridget said, so he could work from home and always be with me, in case something wicked happened, which now it has. As I tried to track the history of Sparky Rain King, I became almost too dizzy to drive. Daphne Larkrise. I've heard that name somewhere. Of course you have, Bridget said. Everyone has. Daphne Larkrise is the most successful romance novelist of his time. Her time, Sparky corrected. Oops. Grandpa's old friend Daphne Larkrise is the face of Daphne Larkrise and does all the interviews and publicity stuff for 25% of the action, but Grandpa writes the books. He is a brilliant writer. I'm no John Grisham or Thomas Pynchon, Sparky said, but I've always been an incurable romantic, even though it could have gotten me killed back in the day when I was something and then something else and then another something that we don't talk about. I glanced at the rearview mirror. At the moment, there were no headlights from westbound traffic to flinch the mask of shadow from his face. Where does this escape tunnel of yours lead? Under the backyard and two hundred feet into the woods, said Bridget, to this fake boulder that's like a lid. Hydraulics flip it open so we can exit. From there, Sparky said, we went on foot about a half mile down to the woods to the county road, another property I own under the name Aurora Tea Garden. Ever since I was five, Bridget explained, we've kept one nondescript car or another there, packed with everything we'd need if we had to go on the run. I had maybe a hundred questions, maybe three hundred, but 
two big ones pried at me harder than the others. So, ever since Bridget was four or five, you've had a plan to escape. From whom? We didn't know, Sparky said. It was just obvious someone was going to come looking for her sooner or later. Turned out to be the ISA. But we've reason to believe there's others more dangerous than they are, and a whole lot stranger. Why was it obvious? Because she's special. Oh, I can see she's special, but how is she special? I asked thereby both revealing my enchantment and making a fool of myself. You'll see soon enough, Sparky said. It's better you see it happen instead of me trying to describe it. By now, I understood them well enough to know that if they were determined to be enigmatic, I would suffer a hernia trying to throw off their veil of mystery. I proceeded to my second big question, which I addressed to Bridget. In the glow of the instrument panel light, she was so radiant that I thought of the Roman deity Diana, goddess of the moon and hunting. I'd never met the goddess Diana, of course. I'd only seen her depicted in art, sometimes running with a pack of wolves. If I were a wolf and Bridget were Diana, I would, without question, run with her under the moon. This time I managed to avoid steering the Buick off the pavement onto the graveled shoulder of the road, as I said, what did you do to get the ISA on your tail? I suspect the same thing you did, she said. But I didn't do anything. They just walked into beans and interrupted my lunch. I think it's still legal to have a three-cheese hamburger, even one with mayonnaise. From the back seat, Sparky said, She spit in a cup. Because she didn't seem like that kind of woman, I said with some skepticism, You spit in a cup? Whose cup? My cup. It had a little screw top. It came with the kit after I signed up on the internet. She was right. I had spit in one, too. I spit in one, too, I said, feeling connected to her by that ritual, hoping she would feel closer to me, feel a bond, even if it had to do with spit. You spat in one, she said. My cup was from gettingtoknowme.com. Mine, too. Getting to Know Me was a competitor of Ancestry.com and of 23andMe. They read your genome and told you all about yourself, where you came from, who was a relative and who wasn't, whether you had a tendency to develop a horrible disease, all kinds of useful stuff. Bridget said, I wanted to learn who my father might have been. I was abandoned as an infant, I revealed. I have no idea who either of my parents are. I was raised by nuns in an orphanage, but... Why should the ISA come down hard on us for wanting to know our ancestry? We have a right to know. What business is it of the government if we want to know? Did you get your genome report? Sparky asked. No, not yet. Neither did I, Bridget said. But the company sent it to the ISA. Those two suits you killed at the ranch? They explained the situation to us. I'm sure you were targeted for the same reason. What reason? When she turned those sea-green eyes on me, the instrument panel light tinted them a color that I couldn't name. She said, several sequences in my genome are not human. She looked like the best example of a human I had ever seen. Confused, potentially more disappointed than frightened, I said, you're not human? I'm human, yeah, but I'm something else, too. Something more. More what? That's what the ISA wants to know about me and about you. You're like me. I'm pretty sure I'm human. From the deep shadows of the back seat, Sparky said, You're human, son. But like Bridget, you're also something more. And maybe just a little slow on the uptake. Bridget said, In your own way, you're as different as I am, Quinn Quicksilver. You have your magnetism. I have what I have. Keep your speed up, Sparky advised. We don't want to be tail-ended. I had allowed the Buick to slow to under 30 miles an hour. I accelerated, even though I felt that I was speeding toward a cliff with a void beyond. A creepy possibility occurred to me. Are we like in that movie Village of the Damned? Were we fathered by aliens, something from another world? Maybe, she said. Or maybe something else. 
turns you inside out a little, doesn't it? Leaning forward, gripping the backrest of the front seat to steady himself, thrusting his head between me and his granddaughter, Sparky Rain King said, How do you propose to research your origins in Pepto? There are these three men. Nineteen years ago, they found me in a bassinet in the middle of a lonely highway. My name and date of birth were written on a card. I was three days old. When this magnetism thing started, I thought just maybe those guys might have seen something, might know something, suspect something, that they never told the county sheriff when they took me to him. Do you feel pulled to Pepto, or is it just a place to go? I don't feel drawn, no, but what else do I have? Then let's do it, Sparky said. Let's do it, Bridget agreed. We drove to the town of Carefree, then south toward Scottsdale, and the moon that had been ahead of us now kept pace on our port side. If the night harbored wolves that raced in time with our car, they were likely to be the human rather than the lupine kind, not in the thrall of my passenger goddess, but in pursuit of her. 8. Whether part alien or part something else, I was suddenly all appetite. My lunch had been interrupted by an attempted abduction, and therefore I had been too busy escaping, succumbing to strange magnetism, and running people down with my Toyota to have time for even a small snack. In spite of all the weirdness associated with Sparky and Bridget, they were good company, even when they were silent, as they were for a while as we followed a serpentine route through Scottsdale and then through Tempe where the unfortunately named Hohokam people ruled so long ago that not even the wisest and most far-sighted among those ancestors had foreseen the rainbow's end that would be Indian casinos. Like me, my companions were probably wondering if our lives would ever be normal again. We already knew the answer, which was no, so we might as well stop our pointless brooding and eat. As it turned out, they hadn't been yearning for normality but for dinner, so we were simpatico. If we drove straight through to Pepto, we wouldn't get there until about ten o'clock in the evening, too late to seek out Hakim Casper, Bailey Belshazzar, and Caesar Melchizedek. Instead, we swung onto Interstate 10 and followed it only a short way, past Chandler, to an exit for one of those truck stops that is a town unto itself, offering showers, haircuts, massages— an on-call minister, a crew of superb mechanics and other services, in addition to an archipelago of fueling islands where 18-wheelers schooled like whales, simple but clean motel rooms, a gift shop, and a restaurant. The restaurant was large but as cozy as a diner, with booth banquettes and chairs upholstered in red vinyl, lots of chrome, a long counter with swiveling stools, large four-page menus in plastic binders. Country music piped in neither too loud nor too soft. The waitresses could balance an array of plates along an arm from hand to shoulder, navigate a crowded room without dropping an order, and almost seemed to be part of a floor show. After the hostess seated us in a booth, Bridget and Sparky on one banquette, me on the other, Bridget went to the ladies' room, and I was alone with her grandfather. Putting down the tabloid size menu, he said, Nuns, huh? Yes, sir. In order of poor Claire's. Why weren't you adopted out? They couldn't find anyone who wanted me. Were you an ugly, fussy baby? I'm told I was cute and happy. Maybe the nuns didn't try hard enough. I came with twelve years of free tuition at the Catholic school of your choice, free diapers, and a plenary indulgence. Maybe if they'd thrown in a new car. One of their most generous supporters owned a Ford dealership, but after he took a look at me, he said a car wouldn't be enough. Did all this rejection traumatize you? Not at all. I was an infant. I didn't know what was happening. I was busy learning how to suck my thumb. He leaned over the table, drilling me with that sharp gray stare. Are you well balanced, Quinn? Are you psychologically and emotionally stable? I like to think I am, sir, except for this recent magnetism business. He studied me in silence for maybe ten seconds. 
It's damn important to me that you're psychologically and emotionally stable. I understand, I assured him. This strange situation we're in, the ISA on our tails, you need to know you can rely on me in a crisis. He dismissed that idea with a wave of his hand. No, that's not it. I need to know you're fit to marry Bridget. I gaped at him. Some country singer was crooning about killing the man who killed his hound dog, which almost seemed more romantic than how Sparky had broached the subject of marriage. When I couldn't think of a reply, he said, What's wrong? I swallowed twice and then said, I'm nonplussed. That's a word I'd never use in a romance novel. Too fancy. You shouldn't use it in a magazine article either. Just say perplexed or bewildered, even confused, but never nonplussed. Do you already have a girlfriend? No, I don't. Do you like girls? Well, of course. Everyone I dated was a girl. It's just that most girls these days, most guys, too, they're about social media and what they saw on YouTube and what the influencers say about everything. I just don't have much in common with most of them. You and Bridget have a lot in common. Wanted by government thugs, on the run, maybe alien DNA. Don't you like her? Of course I like her. What's not to like? I love her attitude, and she's funny. Witty. That's it. Funny, witty attitude? I'm talking to her grandfather. You're blushing, he said. That's sweet. Okay, all right, she's a goddess. She's so dazzling that I could maybe go blind looking at her. He smiled broadly. That's better. That's more like it. But we've hardly just met. And I don't think she likes me. Of course she likes you. She's been waiting two years for you to show up. What are you talking about? She knew you'd have blue eyes, and that you'd save her life with a car somehow, although she thought you'd be a lot taller and driving a Porsche rather than a Toyota. I'm not short, I said. I'm 5'11". Don't fret about it, Sparky said. She's 5'6", so... You're plenty tall enough. Bridget returned from the ladies' room, and a waitress arrived to take our drink order. Coffee, coffee, cherry coke. And Sparky went off to the men's room. You're blushing, Bridget said. No, I lied. It's just warm in here. The monsters wouldn't show up for twenty minutes. I didn't even know there would be monsters, so I had plenty of time to be further nonplussed before my confusion gave way to terror. She said... I should have apologized to you back at the Flying F Ranch. Sorry I called you a freaking Nazi zombie. I've been called much worse, I assured her, which was true. Those public school kids who lost the spelling bees had been a foul-mouthed bunch. I was still coming out of the chloroform they used on me, confused and sick with worry about Grandpa. I shouldn't have called you a worthless piece of garbage either. And I'm sorry I punched you in the chest. You have a solid punch. Did I hurt you? No, no, I lied. But you have a very solid punch. Grandpa hung a punching bag from the cellar ceiling and taught me how to go for a guy's ribs. He sparred with me, too. When I was 14, he stopped pulling his punches. He's a great teacher. I was afraid that at any moment she would mention marriage and that I would again be rendered speechless. So I said, why did you hide out in a place like that ranch? You're from Flagstaff. How did you even know about the Sweetwater Flying F? It was once a beautiful resort, and also a working ranch, not just a dude ranch. So you could have any level of experience you wanted. That's where Sparky and Jeanette spent their honeymoon. Roping and branding calves, breaking wild mustangs. It was also a rattlesnake farm. Grandpa and Grandma milked venom from the snakes so it could be sent away to make anti-venom. Isn't that a marvelous, different kind of honeymoon? Romantic enough for a Daphne Larkrise novel, I said. Grandma Jeanette must have been something. I never knew her. She died a year before I was born. Grandpa has been a wonderful substitute father, but it would have been nice to have a substitute mother as well. My real mother, Corinne... 
didn't want me. I couldn't have stopped looking at her even if something in the kitchen had exploded and a fire alarm had gone off. Who wouldn't want you? Anybody would want you. I heard myself and hurried to clarify. I mean, why on earth wouldn't she want you? Sparky and Jeanette couldn't have children, so they adopted Corinne when she was four. Apparently, Corinne's mother either drank a lot or did drugs during her pregnancy, so Corinne was never right. She was a problem as a child, more of a problem as an adult. Very pretty. I have photos of her, but a week after I was born, she gave me to Sparky and she split. He never saw her again. He reported her missing, but the authorities couldn't find a trace of her. Neither could any of the three private detectives that Grandpa hired to chase her down during the first two years after she left. It was like she walked out of this world into another. When you were raised in an orphanage, the other kids weren't all abandoned on a highway when they were three days old. Some ended up at Mater Misericordiae after they were old enough to have known the parents they lost, or the parents who abused them or otherwise failed them. Some hid their pain. Others could not. We were an extended family, and largely a happy one, because the poor Clares loved us, and because we cared about one another. But we were aware that our happiness was a ship sailing on waters dark with sorrow. I said, To know your mother's name, to have seen her face, even if just in photographs, that makes it a lot worse than if she'd been unknown, a total mystery. I'm sorry, Bridget. That's a terrible burden to bear. She shrugged. Well, it's not like I loved her and lost her. I never knew her. I had often used a similar line. It was a defense against the resurrection of sharp emotions. Unfolding her napkin and smoothing it on her lap, Bridget said, But I think Grandpa was torn up by it. In spite of all the trouble Corinne had been, he loved her. And he'd lost Jeanette to cancer not long before all this. He was so lucky to have you, I said. Having you would have made all the difference. Such a blessing. I heard myself again and said, I mean, a widower with a thankless daughter. He needed someone to give him a sense of purpose. At that point, Sparky returned from the men's room, and the waitress, Darlene, brought our drinks. She was a Zoftig, forty-ish brunette, with maybe three pounds of hair swirled up in a fabulous creation and pinned atop her head. Darlene had the silken, smoky voice of a chanteuse, the physical presence of an opera diva, and the confidence of a matador. She called Sparky Mr. Man, called me Choir Boy, I don't know why, and renamed Bridget Angel, which I entirely understood. Darlene warned us away from the chicken soup. She recommended the pulled pork sliders with coleslaw and fried onions, which came with french fries, and she took our orders. After Darlene departed with the promise to be back in ten, Sparky said, So, have you kids been hitting it off? I said, I'm sorry about Jeanette and Corinne. Well, he said, you can either do the wrong thing and let a loss like that destroy you, or you can do the right thing and be properly grateful for all that came before the loss. Grief should drive you to your knees, but if you stay there forever, you're saying you know better than God how the world should work. And you don't. He looked at Bridget. So he's five feet eleven. Is that okay with you? She put a hand on his shoulder and squeezed affectionately. He's just right, Grandpa. Actually, I worried that he might be as tall as a basketball star and people would stare at us everywhere we went. She smiled at me. I take it that Grandpa told you I've been expecting you for two years? Her eyes were the warm green of Caribbean waters, and I felt myself floating away on her gaze. Uh, so then, you know, um, what if the guy in this vision of yours... What if he wasn't me? It wasn't a vision, a presentiment, and he's you, I'm sure. How could he not be you, considering how we met and what we are? But we don't know what we are. Precisely, she frowned. I'm certain you're him, and this is meant to be, but maybe you're not sure. Sparky didn't give me a chance to fumble the moment. Quinn is sure. It's just that he hasn't had much luck with girls. So he lacks confidence when it comes to romance. 
Daphne Larkrise knows his type. He's rather like Kenny Talbot in Love Insurance. I adored that character, Bridget said. He's shy like Kenny, Sparky said, unsure of himself, perhaps too humble for his own good. But he's got great potential. I said, you know, I'm right here. Oh, yes, absolutely, Bridget said. That's what I like so much about you. You're always right here, in the moment. Never lost in yourself and off somewhere. That's a rare quality these days. We just met this morning, but I feel like I met you two years ago. Sparky recognized the moment when I began to adapt to the high weirdness of our situation, when my perplexity began to mellow into a kind of delightful amazement. He shifted from being a cheerleader for romance to being a substitute father with the usual concerns. His brow corrugated. His gray gaze grew flinty. You realize, Quinn, that there can be no marriage until we understand this wild river we're in. Run whatever rapids must be run and reach calm water. I shaped my face into that of a responsible suitor with only chivalrous intentions, which, in fact, was the truth. Of course. And until there is a wedding, there will be no hanky-panky. Bridget appeared to be amused, but she also sounded as sincere as a stick in the eye when she said, None. As Daphne Larkrise has written, delayed gratification leads to greater satisfaction. Quinn? Sparky said. Yeah, yes, I feel the same. When he continued to skewer me with a stare, I said, Remember, I was raised by nuns. Oh, I remember. Just so you don't forget. I said, it's not a thing you forget if you don't want to spend a week peeling potatoes. That was when the monsters arrived. Nine. I didn't immediately realize they were monsters. They appeared to be about twenty years old, clean-cut Ivy League college boys, the kind who had gone to the best private schools since they were two and learned to read by paging through GQ magazine. The blonde wore Converse sneakers, black jeans, a black polo shirt, and a pale gray summer weight knee-length top coat. His companion wore bright yellow sneakers, a gray suit, a white and yellow t-shirt. He carried a red and black checkered tote bag. The hostess tried to seat them near us, but they wanted a booth at the very back of the room, though that meant sitting near the two swinging doors to the kitchen. They didn't appear to be accustomed to sitting near the kitchen, but they insisted on it. Bridget said softly, Screamer alert, Grandpa. Quinn, Sparky whispered, Don't stare at them. They're major bad news. As the two glided through the restaurant, they surveyed the customers with what seemed to be amused contempt. I had sometimes wondered what it must be like to be their type. To be so self-assured in all circumstances, so certain of being superior, my imagination was not up to the task. We never know what their kind are looking for. We're afraid it might be Bridget. I looked away from the duo as they followed the hostess in our direction. Bridget reached across the table. Give me your hand. Holding her hand was preferable to taking a punch from her. She raised her voice and put a little gush in it. Darling, the Arizona Biltmore is the perfect place for the reception. Yes, it's expensive. But if Grandfather insists on paying for it... I do, Sparky said. I insist... My only grandchild is marrying the son of my best friend on my own wedding anniversary. What could be more romantic? It makes me feel young and in love again. There's no price too high for that feeling. From the corner of my eye, I saw the college boys slow as they passed our booth, perhaps giving us a close inspection. Sweetums, I want whatever you want, I declared. I turned my smile on Sparky. Sir. I'm knocked out by your generosity. Really knocked out. Just totally knocked out. The stylish pair moved away from us. I dared to look up and saw the right hand of the one carrying the tote. His hand was no longer a human hand. The six fingers lacked knuckles and resembled tentacles, gray and sinuous, 
wickedly sharp talons gleamed for an instant, but then were gone, retracted, as if they did not exist. The hand appeared to be highly articulated and yet amorphous, as if by an act of will the creature could remake that instrument from a tool into a lethal weapon. As I squeezed Bridget's hand, she gripped mine tighter and said, You see? Yes, I looked after the retreating pair. These beasts were like menacing presences from those disturbing dreams that have their origins in generations long before our own. Those dreams that boil up from the primordiality of our creation. They moved through the restaurant and settled into the booth near the entrance to the kitchen. They lacked anything that could be called a face. Screamer alert, Bridget had told her grandfather. I understood why she would call them screamers. These things seemed to be perpetually straining to scream, although no sound escaped them. Where a face should have been, there were no apparent eyes or ears or nose, but only a pale-lipped mouth fixed open wide, as circular as a drain, like the mouth of a hookworm. At a distance, I couldn't be sure, but I thought that a repulsive organ slithered continuously within those disgusting orifices, as though they were greedy for sustenance. As the well-dressed pair perused their menus, their double identities faded back and forth from human to fiend to human, as if in sympathy with the slow pulse of an alien heart. The expressions that occupied their human faces now conveyed the arrogance of those who considered humanity to be the dispossessed, who sneered at our corrupted nature, though our wickedness was a risable and pathetic reflection of their own much darker desires and impulses. The longer I watched these beasts, the more palpable their evil became. For all their strangeness, the screamers grew more familiar by the minute, as if I'd known their kind all my life. In fact, had known them even before I was born. This eerie familiarity chilled me to the marrow. My understanding of the true nature of the world was undergoing a seismic shift, or was I merely shedding adult illusions for the fantastic truth that every child knows? In spite of one bizarre turn of events after another, in spite of all my rushing around and my reckless surrender to the pull of mysterious forces, I sensed that I wasn't falling away into a new reality. Instead, I felt as though I might be coming home to the world I knew a long time ago, where the monsters lurking in the closet weren't always imaginary, where a desperate but secret war was being waged by two armies in disguise, where victory had nothing to do with conquering territory, where the battlefield was the human heart, the spoils of war, the human soul. When Bridget withdrew her hand from mine, I thought I would see the college boys only as they had first appeared to me, but instead the monstrous, faceless faces continued to come and go. I don't know if Bridget, by her touch, passed to me the power to see through their masquerade or whether my gift had evolved without her aid. In any case, when I looked at Sparky, he said, Whatever you two are, I'm not. I can't see them as they really are, but I always believed her when she told me about them. A thin sweat greased the nape of my neck. What in God's name are those things? Bridget said. I don't know. I didn't see the first one until two years ago. I've seen quite a few since. There was a really hairy incident with one of them a few months ago. What incident? Instead of explaining, she said, Maybe they're from another world, another dimension, another time. Whatever they are, my sense is they're nothing new, that they've been among us for a long time. If the events of the day had been profoundly disturbing, they had also inspired in me a pleasing sense of adventure, a tentative longing for a life flavored with more excitement than that enjoyed by a magazine writer who'd spent most of his years in an orphanage. Suddenly, excitement struck me as being the pursuit of fools, and adventure seemed to have become a synonym for suicide. Darlene arrived with our plates balanced on her left arm, from hand to shoulder. With her right hand, she dealt the three orders of pork sliders onto the table, spilling not one drop of sauce or a single french fry. Enjoy yourselves, children. I'll be right back to refill your drinks. 
I thought the repellent pair of masqueraders must have killed my appetite, but even condemned men on death row eat a hearty dinner before the lethal injection, in denial of their mortality. It is human nature to know we die and still to disbelieve it, otherwise we might not carry on. When the aroma rising from the sliders made my mouth water, I picked up the first of the two small sandwiches and finished it by the time Darlene returned with a Pyrex coffee pot in one hand and a fresh cherry Coke in the other. I ordered a second plate of sliders, and so did my companions. Darlene beamed at us. I like folks who know what eating is all about. Some come in here, they don't want dressing on their salad, don't want butter on their baked potato. They want a plant burger. They should just save themselves some money, go out in a field and graze. We haven't eaten here in a while, Bridget said. Is Jose still the head chef? I think it was Jose or Juan or maybe just Joe. There was a Jose back when. He was good. But now it's one of us, Paloma, and she's even better than he was, don't you think? A woman cooking at a truck stop. Bridget clapped her hands with delight. Darlene said, There was a time I never thought I'd see it. What with the good old boy management you get in this business? I couldn't understand why Bridget cared a whit who the chef was when there were monsters in the room. When Darlene left us to our meal, I said, Screamers, huh? It isn't just the open maw, Bridget said. First time I saw one, I thought of that painting, the scream. These creatures terrify me, but I also think there's something despairing about them. If a scream ever came out of one, it would be a howl of hatred, but also of blackest insanity, like an entire asylum full of mad voices all shrieking at once. In the spirit of a man slated for execution immediately after dessert, I found myself licking the sauce off my fingers, craving every iota of pleasure available to me, assuming that pleasure can be measured in iotas. What do they want? What are they doing? We don't know, Sparky said. Maybe we'd rather not know, but we think it's inevitable that we'll find out, unless one of them realizes Bridget and you can see the truth of them. I stopped licking my fingers. Is that possible? Why couldn't it be? And then? Nothing good, which is why we have to play ignorant. I thought about that. I didn't like thinking about it. I almost lost my appetite, after all. By the way, I said, you two were great with all that wedding reception patter. I wish I could be that smooth. I'm sorry I said knocked out three times. Once would have been better, Bridget said. You did fine, Quinn, but just... Never again call me sweetums. I couldn't believe I heard myself say it. We ate in silence for a minute or two, and then I remembered. You said there was an incident with one of them. What incident? Bridget put down what remained of her second slider and wiped her fingers on her napkin, like an adult. Evidently, she'd seen enough screamers that the sight of two more didn't reduce her to the morbid conviction that she'd soon be torn apart and swallowed by a large walking worm with wicked hands. I expected her to reveal the details of the aforementioned incident. Instead, the napkin fell out of her hands, and she went as still as if she'd been flash-frozen and her gaze fixed on something as distant as a moon of Saturn. Although Sparky didn't put down his slider, he lowered it from his mouth without taking another bite. He said, Uh-oh. I didn't ask, uh-oh what? My brain had already downloaded too many weird and scary events for one day. Yeah, I had more storage capacity, but I wasn't going to solicit additional freaky data. After maybe twenty seconds, Bridget unfroze. Her expression remained grim, but her stare shifted several million miles to her grandfather. They're going to kill a lot of people. I didn't ask, but Sparky seemed to think I had, so he said, She means the screamers. They're heavily armed, she said. They're waiting. As the dinner hour peaks and the restaurant gets full, they're going to open fire. It'll be a massacre. We lived in a strange, dark time. Massacres were growing more common, and not all of them involved guns. Sometimes the weapon of choice was a bomb. 
sometimes Molotov cocktails thrown into a crowded church or synagogue. Now and then an airplane was flown into a building or a train of tanker cars was intentionally derailed and several square blocks of a town were set afire by the spilled petroleum. More often than not, the perpetrators claimed a just and noble cause. Throughout history, whole societies that seemed stable have imploded when self-righteous narcissists, inflamed by insane ideologies, so threatened the larger population of the sane that soon everyone feared to stand against the violence, whereupon madness accelerated. No one seemed to remember the lessons of history, or cared to learn them. Perhaps we would persevere through this current darkness. But the very fact of it argued for a second order of pulled pork sliders, which Darlene now brought to table, and, if time permitted, the richest dessert on the menu, just in case it would be our last. Bridget picked up her second slider, which she had left half-finished, and she polished it off. I said, What? Uh, you had a vision? I don't have visions. It was a presentiment, a feeling, an impression, but pretty specific. She pushed the empty plate aside and slid one of the fresh orders in front of herself. We've got time to enjoy these, but we'll have to split before we can tackle the banana cream pie. As Sparky tucked into his food again, I said, But... Yes, dear? Bridget said. But shouldn't we call the police? That won't do any good, she said. They'll think it's a crank call. And the minute they show up, the screamers will open fire. Then shouldn't we warn these people? Sparky said. Same situation, son. We'd only be precipitating the massacre. The moment we shout a warning, the screamers will start blasting away. But... What is it, dear? Bridget asked, though her mouth was full. We can't just walk out and let people die. Of course we can't, said Sparky. Then what are we going to do? I asked. Kill the screamers. Bridget said. They can be killed? Of course they can, she said. We've done it before. The incident, I surmised. There you go, Sparky said. Ten. There is a famous story of demons being cast out of men and into a herd of swine that thereupon ran into the sea and drowned. Bridget, Sparky, and I had neither the power, nor the pigs, nor a nearby sea that would allow us to deal in that fashion with the demons that came to dine in the truck stop. Envisioning the combat to come, I foresaw myself bullet-riddled, slipping across a floor littered with a variety of fried foods, taking a prat fall into several spilled orders of banana cream pie. I do not find any death to be a laughing matter. However, I expect that in the aftermath of my own demise, I'll probably find the circumstances of my murder, I am convinced it will be a grisly homicide, to be one degree or another absurd and probably amusing. After all, the human pageant is both tragic and comic. Those who are unable to perceive the humor of it also do not grasp the true horror of it. Therefore, they fail to understand life or where it's taking them. Maybe that's a blessing, but I don't think so. They say that ignorance is bliss. I think ignorance is the mother of extreme behavior, ensuring either a colorless and tedious life or one of passionate commitment to foolishness of one kind or another. So, each of us ate two more small pulled pork sliders, wishing they were larger. With two mass-murdering screamers waiting for the restaurant to get busy enough to provide a large number of victims, we ate in silence. We didn't have time to finish our dinner and discuss the state of modern interpretive dance, or whatever we might have discussed in less fraught circumstances. Bridget wiped her hands on her napkin, neatly folded it, put it beside her plate, and said, Logically, we'd leave the restaurant by heading away from the kitchen. When we start toward the back, those two wormheads might be suspicious. Then you do think they know some like us can see them? Maybe, Sparky said. But if so, it seems like they aren't able to detect who those seers are. However, Bridget said, they're highly suspicious by nature. Look at one of them with revulsion, 
and you're liable to trigger a violent reaction quicker than if you started to sing the national anthem at a college faculty luncheon. So we have to put on a little performance. You know what I have in mind, Grandpa? Paloma, Sparky said. Since we won't be stopping at the cashier, leave plenty of money for the full check plus tip. We don't want to stiff Darlene. We're already going to screw up her evening. What performance? I asked. What am I supposed to do? You just trail close behind us, Sparky said, as he counted bills out of his wallet. And don't say anything, especially not Sweetums. We'll wait till the hostess escorts customers to a table toward the back. Get ready to move quickly so the timing will work, Bridget said. Bridget and Sparky seemed eerily calm, while I was hoping to get out of this with clean shorts. The place is filling up. There aren't many empty tables left. Picking up her large purse and zippering it open, Bridget said, We've still got a little time. You're sure? If I wasn't sure, I'd be shrieking like a little girl and running for the exit. I warned her. I'm maybe a minute from doing that. A minute passed, and I didn't make a spectacle of myself. When a hostess appeared, moving among the tables in the center of the room rather than along the booths, trailed by a young couple, Bridget slung the straps of her purse over her right shoulder and moved to the edge of the banquette. Wait. Wait. Now. She slid out of the booth. Sparky followed her, and I followed him. I told myself that if I wasn't eaten by coyotes while lying in a bassinet, I was meant to survive for a purpose more important than having a meal of pulled pork sliders in an Arizona truck stop before being shot down by worm heads. Calculating a trajectory with exquisite precision, Bridget angled off among the tables, as if she had no intent other than intercepting the hostess. Only the most suspicious screamers would notice that at the same time she was drawing closer to them with her right hand in her open purse. Excuse me, please, she said, waving her left hand, speaking a little louder than necessary. Is Paloma in the kitchen tonight? The hostess meant to come to a stop to respond, but Bridget took her by the arm and moved her along with such aplomb that it seemed quite natural. No, no, I don't mean to delay you. I'm Paloma's friend. May I pop in the kitchen for a sec? Tell her what a fabulous job she's doing. Although the hostess said the kitchen wasn't open to the public, Bridget pretended to misunderstand, responding loud enough for her targets to hear. Oh, that's so sweet. Paloma is a treasure. I'll only be half a sec. As they reached the empty table toward which they had been headed, Bridget let go of the hostess and covered the last few steps to the booth beside the kitchen entrance. Sparky had been following her, but as she closed in on the screamers, he quickly moved up to her side, drawing the pistol from under his coat as she drew hers from her handbag. One of the college boys' slash monsters reached into the checkered tote on the banquette beside him and withdrew a pistol with an extended magazine that held maybe twenty rounds and the other began to pull aside a panel of his top coat to draw a weapon. But they were too late. The point-blank fusillade that Bridget and Sparky unloaded on the pair caused a sensation in the restaurant. Dishes and flatware rang off the floor. Toppled chairs clattered. Shrill cries erupted as people dived for cover or fled toward the nearest exit. Such is the temper of our strange times that the reaction was instantaneous and universal as though everyone present had been anticipating such a moment for years. Leaving two dead something or others in the booth, Bridget and her grandfather moved directly to the adjacent swinging doors and disappeared into the kitchen. As I passed the bloody booth, those bizarre creatures no longer fluctuated between being college boys and worm heads. Somehow, in death, their bodies locked into the human mode which would be most inconvenient if we were ever required to stand trial for executing them. I might have doubted that I'd ever seen those monsters. But the guns they possessed and the ten or twelve spare magazines that had spilled out of the overturned tote established their intentions and thereby also seemed to confirm that the horrific creatures that Bridget and I had seen were no illusion. I hurried through the swinging doors and saw my companions rushing toward the back of the enormous kitchen. The staff regarded us wide-eyed, less fearful than perplexed. The culinary cacophony in the kitchen had partly masked the gunfire. The busy workers appeared, in fact, 
to be in a state of such utter perplexity at our frantic intrusion that you might say they were nonplussed, even if you could expect to be criticized for using that word. We found our way into the night and sprinted along the back of the enormous building, which covered a few acres. I suppose Bridget must have been as radiant as ever, no less so than the Roman goddess Diana. She was certainly lithe and swift, considering the volume of pulled pork that she'd eaten. But running with her under the moon in the aftermath of a hunt was far less romantic than I had imagined, and not at all mystical. I thought we'd never make it around the building to the parking lot without pursuit, would never make it to the Buick without being apprehended by truck stop security. I was wrong. Sparky took the keys from me and said he would drive, and Bridget meant to ride up front. I plunged into the back seat and pulled the door shut and lay gasping for breath, at first staying below the windows, lest more screamers were in the vicinity and would open fire on us. Back in the day, the boy, the father, the ants. My best friend at the orphanage was Lytton Ormond, though only the nuns and I knew that was his real name, and even I didn't know it until he had been my roommate for almost a year. He lived with us under the name Peter Claver, which the sisters selected for reasons more clear to them than to me. Peter Claver was the saint who fed, and pressed hard for the freedom of, the African slaves in Colombia in the early 1600s. Lytton, a.k.a. Peter, was nine when he came to Mater Misericordiae, a year older than me, and for the next three years he looked out for me, as if he were my older brother. He wasn't strong or tough, but he was steadfast and brave. When he finally shared his story with me, late one night when neither of us could sleep, I was in awe of him because of how he had coped with a horror that I could not imagine being able to endure. And I knew it was all true because it had been a media sensation the previous year. Corbett Ormond, Lytton's father, was a wife-beater. In May of the year that Lytton turned eight, his mother, Roxanne, left his father, filed for divorce, and moved in with her parents, Mark and Laura Rollins. Although Corbett never contested the divorce, made no threats against his wife, even granted her sole custody of their son as if the issue meant nothing to him, he was furious. Hot-tempered and vengeful, he was also patient and cunning. For six months, he had no contact with his ex-wife or his son, so that they came to feel safe. On Thanksgiving Day, when Roxanne and her brother and her sister and their children gathered at the Rollins home for the annual feast— Corbett came calling. He shot and killed seven adults and four children, sparing only Lytton. Instead of taking the boy with him, he forced him to stand at the center of the slaughter and said, This happened because of you, Lytton. When you chose her over me, you killed them all. Now live with it, boy. We know this because Corbett left a video. An angry, rambling statement so chilling that the news media reached a new level of depravity in the exploitation of what they insisted on referring to as his manifesto. Which wasn't a manifesto by any definition, but only an insane rant. Lytton called the police. Because Corbett remained a fugitive and inspired fear, child welfare found it impossible to place Lytton in any foster family longer than a few weeks. For months, he was cycled from home to home, until he came to the orphanage, hidden under a new name. He told me his story just that one time. By mutual, unspoken agreement, we never returned to the subject. I remember how he sounded in the telling, his voice colored neither by fear nor by grief, neither by anger nor bitterness, but hushed and reverent, much like the subdued and chastened tone the sisters took when speaking of the mysteries of the passion or the rosary. I often puzzled over why he trusted only me of all the kids at the orphanage. Considering where my life has taken me since then, I wonder if he intuited that I was destined to deal violently with those violent souls who would bear away all our peace and hope. Some nights he cried in his sleep. When awake, he never wept over his losses or about what he had seen. 
However, his dreams wrung tears from him, as well as pitiable sounds of fear and grief. Before he became my roommate, I had a nightlight, for I used to think that something sought me as I slept, but that it could harm me only in the dark. By that dim glow, I often moved a chair beside Lytton's bed when he suffered his worst dreams and watched over him. I found that if I spoke to him in the softest of whispers, I could reach him without waking him and gentle him out of a nightmare into peaceful sleep. Meanwhile, Corbett Ormond had shaved his head and grown a beard and gone off the grid, living under another name, dealing drugs. He made a new life for himself, but couldn't make a new man of himself. He didn't use the drugs he sold, for the only drugs that got him high were anger and resentment. The police never learned how Corbett discovered where his son had been given refuge. Mater Misericordiae stood at one end of the block, Bellini's Italian specialties at the other end. We children received modest allowances and were permitted to buy candy, cookies, or other treats at Bellini's as long as one of the sisters accompanied us. On the day that it happened, Sister Margaret took four kids to Bellini's. I am grateful I wasn't one of them, but Lytton was among the four. Later, we assumed Corbett had been running surveillance of the orphanage because he followed them into the store. As the kids were at the checkout counter with small bags of their favorite cookies, Corbett approached and asked, Who did the bitch your mother sleep with behind my back? As twelve-year-old Lytton turned toward his father, Corbett said, You don't look anything like me, and shot the boy dead. Corbett turned the gun on Sister Margaret, a freckled redhead as sweet as she was shy, young and devout and quiet, as helpless in those circumstances as a lame kitten in the path of a high-speed train. Michael Bellini, son of the owner, was behind the counter, where they kept a gun to defend against robbery. He was quicker with his first shot than Corbett was with his second. He put an end to the murderer before Sister Margaret could become yet another victim. A profound spiritual darkness settled on Mater Misericordiae, and everyone within its walls was traumatized. Hearts and minds heal with time, which is a grace of the human condition. Mine healed more slowly than others. And in fact, for the first time, I, the happiest of children, slipped into depression. I could not understand why such evil could befall a gentle boy like Lytton, why the world was shapen to allow it. I was despondent, beyond the present exercise of hope, sad and distressed. Sister Teresa, who'd earned a doctorate in psychology and who counseled many children and adults through times of crisis, was not able to reach me with the tools of psychology or the tenets of her theology. Although unfailingly patient, she was often frustrated with me. Her beautiful mahogany skin, so in contrast with her white habit, mostly hid a flush of annoyance, but I still saw it. After a few weeks, when I came to her office at the appointed time, I found that she had acquired an ant colony, a two-foot-tall, four-foot-long box with glass walls through which we could watch the tiny residents conduct their affairs. She also had a DVD documentary about ants, as well as several books about them. We're going to study ants for the next week. Nothing but ants. Hours and hours every day. You and me together, but also you alone. Why? I asked. That is for you to figure out, Quinn. You're a smart boy, more learned than most eleven-year-old boys. I'm confident that you'll have an aha moment sooner than later. They're just ants, I said with a note of indifference. And to an ant, you're just a foot. I frowned. A foot? That's all they see of you if they see even that when you step on them. But there's more to you than a foot, isn't there? We studied several varieties of the family formicity, the architecture and organization of their colonies, the classes into which they are divided, the tasks each class is given, the winged queen, the wingless female workers, the male drones that exist only to breed and die, those that cultivate food sources, the warriors. 
Perhaps, beginning with ants, I came to realize that everything in the world, regardless of how humble it might seem to be, is more complex and fascinating than it at first appears. Yet nothing I had learned about ants could cure my depression. When I wasn't studying bugs, I was doing little else than sleeping the sleep of despondency, twelve and more hours each day. When Sister Teresa deemed that we'd studied ants to the point of diminishing returns, she asked me if I would want to be an ant. No, I said. Why not? They don't do anything but work. That's the sum of it? She asked. You don't want to be an ant because they work too much. Yeah, and I'd always be scared some kid would step on me. Sister Teresa sighed. All right, then. You're a hard nut, Quinn Quicksilver. But we'll crack you. Next, we'll study birds. Part 2. Dirty Money, Attack Dogs, and Spurtles. 11. Remaining strictly under the speed limit, we were southbound on I-10 when I sat up in the back seat and stared at traffic speeding past us and at the traffic racing north, at the scattering of lights in the darkness of the Gila River Baptual Indian Reservation, at a sign announcing the distance to Casa Grande and Eloy and Tucson. As both a proud resident of the Grand Canyon State and a former writer for Arizona Magazine, I would once have found all that as familiar as my own face in a mirror. On this occasion, however, nature's realm and that of humankind were laced with mystery. Once, I might have idly wondered who occupied all those passing vehicles. Now I brooded instead about what infernal creatures might be traveling the night, what destinations they had in mind, and what outrages they intended to commit. Bridget retrieved a box of ammunition from under her seat. She began reloading her pistol and the one her grandfather had used. We cruised in silence for a while. I guess she and Sparky were thinking about how the scene in the restaurant could have played out less advantageously, with the three of us lying dead among scores of other victims. That was for damn sure a consideration that plagued me mile after mile. Eventually, I said, They must have security cameras. There'll be video of us. If the quality's any good, Sparky said, we'll have the ISA on our tail again in a few hours. What about the car? I asked. Maybe they've got video of us making for the Buick. We'll have to ditch the car, Bridget said. Grandpa, I think I better load two spare magazines. Four, he said. We can't abandon the Buick until we have new wheels, and we're not likely to find those until we're in livelier territory. Tucson's maybe an hour and a half. Once we get in the vicinity, you or Quinn can get behind the wheel, and we'll see what psychic attraction can do for us. He glanced at me in the rearview mirror. We say psychic attraction, and you say strange magnetism. Potatoes, potatoes. Tomatoes, tomatoes. You've got it, too? I asked Bridget. It's useful, she said, although it can also be dangerous. Sometimes it takes me to what I need, whether I'm consciously aware that I need it or only subconsciously. But other times, it can lead me into big trouble. Like the tiger, said Sparky. No, the tiger was cool. I was thinking of the bomb factory, Bridget said as she inserted cartridges into a spare magazine. Psychic magnetism led you to a tiger? Hey, Sparky said. I like that. Psychic magnetism. Says it better than either of the others. Again, I asked, Psychic magnetism led you to a tiger? She said, We were taking a little vacation in Georgia. It was peach season. I love their peaches, Sparky said. And some idiot had illegally bought a tiger cub for a pet. It quickly got big. Peach pie, peach cobbler, peach jam. And it got away. Scary news story. And, well... I've... Peach custard, peach tarts, anything peach. I've always been fascinated with tigers. My Jeanette was from Georgia, and she was a real peach. But I didn't know the tiger was what I was being drawn to. Having exhausted the subject of peaches, Sparky said, 
We're driving along with Woods on both sides, and Bridget insists that I pull over. I thought she was carsick. Bridget said, I've never been carsick. There's always a first time. So I pull over, and she springs out of the car and takes off into the woods. It was an extremely powerful attraction. I couldn't resist. So I ran after her. And when I found her, she had her back to a tree, and the tiger was growling at her. And the only weapon I had was a four-inch rip blade. No melodrama now. Alphonse wasn't growling. He was purring. He gave me the evil eye, Sparky said. Maybe you deserved it, waving that knife around. I still say it could have turned out worse. But it didn't. Could have. Didn't. I'd have fought him if I had to. I know you would have, Sparky. You're a valiant warrior. They fell silent, and I waited. But finally I asked her, So, then what happened? You mean with Alphonse? What else would I mean? Well, we walked him out of the woods, coaxed him into the back seat of the car, and drove him to the nearest animal shelter. I said, Okay, come on, what are you leaving out? Leaving out? Nothing. Alphonse was domesticated. Sammy domesticated, Sparky said. No tiger has ever totally cured of its wildness. Bridget made a dismissive noise. Alphonse was about as wild as that tiger who sells breakfast cereal. What's his name? Tony, I said. I was big into Frosted Flakes in those days, she said. Those days? When did this Alphonse thing happen? About ten years ago. I was nine. Sparky said, Actually, we did leave out one detail about Alphonse, the frozen custard. Oh, that's right, Bridget said. On the way to the animal shelter, we passed a Dairy Queen, and I just knew Alphonse would enjoy that. So we stopped. He enjoyed three big cones, Sparky said. I was sure he was going to throw it all up. Grandpa has this fear of having to clean up after someone gets car sick. I'd rather just trash the car and get a new one. She reached out to pat his shoulder. But it's an unnatural fear since it's nothing that ever happened to you, dear. I managed to rewind the conversation. You already had psychic magnetism at nine? To her grandfather, she said. When did it start with me? The magnetism when you were seven, almost eight. The thing with animals, I first noticed when you were about four. I remembered what they'd said about the deer looking in their windows, the squirrels that ate from their hands, and the fox named Carrie Grant that kept them company by curling up on a rocking chair on their back porch. Troubled by a sense of inadequacy, I said, You're seven when you get magnetism, and I'm nineteen. You start seeing the screamers two years ago, and I see them for the first time tonight. You're Dr. Doolittle at four, and I've not once yet talked with an animal. Turning her head to look back at me, Bridget said, I'm sure you're not developmentally disabled, Quinn. Whatever you and I might be, apparently our gifts come to us only as we need them. Living snug and protected by a lovely bunch of nuns, you just didn't need your gifts as early as I needed mine. Anyway, sometimes animals tell me things, but they don't talk. It's more of a mind meld, images and feelings. Oh, just a mind meld. No big deal. <laughs> What other gifts do you have? That's it, I'm afraid. Don't have x-ray vision. Can't fly. You handle a pistol as if it's an extension of your hand. That's not a gift. That's training. Grandpa knows everything about weapons. Every girl should have a sparky. To the back of her grandfather's head, I said, Did you learn everything about weapons when you were something or when you were something else? Or when you were another something that you don't talk about? Exactly he said, as I'd known he would. Twelve. Built in the days when cars were steel rather than fiberglass and light alloys and glue, the heavy Buick rolled through the night with the certainty of a train on tracks, with a reassuring rumble. It seemed we would be safe within it, even if the world beyond its windows metamorphosed into a kingdom of eternal night and infinite terrors. Having been, by age and custom and law, gently exiled from the orphanage and the only family I had ever known, I had the incipient sense that a new family was forming around me. 
Our kinship wasn't defined by bloodlines or by being parentless, but by an affinity and the need to meet a threat common to the three of us. The sisters of Mater Misericordiae had provided a loving but firmly ordered matriarchy, offering stability and encouragement, an environment in which I had thrived. This new little family was far stranger than that provided by the nuns, but warm in its own way, its history a ball of twine that, in its every loop, concealed a mystery. I was comfortable with mysteries. I had been raised on them, and I was one myself. Life without mysteries was incomprehensible, like a sandwich made of nothing but two slices of bread, and too tedious to contemplate. When we passed the town of Picacho, chasing our future south through the Sonoran Desert toward Red Rock and Rillito, I broached a sensitive subject. You said that your mother, Corinne, was never right, because her mother drank during pregnancy. F.A.S. Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, Bridget said. At first, Sparky spoke dispassionately, as though reciting a doctor's diagnosis that he had memorized. Not a severe case. You wouldn't know it to look at her. No physical deformities, no organ damage, just attention deficit disorder. Spells of hyperactivity, mood swings. She was often argumentative for no good reason. He hesitated. When he continued, his voice was softer, and a thread of sorrow raveled through it. But there was a goodness in her, too. A sweetness that I think was the true Corinne. That would have been the only Corinne if she hadn't been warped by F.A.S. I said, Bridget hoped that getting to know me might take her cup of spit and find her father. But, Sparky, didn't Corinne give even a hint of who the father might have been when she left her baby with you and split? Two important things, he said. First, she didn't look pregnant until the last two months of her third trimester— and then only slightly. She was one of those rarities who gained maybe ten or twelve pounds max. When she told me she was pregnant, she said she hadn't realized it for the first seven months. I don't see how that could be, but she was quite adamant. Although Corinne didn't drink alcohol, there was concern that the baby would be underweight and have birth defects. No need to worry, Bridget popped out at seven pounds, fourteen ounces, as lovely a baby as you've ever seen. She had grown lovelier over the years. I didn't say as much because I thought that might sound as dopey as Sweetums. Instead, I reminded Sparky that he'd said he had two important things to reveal. Well, you have to consider how Corinne was. When she was in a hyperactive state, which could last hours or weeks, she could become obsessed with odd ideas. Like that there's a city on the dark side of the moon, or that the Titanic never sank and... The whole story was invented to cover up a conspiracy of some kind, though she couldn't figure out what that conspiracy might be. So when she brought the baby to me a week after the birth said she was going away for a while, and then insisted that she'd not had relations with any man for fourteen months, that she'd become pregnant without coitus, I figured this was another fantasy. She wasn't a virgin. She didn't claim that an angel appeared before her to announce the birth of a savior. She was more inclined to believe that this had something to do with those who lived on the dark side of the moon, or with a new protein drink that she had tried. She was always half lost, the poor girl. But one thing I'll swear to at the cost of my soul, Corinne didn't lie. She had fantasies, or call them delusions, if you will, but she did not lie. The day she left her baby with me, she wasn't hyperactive, only bewildered and fearful. She believed what she said, though I knew it couldn't be right. Then, as the years went by and Bridget proved to be so gifted, well, like I said, Corinne didn't lie, and maybe in this case, somehow, she wasn't delusional either. For several miles, that stunning revelation crowded everything else out of my mind. Yet in spite of all the undivided consideration that I gave to the idea, 
I could make no sense of it. As we passed the town of Cratero, on the outskirts of Tucson, Bridget broke our mutual silence when she said, Well, if my father came down out of the stars, I hope he was Luke Skywalker rather than Jabba the Hutt. Thirteen. Surrounded by four mountain ranges, the city of Tucson occupied a high desert valley that was once the floor of an ancient sea. The first people settled there along the Santa Cruz River, about 12,000 years before the night that I arrived. Riding shotgun, with Sparky in the back seat once more, and Bridget Rain King at the wheel. We were relying on her mojo to draw us to a vehicle that could replace the soon-to-be hunted Buick. Just as the sea became a desert, so in a few millennia, the city would become something other than a city. Perhaps a sea again, or a jungle, because all things pass. Earth convulses violently when its magnetic poles shift, continental plates thrusting over and under one another, lowlands abruptly surging up, mountains crumbling, 3,000-foot-high walls of seawater racing several hundred miles inland and scrubbing away everything in their path. Then, there's also the fact that, to remain livable, the planet depends entirely on solar activity which can decline and induce ice ages that last thousands of years, or which might one day flare violently enough to boil oceans and incinerate an entire hemisphere. Yet we humans have the hubris to think we can build eternal cities, stop the aging process, control the climate, and create utopia at the point of a gun. I used to believe our subconscious recognition of our true helplessness in the face of cosmic forces was what explained the insane lust for power that makes so many into murderers, rapists, thieves, and raving mad ideologues. For their kind, such mean control allows the illusion of greatness, inspires even the foolish hope of immortality on Earth. However, now that I was aware that there were monsters in the world with diabolical intentions, I wondered what percentage of human misery might be a product of our own actions, and how much was the work of the silent screamers. Since time immemorial, the world's legends and faiths had included demons and other malevolent spirits, so perhaps in our postmodern rejection of the past, we cast aside more wisdom than ignorance. If envious humanity sought godlike power and fell from grace, it might be true that some race before us did the same, that we share this broken world with predators who were once beings of light and promise, but transformed themselves into creatures that worship the outer dark and wish the world to be one vast graveyard. Those were the big important thoughts that occupied me as I repressed belches inspired by pork which escaped as hisses through my clenched teeth. Meanwhile, we were drawn through Tucson on such a circuitous route that I began to wonder if the benefactor who granted us psychic magnetism was using it to mock us. In a commercial district, when we stopped at a traffic light, six men, ranging in age from perhaps thirty to fifty, stood under a lamppost on the corner. Dressed in off-the-rack suits and ties, they looked too solemn to be bankers, too lacking in style to be high corporate executives. Judging by their stiff posture and pinch-faced displeasure, they might have been a firm of lawyers anticipating yet another catastrophic accident and a brace of new clients at this notoriously unsafe intersection, or maybe college presidents in town to attend a conference on the urgent necessity of book banning. As the light changed and they entered the crosswalk, two by two, I suddenly saw their otherness. Like those at the truck stop, their faces, such as they were, and hands fluctuated between human and not, the truth of them invisible to the other pedestrians whom they encountered in this neighborhood, busy with nightlife. My first glimpse of them in the restaurant had shocked and repulsed me, but this second sighting strummed a deeper chord of horror. They were parasites made large, and yet they went about their work with as much secrecy as those roundworms that can invade a human being and attach to the walls of the intestines, there to slowly destroy the host without his knowledge. Six screamers, Bridget warned Sparky. 
watching them pass in the flux of fully human pedestrians who crossed the street from the far corner. I wondered if the entirety of human history had been infested with these creatures, swimming through civilization like blood flukes, navigating arteries and veins, feeding on our pain rather than on our flesh, or perhaps on both. The shivers that passed through me seemed not to originate in the muscles of the skin, but in my bones. Where are they going? What are they up to? I wondered. If we follow them, we draw attention to ourselves, Sparky said. No element of surprise. Six worm heads, just three of us. You can bet their briefcases contain something nastier than paperwork. Passing in front of our Buick, three of the screamers turned their heads toward us, those gaping maws working as if they might be lined with olfactory receptors, in which case the same organ gave them the sense of smell and the sense of taste. The apparent absence of eyes reminded me of what I'd once read about scallops, which are covered with scores of eyes, so tiny that we don't recognize them as such. Perhaps these creatures were equipped in the same manner. The flesh around the always open, always questing mouth might be prickled with numerous eyes as small as pencil points, presenting them with a strange view of the world that conceivably conveyed more data than our eyes brought us. Or maybe the human form in which the parasite concealed itself wasn't merely a disguise, but also a functioning avatar with which it perceived the world through the same five senses that we do. Of the three whose attention we'd drawn, two glanced at us and then moved on. However, the third came to a stop in front of our car and stared at us through the windshield. Lacking features, the face of its hidden nature produced no expressions that could be read. However, the face of its human disguise, which I saw alternately come into focus and fade, expressed puzzlement verging on suspicion, as if the creature sensed something wrong with us a wrongness to which it was unable to apply a name. Although the light had not yet changed, I said, Blow the horn. Get him to move. Not rude enough, Sparky said. Show it that you're number one, Bridget. She put a hand to the windshield and favored the beast with her middle finger. The screamer remained inscrutable, but the puzzlement on its human face dissolved into a sneer. It turned from us and hurried to catch up with the others in its group. Why did that work? I asked. From behind me, Sparky said, Misdirection. If they're the essence of evil and suspect that guardians like you and Bridget are in the world, then they won't expect you to be crude, obscene. Guardians? I said. The word unsettled me no less than had been scrutinized by the screamer. Guardians of what? The traffic light changed to green, and Bridget motored on. When neither she nor Sparky answered my question, I repeated it. Guardians of what? Maybe of everything, she said. Everything as in... Everything as in everything, she said. Now isn't the time to discuss our theory of all this, Quinn. When will it be time? It'll be time when it's time, sweetheart. When will I know it's time? When I tell you. That's what I thought you'd say. She smiled at me. Maybe you're becoming psychic yourself. After we traveled a while in silence, I said, Guardians sounds like a full-time lifetime job. Maybe we're not guardians. Maybe instead we're just being sent on a quest. We're guardians, Bridget said. I didn't want to give up on the idea of a limited commitment. I mean, like a great and noble quest. The kind knights in medieval romances set out upon. They traveled far into strange lands until they found the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant or whatever, and then they went home and spent a few years drinking mead, eating roast haunch of wild boar, competing in lance-throwing contests. We're guardians, Sparky said. Well, maybe, I said, or maybe not. I guess we'll see. At last, we arrived in an eclectic neighborhood of bland stucco houses standing next door to charming craftsman-style bungalows and across the street from mid-century modern travesties. Bridget slowed almost to a stop. She peered beyond me, out of the passenger side window, as we coasted past a dark residence that looked as if it should have been on the hill above the Bates Motel. It's in Nottingham, she said cryptically 
Doesn't look much like one, Sparky said. The pull is strong. What's a Nottingham? I asked. You'll see, she said as she pulled to the curb and parked two doors away from the house that intrigued her. You and I will go in together. Grandpa will be our getaway driver if we need one. He's a maniac behind the wheel when he needs to be. That's comforting to know. Who might we have to get away from? The kind of people who, if they catch you trespassing, cut your feet off with a reciprocating saw and urinate on you while you bleed to death. I have no experience of such people, I said. I don't think I'll be of much use to you. Nonsense, Quinn. You've got everything it takes, which I knew you would all the while I waited two years for you finally to show up. You're the right stuff. Anyway, my sense is that no one's at home right now. Is your sense of a thing like that as reliable as your presentiments? Oh, heck no. It's more like a hunch. The Buick was so old that it had a bench-style front seat. Her handbag stood between us. She withdrew from it the pistol she loaded earlier, while we'd talked about tigers, peaches, and car sickness. Should I have a gun? I asked. Do you know how to use one? Not really. Then we won't give you a gun until Grandpa can teach you. Better be soon, Sparky said. I'd hate to see his head blown off, which is sure to happen if we don't get him geared up. I don't like knives, I said. They're too personal. What will I have if I don't have a gun? Your wits, she said. That's all you'll need when you've also got me. She took a roll of blue painter's tape from her purse. What's that for? She smiled and pinched my cheek. You're a question monkey, aren't you, dear? Come on, let's go. She got out from behind the wheel, and her grandfather took her place as she walked around the back of the Buick. Reasonably certain that we weren't going to do anything as mundane as paint a room in the Target house, I got out of the car and closed my door and met her on the sidewalk. The evening was quiet, except for music issuing from a residence across the street. Instead of one grim variety or another of the stultifying noise with which narcissists tortured their neighbors these days— the night was graced by Mozart's K-488. I knew the concerto because Sister Teresa was a Mozart head, and this was her favorite piece by the composer, which she had often played while we studied ants and whatnot. With bats kiting soundlessly overhead and eating unsuspecting insects in midair, with the black moonlight dusted mountains thrusting at the stars, this music seemed to seep into the desert dark, as if from another... Better world. As Bridget and I walked back to the house that interested her, where perhaps foot fetishists waited with a reciprocating saw, a soft breeze sprang up. Overhead, the fronds of palm trees whispered as we approached the front door. If I'm wrong and someone's home after all, she said as she rang the bell, then we'll just say we thought that Bill and Mary Torgenwald lived here. We've been given the wrong address. Why Torgenwald? It sounds more real than Smith. Eric and Inga would seem to go with Torgenwald better than Bill and Mary. My imaginary friends, she said, are the children of the children of Swedish immigrants, so they're third generation and thoroughly Americanized. After she'd rung the bell three times without a response, she led me to the back of the residence. Stucco property walls and tall cypresses screened the yard. In the moonlight, the grass appeared to be dead and matted flat. The back door was hinged on the left and featured four panes of glass. Bridget peeled strips of blue tape from the roll and began to cover the lower pane on the right. You're going to break the glass, I said softly. With as little noise as possible, she whispered. Bill and Mary won't mind. What if there's an alarm? Won't be. An alarm system would suggest there's something here worth stealing. That's the last thing these people want anyone to think. The house is in poor repair, a dump. Your average burglar sees no reason to bother with it. We're not your average burglars. We decidedly are not. When the pane was fully taped, she hammered with the butt of the pistol, producing quiet thumps. The cracking of glass was hardly audible. When she pushed on the tape... The fractured pane fell out of its frame and into the room beyond with a soft clatter. 
rather than a sound you'd associate with breaking glass if you were a neighbor. She reached through the gap, felt for the deadbolt thumb turn, and found it. I followed her inside, continuing a crime spree unprecedented for a modern misericordiae boy. With a pen light taken from a jacket pocket, hooding the lens, she swept the kitchen with the beam. Judging by the dirty vinyl tile floor, the overflowing garbage can, the crusted dishes, and the open pizza box that contained two moldy slices, whoever lived here had no interest in housekeeping and no fear of disease. What's that sour smell? I asked. Stale pot smoke. Somebody does a lot of weed. The refrigerator was stocked with a variety of cheeses and lunch meats, and at least forty bottles of Corona. A small bowl contained four eyeballs. We stared at the eyeballs in silence, and then I said, I don't think they're real eyeballs. I think what they are, uh, they're one of those gross candies that kids like. If they were real eyeballs, they would have been pried out of someone, so they wouldn't look as perfect and neat as these. You're right, she said, whether she thought I was or not, and she closed the refrigerator door. She stood listening turning her head left and right. The best thing with an attack dog is to move slowly. Don't challenge it. For sure, don't turn your back on it. Because I was still convincing myself that the eyeballs were the equivalent of candy that looked like green snot and candy that looked like worms, and all the other grotesque candies with which children proved their courage, I needed a moment to absorb what Bridget had said. Attack dog? There's an attack dog? Maybe. I'm not sure. We'll see. She walked out of the kitchen, debris of some kind crunching under her feet. Following her into the hallway, where the hardwood flooring was as dirty as the vinyl in the kitchen, I said, What'll you do? Shoot it if it attacks? I would never shoot a dog. But a really bad dog. There are no bad dogs, Quinn. Only dogs that people have taught to do bad things. That's sweet. Probably even true. But maybe it's been trained to kill. I think if I was going to be killed by a dog, I'd have a presentiment of it, she said. And I haven't. Yeah, but what about me? We'll see. Fourteen. In the hallway, Bridget opened a door, revealing plank stairs descending to a cellar. In Arizona, as in Nevada and California, and other places in the American West— most homes do not have basements, but are built on concrete slabs, a sensible practice in earthquake country and in states where land is plentiful. Exceptions include multi-million dollar estates that feature large home theaters and wine cellars and enormous garages for automobile collections where windows aren't wanted. The home we'd broken into wasn't one in which a billionaire oligarch would stash Ferraris in 12 different colors— she flicked a light switch, revealing drywall with water stains and fractal patterns of mold, riotous enough to command a million dollars from a collector of abstract expressionist paintings. On the second step, three cockroaches were engaged in what might have been a menage a trois. Startled by the light and embarrassed to be caught in their depraved conjugation, they scattered down the stairs, seeking dark crevices where they could hide in shame. It's down there. Bridget said. What is what we need? It's been a hard day. What I need is sleep. I'm not going to sleep down there. Descending the stairs, she said, The night is young, Quinn. It's not even nine o'clock yet. She left me in the wedge of pale light from the cellar, with a length of dark hallway to my left and another to my right, with the possibility of an attack dog not disproven. Fear of being thought cowardly by a beautiful woman is a major reason why men go to war, get in cage fights, wrestle alligators, and subject themselves to ballroom dancing lessons. I followed her down the stairs. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the six hundred. The stench in the cellar was unlike anything I had encountered before a melange of rotting flesh and sewage and spoiled milk and baby puke and maybe half a dozen toxic chemicals. My gorge rose four or five times, as if something that lived in my throat wanted out, and I had successfully swallowed it. 
My eyes watered and my nose burned, as it would have if I'd inhaled rubbing alcohol, and the thick air had a flavor so vile that I regretted having taste buds. Gagging like a cat trying to expel a hairball, I said, What the hell? Trash was stacked everywhere. Old wooden crates, splintered chairs, broken lamps, a couple of buckets with sprung handles, a bicycle without tires, cardboard boxes containing disordered heaps of beer bottles, several baby dolls with limbs missing, but I couldn't see anything organic that might be rotting. It's not a natural stink, Bridget said. They concoct it and saturate the space with it. I've encountered it before. Why would they do that? Scanning the room, she said, Well, so that no one will think there's anything of value here, so no one can bear to linger. Who? Who concocts it? This particular house? I don't know. Maybe MS-13. Whatever Central America gang uses this place. Those guys behead people for the fun of it. No, not mainly for enjoyment. It's to intimidate the public. She went to the largest stack of trash, which was against the back wall, and she began to move item after item aside. This is crazy, I said. They pile the trash highest in front of the thing they need to conceal. We gotta get out of here. I didn't expect anything like this. Now, Quinn, I prepared you. I told you about the reciprocating saw, how they'd urinate on you while you bled to death. I thought you were exaggerating. I don't exaggerate. We can't leave till we have what we came for. The stink isn't so bad if you breathe through your mouth. If I breathe through my mouth, I'll vomit. Then don't breathe through your mouth. Help me shift all this stuff out of the way. I was listening for the clicking claws of a running attack dog. I was listening for MS-13 thugs returning, like the three bears, to discover Goldilocks had violated their home. Therefore, I moved the trash with less noise than Bridget did, as she seemed convinced that no one would return any time soon. We uncovered a manhole-like cover, the bolted-down lid of a sump pump pit. I viewed this as a disappointment, but Bridget was pleased. It appears to be bolted in place, but it isn't. They always want to get at a stash quickly if need be. From among the items we'd moved out of the way, she retrieved a crowbar that had seemed like just more junk but that had in fact been left among the trash for exactly the purpose to which she put it. As she inserted the pry blade under the rim of the cast iron cover, I said, I can do that. So can I, she said cheerily, and quickly levered the heavy lid out of the hole and to one side. In the pit was a thick mass of white fabric, which she pulled out and put to one side. Fireproofing. The sump pump had been removed, and the pit expanded. The walls were of mortared fire brick. She directed the beam of the flashlight into the depository, revealing three duffel bags. After getting on my knees, I reached into the hole and withdrew one of the large canvas sacks. It was very heavy. Bridget zippered open the duffel and withdrew tight rolls of currency. Hundreds and twenties. At least three hundred thousand. Drug money, I said. Dirty money. So we steal it and do good with it. Your nuns would approve. I'm not so sure. Why is it here? So much money. Three bags? These gangs make hundreds of millions a year. Maybe they can use some banks in the third world, but they don't really trust any institution that would deal with them. Anyway, it's a cash business, and they need to stash a lot of it here, there, and everywhere. You know this how? Grandpa. One of the things he used to do was go after these creeps. That was back when men like him were allowed to enforce the law without interference from politicians on the dark side. You called this place a Nottingham. Why? Robin Hood operated out of Sherwood Forest, which was in the county of Nottingham. Stole from the rich to give to the poor. That's the modern version. He stole from corrupt government authorities in Nottingham. In the 12th century, there weren't banks as we know them, the county's rulers kept their spoils in secret rooms, hidden potato cellars, and the like. So a stash is a Nottingham. When you need money, psychic magnetism brings you to it. She grinned. Cool, huh? 
Now we can buy a car. Do you give some to the poor? You'll see. I thought of the coin I'd found in the kitchen of the long-abandoned restaurant. It was worth 40000 Chump change. She returned the rolls of currency to the bag and closed it. Carry this for me? You're leaving the other two? The creeps will return soon. We're running out of time. Alarmed, I said, why didn't you say so? I just did. She hurried up the stairs, and I followed close behind, out of the stench that lay like a heavy fog below. When we stepped into the ground floor hallway, the German shepherd attack dog growled and bared teeth that a vampire would have envied. Fifteen. Muscles tensed, tail held low, Head raised and thrust forward, ears laid back, eyes flaring yellow in the flashlight beam. The shepherd was not in the same business as Lassie. If Timmy fell down a well, this guy wouldn't give a damn. And if rescuers showed up to retrieve the boy, they had better be wearing Kevlar butt protectors. When the shepherd growled louder, Bridget said to him, Who got up on the wrong side of the dog bed today, hmm? We don't have time for your silliness, Mr. Tough Guy. She reached out a hand and the dog snapped at it, its teeth an inch from taking off a few fingertips. But she did not pull back. Smell my hand, pooch. Come on, get over yourself and smell who I am. If I don't smell friendlier than the idiots who trained you, then you can do your werewolf impression and go for my throat. Come on, smell, smell. The dog took two steps backward and cocked its head. He doesn't like it here, Bridget said. The shepherd worked the air with the many muscles in his nose. Depending on the breed, a canine sense of smell is between 10,000 times and 100,000 times greater than ours. A dog receives far more data through its nose than a human being receives through all five senses combined. He's left alone too much, Bridget said, and he's bored, even depressed sometimes. At the orphanage, we'd had a golden retriever named Raphael. We used to hide a frankfurter in some remote corner of the second floor of that large building, start Raphael at the ground floor, and say, Find the weenie. He would always locate the prize in less than three minutes, with a pack of kids chasing after him. His best time ever was one minute and twelve seconds. Bridget dropped to one knee and made a come-to-me gesture, which elicited another, even more fierce growl from the dog. Ooh, booga 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 right back at you. Such a big, scary fella. I told myself that when the German shepherd tore her up, I would stand by her through the long hospitalization and numerous surgeries, would always be at her bedside to reassure her that she would be put back together as good as new, and never once reveal by word or expression how much she resembled the Phantom of the Opera. He never gets any play or cuddles, she said. He's lonely. I'm not sure, but I think they call him Hitler. When she spoke the name, the dog's ears pricked up, and he stopped growling. That is so wrong, she told Hitler. You shouldn't have to live with such a horrible name. These are very stupid, mean people. And they're coming back soon, I reminded her. Stupid, mean, and violent. Yes, but we have a job to do here. What job? Rehabilitating Hitler. She reached out to the dog with both hands, making it easier for him to bite off all her fingers rather than just five of them. I'm going to call you Winston, after the magnificent Mr. Churchill, quite the opposite of nasty old Adolf. She repeated the come-to-me gesture with both hands this time. Do you like your new name, Winston? The dog relaxed, lying on the floor, head up, focused on her, but with a different attitude. He issued a soft, mewling sound that seemed to signify submission. She moved closer to him, still offering her hands. Winston licked her fingers. His tail swished back and forth, dusting the hardwood floor. Remembering what Sparky had told me, I said, You've had this ability since childhood? Scratching under the dog's chin and then behind his ears, she said, At first I wasn't as confident about it as I became, as I am now. Better turn off the basement light and close the door. I did as she suggested, and we were left with only the thin beam of the penlight. 
The tableau of kneeling woman and prone dog appeared to be rendered rather than real, a painterly scene of soft light and softer shadow, a fragment of an unseen and much larger allegorical canvas, every color and stroke and texture possessing profound meaning beyond my understanding. The radiant woman and the adoring dog were of one world, while in the darkness behind them I was of another. Bridget was transcendental, as was the shepherd that she rescued from wickedness and restored to innocence. But I knew that, whatever I might be, I was less than she. There was no envy in the recognition of this truth, no frustration, no sorrow. I was happy to be with her on this mysterious journey, happier than I'd ever been before, because I sensed that, although in her shadow... I was moving toward the light for which I'd been yearning all my life. As Bridget got to her feet, Winston rose with her. Referring to her relationship with animals, she said, The confidence came with the tiger, and then with the bear. What bear? I asked. A burst of loud male laughter suggested at least two inebriated companions approaching the front of the house. Back door, Bridget said, and Winston led the way. Carrying the duffel bag full of money... I hurried after them. In the kitchen, Bridget snatched up the square of blue tape that held together the broken pieces of glass. She switched off the pen light as she followed the dog onto the porch. The drunken laughter grew louder as the men entered the front of the house. I pulled the back door shut behind me, hoping they wouldn't notice the empty pane immediately on entering the kitchen. Light bloomed in windows as the three of us hurried alongside the house with jubilant Winston in the lead. I brought up the rear, a position so familiar to me that I could never believably claim to have a hawk-eyed American Indian scout among my ancestors. Less than a minute after leaving the house, we were rolling. Sparky behind the wheel of the Buick, Bridget up front, Winston in the back seat with me. The dog grinned and panted, tongue lolling. The duffel bag full of cash was on the floor, under my feet. Are they screamers? I asked. Who? Bridget wondered. MS-13, other drug gangs like them. Could be, but probably not, she said. Sparky said, There are plenty of real people who are eager to make a buck corrupting others with drugs. The wormheads don't bother with stuff like that. They seem to have a unique agenda. What agenda? We haven't quite figured it out yet, Bridget said. Sparky said, Who's the new member of the team? They call them Hitler. But I call him Winston. As if to confirm his awareness of the name change, Winston let out a howl that rose from bass to soprano. He's an attack dog, I said. Winston leaned against me and licked my neck. I said, he could kill with his breath. Those creeps haven't taken care of him, Bridget said. We'll take him to a veterinarian as soon as we can. Get him a bath, a teeth cleaning, make sure he has all his shots... We're on the run for our lives, I reminded her. That doesn't mean we won't bathe and brush our teeth, Quinn. So you're keeping him? She looked back at me and smiled. I'm keeping you, aren't I? 16. The motel rated only one star, but the rooms were as clean as they were threadbare. Three side-by-side -side units were available. It was the kind of place where you didn't need to present ID if you paid cash up front. In fact, the clerk at the front desk was so incurious that he would probably take your cash and give you a room key even if you showed up with bloody hands holding a dagger in your teeth. We gathered in the middle unit where Bridget would bunk. We emptied the duffel on the bed. The three of us sat there to count the money, while the newest fugitive among us consumed two cans of gourmet dog food that we had bought at a supermarket en route. Winston didn't seem to mind that he was eating out of a soft plastic bowl that was a cheap version of Tupperware, also purchased at the market. He kept looking up from his meal with what seemed to be an expression of astonishment, as if to say, If there's stuff this good, why the hell were they feeding me cheap kibble with eyeballs? When I'd counted 35,000 and Bridget had 40,000, she combined our piles of cash and placed them in another plastic container with a lid. Grandpa can finish the count. Let's you and me go find a car. It's ten past ten, I said. Who's selling a car at this time of night? We'll find out, dear.
Can it wait till morning? No, the Buick is already hot. We've got to dump it. You kids have fun, Sparky said. Winston leaped onto the bed, perhaps to assist with the tabulation. I said, you seem to have reformed Winston, but somewhere down inside, he's still the attack dog that was. Should you really leave your grandfather alone with him? Leading me out to the Buick, she said, Grandpa would never hurt him. Because the motel was fully booked, its sign had been turned off. In the infinite sea of darkness overhead, uncountable stars glowed like channel lights. With its dry climate, Tucson has limited cloud cover, enjoying more hours of sunshine than almost any other city in the country, and its night skies offer the spectacle of eternity. Bridget drove, because her psychic magnetism was more developed than mine, and because she was far more confident than I was that we could find someone who would sell us a car at that hour. Confidence, she said, improves the efficiency and accuracy of the magnetism. What were you confident of finding when you found the bomb factory instead? Don't be snarky, Quinn. No, I'm really curious. We cruised along a boulevard, turned onto a lesser street, segued into an alley while she said, Last year, we took a road trip to Austin. Grandpa had a friend from the old days he'd fallen out of touch with, Harry Peacemaker. Rumor was Harry moved to the Austin area, but we couldn't find a phone listing. So while Grandpa told me colorful stories about this Peacemaker guy, we let magnetism take over. It pulled us to this small industrial building with a sign that said, Peacemaker United. We went in through the main door. No one was in the public area. There was a call button, but it didn't work. Grandpa being Grandpa, he opened the gate in the counter and went looking for someone, and I followed him. We found this big room with maybe a hundred assault rifles and shotguns racked along one wall. In the center of the room were these tables where three guys were building bombs with bricks of C4 plastic explosives and cell phones for triggers. You'd think terrorists would have at least some sense of security, but no. Of course, the kind of people who are into such things are usually eight cards short of a full deck. So the peacemakers were bomb makers. A lot of people these days are the opposite of what they say they are, and a lot of them probably don't even realize it. They're opposed to racism, even as they act like racists. They're opposed to fascism, even as they act like fascists. The world's gone weird. On the other hand, if you blow someone up, they rest in peace thereafter, so then you would be sort of a peacemaker. What happened to the bomb factory? We had an altercation which evidently you didn't lose. We're always prepared for trouble. It's why we don't fly. We do road trips instead. You always go everywhere with guns? Well, only since I was 15 and Mr. Scuttler followed us home on parent-teacher night, clubbed Grandpa, and tried to rape me prior to killing us both. I felt increasingly that I, an orphan abandoned at birth, had been so sheltered that I needed to apologize for having had such a cushy life to date. Who was Mr. Scuttler? My English teacher. After that, I was homeschooled. Good idea. What happened to Mr. Scuttler? I held him off with a battery-powered carving knife until Grandpa pounded him silly with the debate club gavel. Gavel? You know, a wooden mallet like a judge needs in a courtroom. Mr. Scuttler was advisor to the student debate club. He'd brought the gavel as a weapon. You said Sparky had been clubbed. Uh, yes, with the gavel. This may sound odd, but it's extremely difficult to knock Grandpa out. And even if he's unconscious, he refuses to stay that way for long. I don't find that at all odd, I assured her. Here we are, she declared as she pulled to the curb and parked. The neighborhood was either zoned for mixed use or, having once been residential, was later rezoned for commercial enterprises. The result was a hodgepodge of older single-story homes scattered among fast food outlets, used car lots, and small strip malls with six or eight stores each. Bridget had parked in front of a property consisting of two structures, an unusually sizable two-story bungalow featuring a widely bracketed gable roof with multi-windowed dormers and a deep front porch supported by stone columns. And next to it, 
a massive Quonset hut with a large roll-up door, above which a sign announced Butch Hammer's American Auto Repair. Between the buildings stood a tall flagpole with an uplight that shone on an American flag that stirred with silent sinuosity in the soft breeze. On the black top in front of the repair garage stood an older model Ford Explorer, and the front window was a for sale sign. It was 10.33, 23 minutes after we had set out on our quest. I have a good feeling about this, Bridget said. Well, I had to admit, so far it doesn't appear to be a bomb factory. We got out of the Buick, carrying the plastic container that was packed full of cash. Bridget headed not toward the repair garage, but toward the residence with such brisk intention that she was obviously guided by psychic magnetism. I began to feel it as well. Thin draperies were closed over the downstairs windows. Soft light passed through them and shone brighter along the edges. The porch light revealed that the house was painted a pale blue with white trim. It appeared to be meticulously maintained. Above the door, a transom window of red, gold, and blue stained glass invoked divine protection with the words, God bless our home. By now it was clear that the rain kings had little patience for negative thinking. Because I devotedly wished to accept and see to fulfillment the proposal of marriage to Bridget that I received from her grandfather, I refrained from expressing the thought that the residents of this house were unlikely to cooperate in the kind of shady deal she had in mind. With a budget of 75000 to purchase a vehicle worth a fraction of that, she clearly wanted an off-market sale for which no papers would be filed with either the tax authorities or the Department of Motor Vehicles. People who sought God's protection of their home might expect that, in return for granting it, the big guy would be aware if criminal activity occurred within those walls, whereupon he would be rightly expected to revoke what they had invoked, and set upon them plagues of frogs and locusts, the divine equivalent of an eviction notice. However, with the hope of wedding bliss and a life of sanctified hanky-panky, I kept my mouth shut. Leave the talking to me. Bridget said as she pressed the doorbell button. Yeah, absolutely, I agreed. The guy who answered the bell filled the open doorway from jam to jam and threshold to lintel. He must have been six feet five, at least 260 or 70 pounds, with the broad chest of a grizzly bear, the shoulders of an ox, and a neck thicker than the neck of any creature that nature had otherwise ever produced. He was about 50, with a shaved head, eyes as fiercely blue as a natural gas explosion, and a thick salt-and-pepper mustache. His arms were so powerful that they would have made a young Arnold Schwarzenegger tremble with respect, his hands so big that he might have been able to strangle me with just a thumb and forefinger. He wore black engineer boots, blue jeans, and a black T-shirt emblazoned with a single word in white block letters. Don't. Bridget said, Mr. Butch Hammer, I presume? His teeth were as white and even as piano keys when he smiled and said, Yes, ma'am. And to whom might I be speaking on this fine May evening? I expected her to invent new identities for us, but she said, I'm Bridget Rain King. This is Quinn Quicksilver, an orphan who never knew the parents who saddled him with that name. Quinn is my fiancé, although there isn't a ring yet. We're interested in the Ford Explorer you want to sell, but we have an unconventional offer to make. He regarded her, smiling and nodding. Then he looked at me and seemed to decide that, if it became necessary, he could tear my head off without straining himself. Come on in, and let's bargain. 17. The living room was anchored by a contemporary Persian carpet with an intricate pattern in jewel tones. The simple but elegant craftsman-style furniture of dark wood was like what would have graced a house designed by a green and green a century earlier. The upholstery in frosted blue and dark gold fabrics. Three stained glass lamps were aglow, two in a wisteria motif, the third depicting roses and ribbons. Reprints of Maxfield Parrish paintings added the artist's magic to the room. And on the wall behind the sofa hung a gallery of photographs, twelve in all, two portraits each of three young men and three young women. 
I had expected Lazy Boys, posters of heavy metal bands, and a Harley Davidson presented like a work of art. I realized now that Butch Hammer's arms weren't sleeved with tattoos, which should have prepared me for something else entirely. As he led us from the foyer into the living room, he called out, Mother! We have guests! The woman who appeared through a hallway door was an attractive brunette, too young to be his mother, perhaps just old enough to be his wife. She wore white sneakers, pale green jeans, and a white blouse with the tail out and the sleeves rolled up. At about five feet eight, she was statuesque, but beside her husband, she looked petite. Butch introduced her as Cressida, and she told us to call her Cressy. She asked if we wanted coffee or anything, and Bridget said that wasn't necessary, and Cressy said it was no trouble at all, and Butch said negotiations were always more pleasant when there was good coffee. So he went to the kitchen with his wife to help her provide refreshments. Bridget and I sat on the sofa. She put the container of cash between us. I said, I always wondered what Thor's home might look like. Now you know. Why did you use our real names? He would have known if I didn't, and he wouldn't have bothered further with us. How would he have known you were lying? Because of who he is? What he is? What do you mean? What is he? I don't know. He's not one of us, and he's not a screamer, but he's something. Something? Yes. There's a secret war they never cover on the news. You and I and Grandpa and probably a lot of other people are on one side of it, and the Wormheads are on the other side. And then there are people you meet, like Butch and Cressy, who seem to suspect the truth of the world but have no proof of it. They're righteous. They're persuadable, and they'll help you when you need it, if you respect them, if they know you're telling the truth. Okay, but how do they know when you're telling the truth? They just do. They probably don't know how they know. It's their gift. I thought about that for a few seconds. Then I said, that T-shirt he's wearing? What do you think it means? Just what it says. I was silent a few seconds longer. Then I said, What's the likelihood they'll put knockout drops in our coffee and we'll wake up in chains and be sold on the black market and have our organs harvested for illegal transplants? She said, Almost zero. How can you be sure? Because of who I am. That was all very circuitous. She said nothing, smiled, and patted my knee reassuringly. I wish you'd said zero instead of almost zero. It's a fallen world, dear. No one's perfect. Quicker than seemed humanly possible, bringing with them the delicious aroma of a fresh-brewed Jamaican blend, Butch and Cressy Hammer returned with a wheeled cart holding a coffee service. There were also a few liquors to enhance the brew, if any was wanted, and an assortment of tiny, homemade, two-bite cakes and a variety of little cookies— Bridget and I took some Bailey's Irish cream in our coffee, which was delicious, as were the miniature cakes and cookies. When our host and hostess were in armchairs, facing the sofa, Cressy said, Butch tells me you're engaged. Just today, Bridget said. We sort of fell into it in the loveliest way. I haven't bought a ring yet, I said. There hasn't been time. We've been so busy. But I know how to do it. I mean, I know where to buy one. A ring. Butch and Cressy stared at me with something like pity. She said, Relax and just give yourself to a child. No need to be tense. A good marriage is like a sound ship that will carry you through all the storms of this world. You're a lucky young man, Butch said. I was a lucky young man once. He smiled at his wife. And my luck has grown into a great fortune. Cressy blew a kiss to her husband. You're still a young man, Mr. Hammer. To me, she said, what line of work are you in? I'm a staff writer for Arizona Magazine. We've thought of subscribing, she said. Butch said, frankly, we're put off by the exclamation point. I understand, I said. It gives the impression that we're some kind of Chamber of Commerce hard sell, but we're not. Before she could be asked about her career, Bridget said, Cressy, however do you get so much flavor into such tiny cakes? We talked a little about baking, 
about the beautiful stained glass lamps that Butch and Cressy crafted together as a second business, and we talked about the photos behind the sofa, which were high school and college graduation portraits of their six children, among whom were a doctor, a dentist, an Air Force fighter pilot, a Navy SEAL, and an investment analyst with a hedge fund. One daughter was currently earning an advanced degree in molecular biology. Even though I had psychic magnetism and could see monsters and was not yet twenty, I felt like the king of the slackers. Finally, Butch said, So the explorer. I completely rebuilt that baby. She's in tip-top condition. You'll want to inspect her. Bridget eased forward on the sofa. Having gotten to know you, we'll take your word for it. We have an unconventional offer. So you said earlier. I'm intrigued. We have an old Buick to trade. We don't want anything for it. I like the deal so far, Butch said. We want you to dismantle it for parts or take it to a salvage yard and have it squashed into a cube so no one will ever find it. So whoever's looking for it, Cressy said, will continue to look for it. Yes, ma'am. Now I'm worried for you, child. No need to be, Cressy. We've got our act together. Famous last words, Butch said. But go on. Placing the plastic container on the coffee table, Bridget said, Seventy-five thousand dollars. Judging by his bland expression, Butch was accustomed to people insisting on greatly overpaying for things. He put aside his coffee, the mug like a demitasse cup in his big hands. The explorer's worth a small fraction of seventy-five thousand. We're paying extra because we don't want you to report the profits to the IRS or register the sale at the DMV. To her husband, Cressy said, They don't want their names in the vehicle linked. I've got the picture, love, he assured her. Bridget said, The money isn't hot. The serial numbers aren't sequential, nothing like that. She opened the container and dumped the rubber-banded wads of bills on the coffee table. Butch Hammer slid forward propped his right elbow on the arm of his chair, rested his chin on his fist, and made eye contact with Bridget for at least a minute, as if her irises were disks of data that he could read. At last he said, Where did you get the money? She continued to meet his stare. We stole it, but not from anyone who rightfully earned it. We stole it from a drug gang. They don't yet know it was taken, and when they find it missing, they won't know who took it. So you say... Yes, I do. Neither of them looked away from the other. So are you and Quinn drug dealers? No, Bridget said. We hate their kind. If you think I could be one, take a good look at Quinn. Him, not in a million years. I already have his number. You're harder to figure. I'm telling the truth. Oh, I know that. But you're still hard to figure. She's a bit like me. Cressy told her husband. She winked at Bridget. I was something of a firecracker, too, when I was your age. Butch Hammer got up from his chair and stood for a moment to look at the photos of his children. Then he went to a window and pulled aside a panel of the draperies and studied the night as if perhaps the place was being surveilled. Is there a GPS in the Explorer? Bridget asked. Butch let the drapery fall into place and turned and shook his head. No and I bought her from a salvage yard after she was in an accident. She was delisted by the DMV. I haven't re-registered her yet. Perfect. Then you can carry it on your books as if you never restored it. Only used it for parts. Butch paced the room for a minute, pausing to gaze forlornly at one object or another, as if he might be leaving and never coming back. He seemed too big for his own house. He returned to his armchair, but no longer looked comfortable in it, who are you running from, Bridget? The ISA. You know who that is? His expression of disgust was answer enough. Cressy said, The Gestapo light. Whoever thought anything like them would take root in America. Her husband's gas flame blue eyes seemed like windows to a fire in his head. Why are they after you? He focused on me. Something you wrote in that exclamation point magazine? Bridget looked at me. And I shrugged. She said, No, sir. Nothing Quinn wrote. He and I sent away to gettingtoknowme.com, hoping to learn about our ancestry. 
The company alerted the ISA to something unusual in our DNA. Butch Hammer thumped a giant fist three times against his massive thigh. People used to take that Orwell book, 1984, to be a warning. Now they see it as inspiration. Your ancestry is your business, not the ISA's. After a silence, Bridget said, Do we have a deal? Getting up from her chair to take a cookie from the tray on the coffee table, Cressy said, What about license plates, sweetie? We'll use the one on the Buick. It's from a Porsche. Tomorrow we'll swap plates with some other vehicle. We can keep doing that every few days before any set we're using is reported stolen. Even considering the risk factor, 75000 is too much, Butch said. On the run like you are, you need all the money you can get. Let's split it at thirty-seven five. Indicating the photographs of the Hammer kids, Bridget said, All that education must have cost a fortune. They all got scholarships, Cressy said. But there were a slew of other bills. And one of them still in school, Bridget said. We can get money any time we need it. Dirty money that we'll make clean. Hard times might be coming for this country. Very hard. Take the 75. It's our final offer. Reluctantly, the Hammers accepted it. When we said goodbye to Cressy and stepped outside with Butch Hammer, he said, Time was that Tucson seemed far away from all the capitals of crazy in this world, but maybe nowhere's far away anymore. He drove the Explorer into the Quonset hut, and we brought the Buick in after him. Out of sight of the street, we transferred the license plate to the Ford. The enormous garage had a hydraulic lift and a full array of other equipment. It appeared to be almost as ordered and clean as the house next door. When we were ready to roll, the big man said, One more thing. When I rebuilt this girl, I filed the numbers off her engine block and then torched away the ghost of them. She can never be traced back to me, so don't worry about that, Bridget said. We're not the first like us who've found their way to you, are we? Been a few, he acknowledged. Do you see things, strange things that other folks can't? We do, I said. Bridget asked him. Do you? No. I think I'm glad I don't. How did you find me? We're drawn to what we need, she said. I added, we call it psychic magnetism. Question for question, Bridget suggested. Butch nodded. She said, People can't lie to you, can they? A lot of them try, but I always see the truth behind the lie. Cressida, too. It's scary how much lying there is. What's all this about that you're caught up in? We're all caught up in it, she said. You as much as we are. We're on a quest, I said. We're not on anything as easy as a quest, Bridget disagreed. That's an issue we're still debating, I told Butch. Bridget said, we're trying to figure it out. We'll let you know if we ever do. Butch said, others before you, they were trying to figure it out too. All anyone agrees about is that something bad is coming. Something always is, she said. He frowned. This time it's going to be a bigger bad than maybe we've ever seen before. Be careful out there. Godspeed. When Butch and I shook hands, mine disappeared up to the wrist. Bridget stood on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. Just then Cressy arrived with a colorful Christmas-themed tin full of tiny cakes and cookies. It's always Christmas here, she said, and it occurred to me that with a full beard, Butch Hammer would make an impressive Santa Claus though he might scare the pee out of some little kids. Share them with whoever, Cressy said. There's nothing so bad in life that a good little cake can't make it better. 18. When we returned to the motel shortly before midnight, Sparky Rain King was waiting for us in his granddaughter's room, watching a cable program on TV. They seem to be reporting news from another planet. "'Cause they sure aren't talking about the Earth I know.' Neither the cable channel nor a local station had carried any mention of the shooting at the truck stop. These days, any incident involving a mere two killings failed to be violent enough to qualify as news. Sparky had finished counting the money. 
In addition to the 75,000 that we'd left with Butch Hammer, the duffel bag had contained another 190,000, mostly in hundreds, but some in twenties. After I counted the last, I washed my hands for ten minutes. Still don't feel entirely clean, considering the moral degenerates who handled those bills. Then I got in the shower with Winston and used some shampoo on him. He smells like lemons. We don't need to have him groomed in the morning, though we should get his teeth cleaned before too long. We told him about the Ford Explorer as he sampled the baked goods in the Christmas tin. After he interrupted us twice to say that he would marry the woman who made those treats if she ever became available, we finished our account of the events at Butch Hammer's American Auto Repair. Then we agreed to hit the road by eight o'clock in the morning and said good night. Sparky retired to his room and I to mine, and Winston wisely remained with Bridget. I don't know what condition Sparky was in, but after a long day on the run, I felt as though my muscles were sliding off my bones and my joints were coming unhinged. I took a shower as hot as I could tolerate, toweled off, slipped into pajamas, got into bed, and could not sleep. The quiet abraded my nerves. I knew that no monster stalked me in the dark, and yet the very silence seemed to be evidence of its stealthiness. Minute by minute, I grew increasingly, irrationally convinced that something nearby, coiled to strike, was listening to me as I listened for it. I turned on a cable channel and lay watching infomercials for spurtles and copper-infused underwear and diarrhea remedies. This will sound weird, but I suppose no more so than everything that I have written to this point. I didn't know myself anymore, and I found the new me a little scary. During the course of the day, I'd become a stranger to myself a different person from the guy who had gotten out of bed to go to work at Arizona Magazine the previous morning. The path to the future that I long envisioned had withered away into the wild woods of recent experience, and I was unable to imagine where this new path might lead. I had killed two federal agents with a car, albeit in self-defense. I was on the run. I was engaged to be married. Sort of. I could see monsters. The world had not changed, however, my understanding of it had undergone a most radical revision, which in turn revised me. I was unsettled by the thought that I was destined to become a warrior. I didn't see myself as a warrior. I didn't want to be a warrior. I just wanted to avoid diarrhea, enjoy the health benefits of copper-infused underwear, and have my own little kitchen with a collection of spurtles. However, the mysterious forces at work in my life might give me no choice in the matter. I might have to become a warrior or die. Of course, if I became a warrior, I would almost surely die, because the role did not suit me. On the other hand, whatever enigmatical power that had first taken control of me on the day I'd found the coin seemed to be benign. It manipulated me, yes, but first to prepare me to escape web-spinning spiders from the ISA, and then to send me literally crashing into the life of my stunning and amusing future bride. If I had changed, maybe I needed to change, to adapt to the truth of the world in order to survive. And if I was in some strange power's employ, maybe that employment would be more satisfying than writing about rotting buildings at a ghost crossroads of abandoned highways, even as thrilling as that might be. Maybe I needed to live by the old saying popular with Californians, go with the flow, though that's exactly what happens to a dead goldfish when you flush it down a toilet. I left the TV on as a nightlight, the volume low, and at last fell asleep during an infomercial for a law firm that was eager to get me the financial settlement I deserved if only I would fall down a long flight of stairs in a commercial enterprise or... Be so lucky as to find my car rear-ended and simultaneously T-boned by a pair of 18-wheelers driven by the reckless employees of a heartless trucking company. I don't remember dreaming, and I had no nightmares. In the morning, however, there would be a moment of terror. At 7.12 a.m., I woke to an infomercial about copper-infused face masks for those who either wanted to be prepared for the next pandemic 
or had taken a fancy to this stylish head accessory that had been made popular in the previous crisis. This was not yet the aforementioned terror. Having showered before going to bed, I had only unmentionable bathroom tasks to attend to. As was my habit, I took a book with me. In Phoenix, days earlier, when I had been compelled to pack a suitcase to flee, I knew not what. I included a memoir by a famous actor. The word love was in the title, but judging by the first chapter, the book seemed to be about all the many people whom he hated, and why he hated them with such seething passion. Welcome to Utopia. After setting the book on the vanity beside the sink, I washed my hands and shaved with my cordless razor. As I studied my face, vigilantly seeking any missed stubble, my peripheral vision alerted me to the fact that the actor's memoir did not appear in the mirror. It remained on the counter, but in the reflection, the counter was without a book. My disquiet was related more to perplexity than to fear. I put my hand on the tome, not because I doubted its existence, but as if to rectify the curious difference between reality and the image in the looking glass. With my hand on that memoir, I regarded the mirror again and found that the book I could feel was still absent from the image. As I stared in disbelief, both I and the motel bathroom around me faded out of the reflection. The mirror became a window into a shadowy subterranean passage only partly revealed by eerie light pulsing from rooms along either side. What followed seemed like a blend of the real and metaphorical, as if I was drawn into some revelation so complex and profound that the truth of it could not be conveyed by ordinary images and not by words at all. Only by resort to visual symbolism of the most extreme and urgent kind, which would speak to my subconscious and provide it with answers that it might understand not now, but in the weeks and months to come. The mirror that had become a window now morphed into a door. I was drawn across that threshold without taking a step, as if I were weightless. I doubt that I went anywhere physically. The sensation of movement was illusory. My viewpoint became that of a video camera mounted on a drone as I plunged through a labyrinth of tunnels wide and narrow, through the warren of chambers they served, through vast caverns and across dark lakes that I knew to be pools of time. The structure changed continuously, a surreal architecture in which every horror ever imagined might lurk in anticipation of being fed what it most relished. Walls of raw earth molded themselves into mortared stone. Stone became steel. The steel became organic, a fleshy construct pulsing with menace. Flesh became magma, molten and fluid. Magma hardened into walls of bones compacted with shattered skulls, a crawl with pale glistening forms that I'd never seen before, which might have been worms or insects or something else unthinkable. There were rooms in which men and women... Evidently dead, hung from the walls, or else reposted on catafalques. Spectral light emanating from their open mouths and breathless nostrils and sunken eyes. In half-lit chambers, people writhed in the grip of grotesque men and women with large, misshapen heads, ghouls that were devouring them much as was depicted in the painting by Goya, Saturn devouring his children. In bleak passageways, crowds of naked people surged in terror panicked by some menace behind them, or called by something far ahead. Sometimes they hurried alongside racing trains of cattle cars, from the slatted sides of which the people within reached out in desperation. In tunnels as smooth as polished wine-dark glass, people flowed by the hundreds, tumbling slowly, as if they were beyond the gravity of earth. All this occurred in silence, but for the tympanic thunder of my heart as if I must be in an airless void incapable of conducting sound. A last tunnel abruptly turned upward. I soared at a terrible velocity, as though ascending a long missile silo in the grip of existential dread. When I erupted out of the earth, I was in a city afire from its center outward to every burrow, under a low sky that reflected the flames as if even heaven were ablaze. Sudden sound burst through streets iced with broken glass. Screams of terror, howls of wordless rage, curses, pleas, 
Lunatic laughter, rattling gunfire, explosions, sirens, horns blaring, vehicles racing from nowhere to nowhere. A celebration of nihilism in the name of justice that is really vengeance. Everywhere, outrages were committed without fear of consequences. Savage gang rapes, beatings with clubs and tire irons and chains, vicious murders and a war of all against all, the crowds driven by lust and bloodlust, by lust for power and lust for money, and by the lust that is known as envy. A shrieking horse galloped past me, pulling a burning carriage. A sobbing woman ran with a bloody baby in her arms. A boy of five or six wandered shell-shocked toward one mortal fate or another as civilization collapsed in a sea of fire. And throughout the chaos moved those creatures that Bridget called the Screamers, scanning the carnage with what eyes they might have. Their slithery, tentacular fingers writhed as if they could feel the misery in the cries of their enemies. Their maws worked as if they were greedily drinking the pain of the dying, themselves without a wound, as though they operated under some royal imprimatur that made them untouchable. Barefoot, in pajamas, I staggered backward into the bathroom wall, the actor's memoir in my left hand. The mirror became only a mirror again, and the cacophony of madness and anguish gave way to the quiet of the morning in Tucson. In the bedroom, I sat in the armchair and bent forward with my head in my hands. I breathed deeply, waiting for my heart to quiet. Whatever else the vision might have been, it was an orientation film aimed at the new recruit, me, as well as a call to duty and an urgent warning that the secret war could soon erupt into conflict on a greater scale, perhaps evolving into Armageddon. My sense was that if I didn't answer the call to battle, the war would come to me anyway. This was a matter of destiny. If I gave destiny the finger and walked away, that wouldn't be the end of it. What would have happened would still happen. The malevolent beings that I'd had a chance to stand up against would crush me without resistance. That was how fate worked. It wasn't pretty. I had no desire to pull the sword Excalibur from the stone, but if I didn't, the stone and the sword would roll downhill and flatten me. To prepare for what might lie ahead, I needed to learn more about how I had ended up in a bassinet on a lonely highway. I got up from the chair and dropped the actor's memoir in the trash can. As I shed my pajamas and dressed for the drive to Pepto, an infomercial on TV offered a revolutionary non-stick frying pan. The ad guy proved the pan's effectiveness by making a cheese omelet in it, then by melting caramel and chocolate in it, and then by cooking a mixture of glue and shredded plastic. All three delicious treats slipped out of the pan without leaving the tiniest bit of sticky residue, though no advice was provided as to whether red or white wine was the best complement to a glue and plastic entree. I love this country. This is the greatest country in the world, as long as it will be allowed to last. When I stepped outside, Sparky and Bridget were waiting by the Ford Explorer. Winston was in the back seat, his head out the side window, looking nothing whatsoever like a drug gang attack dog having been reformed by my moon goddess. Sparky and I asked each other how we'd slept, like a stone in my case, like a baby in his case, both of us lying. Bridget said nothing at first, watching me intently as I loaded my suitcase along with their luggage and closed the tailgate. Then, as her grandfather went around to the driver's door, she said quietly, Bad dream? No, I just didn't like what I saw in the mirror this morning. You too, huh? Surprised, assuming that she had the same experience, I said, What was that? Orientation. To let us know what our enemies want. The world is the screamers and their acolytes will make it if given a chance. Acolytes? We have people like Butch and Cressida Hammer and Grandpa. On the other side are fools who think a world of pure materialism will be a utopia. The Screamers will give them the world they want, a world of absolute indulgence, and rule it. Too late, they'll realize their utopia is in fact an empire of suffering and death. Sparky started the explorer. What you saw, you're hiding it from your grandfather? Sparing him from it, 
she corrected. Why? He's not a delicate flower. She put her arms around me and held me very tight, and I held her, and she was silent for a moment before she said, As I endured that, whatever that was this morning, I had a presentiment, a strong one. Not all of us are going to survive what lies ahead. I had read novels in which the author wrote that a character's heart had sunk at the receipt of one bit of bad news or another, and I had often paused to ask, with snark, where the heart had ended its descent. In the stomach? In the colon? Now I felt my heart sink into a slough of foreboding, and the sensation was so disturbing that I was beyond snark. We all arrive in this world with a ticket out of it, but somehow, in spite of all evidence to the contrary, we remain convinced that those we care about will be with us for a long ride. You mean Sparky won't make it? I don't know. Maybe him, or me, or you. Maybe all of us won't make it. All I know is, at least one of us won't. If he knows, he'll take even greater risks for my sake. I don't want him doing that. What happens will happen. She let go of me, stepped back. That's the only way it can be. Understand? Yes. Unless... Unless we don't play the game. Her eyes were clover green and Celtic fierce. That's not you. You're better than that. I hesitated, and then said, If you say so. I say so, and you know so. She got in the front of the Explorer with her grandfather and pulled the door shut. Winston politely made room for me in the back seat. He licked my cheek. I didn't return the lick. I just wasn't in the mood. Back in the day. The boy, the father, the birds. So Corbett Ormond frequently beats his wife, murders her and ten others, and a few years later shoots and kills his own twelve-year-old son, Lytton, my roommate and best friend. How can a just world be shapen to allow such outrages? Why aren't we designed to be unable to harm one another? Why aren't our brains wired so that we can't kill or rape or steal or lie or deceive? Why are we formed with the capacity to hate and envy? They say that this world and life in it are a gift. But how can it be a gift when it so often subjects us to fear or even terror and to unbearable sadness? At eleven, rocked by grief, having lost the ability to find happiness, I dwelt obsessively on those questions, arriving at no answers, eating too little, sleeping more of the day than not. Sister Teresa, psychologist and counselor, sought to relieve my unrelenting depression by teaching me about ants. Although it was odd to have a therapist who was a dead ringer for Aretha Franklin, I learned a lot about several varieties of the family formicity, but nothing I learned cured my despair, for I was a stubborn patient. Having brought a large glass-walled ant colony into her office for our study, Sister Teresa said, If ants didn't enlighten you, then bees probably won't. I stood at her office window, staring out at the heavy rain that fell in gray plumb-bob lines through the windless day, foaming like corrosive acid on the black street and gray concrete sidewalks. Anyway, Sister Teresa continued, I'm certainly not going to bring a hive into my office. Why do bees have to sting? I asked. To defend themselves and protect their colonies. But we're not going to spend any time on bees. Why do animals bite? Why does everything kill everything? Not every animal kills. Rabbits don't kill. Unless you think that grass and flowers and carrots and berries can be murdered. If you do, then we should at once start putting rabbits on trial and sending them to bunny prisons. Don't be silly. I will if I wish to be, she said, leaning back in her creaky office chair. I rather like being silly on occasion. However, in the interest of accuracy, I should report that even rabbits can be violent with one another. They use their powerful hind legs to kick when they're contesting for mates, and they'll even bite one another now and then if they disagree. 
As I watched the rain, I thought of the flood that was said to have scrubbed the sinful world clean of everything except Noah's family and the animals on his ark. When the flood receded, however, they all got off the ark and started killing again. I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to kill anything. Then don't, Sister Teresa said. I didn't care to believe it was so easy. She always had a quick answer I couldn't dispute, which began to irritate me. Yeah, well, I could get mad, lose control. Lots of people are always angry. Quinn, dear, you'll have moments when you're mean and you hurt people's feelings, just as they'll hurt yours. You'll do stupid things, maybe even something cruel now and then. But you'll never murder anyone. What if there's a war and I get sent? Defending your family or your country in a war, you might have to kill. But killing in defense of your own life or the lives of innocent people isn't murder. I wished that the rain would fall harder, harder than it had ever fallen before, until the streets were rivers and the cars were swept away. I wanted to see the people on the sidewalks in their raincoats and carrying umbrellas trying to get into the safety of the buildings but finding the doors all locked so they would know that they too would be swept away, so they could feel what Lytton must have felt when he looked in the muzzle of his hateful father's pistol. None of that made sense in my despair, but I was eleven. An age often short of reason, I said to Sister Teresa, I could go to war with you right now. Come over there and punch you in the nose. You could do that, she agreed, and I could choose to punch you back. It wouldn't be a wise move on your part since I am much bigger than you. You're a nun. You aren't allowed to punch anyone. I'm a nun, but I'm also human. We humans make mistakes. Am I likely to punch back? Probably not. No guarantee. So, Quinn, you make your choice and you take your chances. Take a swing at me if you really think it'll make you feel better. The rain fell harder, as if granting my wish and the world beyond the window appeared to begin flooding, melting. Suddenly I was crying. I had wept alone in my room, but now it was happening right out in the open. I kept my back to her, tried not to make a sound, just let the tears flow until there were no more. If she came to me and tried to console me, I would punch her as hard as I could because I didn't want to be comforted, not with Lytton dead. After a silence broken only by the susurration of the rain and the creaking of her chair as she shifted in it, she said, Nature is a place of constant competition between individuals in a species and between one species and another. In this broken world, animals aren't able to rise above violence, but people have the ability to forsake it. People should. People must. But that is our work, Quinn. Not nature's and not God's. But why? I said when I could at last speak. Perhaps the birds will teach you what the ants couldn't. We will study birds together. So the subject became birds. Sister Teresa provided DVD documentaries and books. We sat in the park and watched the crows, the doves, the sparrows. She took me to a university to spend two hours with an ornithologist in his research aviary, where there were more birds of different kinds than I had ever seen before, although only a tiny fraction of the more than a thousand species that exist worldwide. We studied their feathers. A simple sparrow has 34 different kinds of feathers. Every member of a species is feathered exactly the same as every other member. We studied different ways that species build their nests. Every individual within a single species builds in the very same manner. They raise their offspring by precisely the same rules and with entirely predictable results. We studied species that fly in formation. We studied species that don't fly in formation, but that, in a flock of hundreds, will change direction in the same instant. We studied what they feed on and how they find food. Every member of a species sustains itself with the same food and seeks it in the same manner as the other of its kind. I was repulsed by the fact that owls sometimes eat smaller birds, as do some raptors like hawks and falcons. I called them cannibals. 
Nothing I learned seemed to explain what any of these things had to do with human violence or with why it was allowed in a world that had supposedly started out as a paradise named Eden. As with the ants, Sister Teresa would not tell me what lesson I was supposed to learn. You have to realize the truth on your own. Believe it. Accept it. Or otherwise, it is just something you've been told that you don't trust to be true. Next, we'll study fish. Part 3. What the Seer Saw 19. I had not returned to Pepto since being sent to Phoenix in the first week of my life, because I'd been too busy being an orphan and then earning a living in the cutthroat world of regional magazines. Months before I met the Rain Kings, however, I'd researched Pepto without going there, prepping a file to justify eventually visiting the town for a few days on the dime of Arizona Magazine. I hoped to write a story about being abandoned on my third day of life, and perhaps learn something, however little, about my origins. From Tucson, the way to Pepto was via I-10 East, then by an undivided federal highway, then along another undivided highway, across Saguaro Flats, across playas dry and cracked at that time of year, between mountains as stark as rough-forged iron, through lands where blood had been spilled in tribal wars, of which history made little note, where through at least a thousand years many slaves were kept and suffered, their grim ordeal and existence now long forgotten or at least left unremarked in the interest of addressing more recent outrages. The only way to Pepto was through human history and all its striving and conniving, mercy and meanness, nobility and ignobility, despair and hope. The town was not a town, not officially, but one of those odd settlements that form like rust on iron, less by intention than by some process of nature that no one has yet been granted government funds to study. Those who made it their home were for the most part people who found crowded cities unnatural, and any large government or wellian, but were likewise averse to the intimacy of small towns and the officious nature of village councils. The citizens of Pepto and places like it wanted to have neighbors, though at a respectful distance, which meant cheap land. They wanted a sense of community, but mostly they wanted to live their lives with as few annoyances as possible, beyond the easy reach of thought police and sanctioned conmen of all kinds. To simplify their lives, they needed a one-stop business that sold them everything from gasoline to groceries to basic tools. In Pepto, that retailer was Ching Station, a U-shaped, single-story structure at the crossroads of a two-lane federal highway and an unpaved gravel road with small windows and thick slump stone walls to ward off summer heat, no landscaping but cacti, and a windmill to pump water. Ching Station served not only Pepto but also other similar communities in the area. After arriving at 11.05 a.m., we cruised at random while Sparky waited for Bridget and me to employ psychic magnetism to locate one of the three men who long ago saved me from being bitten by a series of rattlesnakes and squashed by a huge truck while being devoured by a coyote. Hakeem Kaspar, Bailey Belshazzar, and Caesar Melchizedek. However, the gift wasn't ours to use at will. Maybe the mysterious benefactor who chose us for service in this cause believed that an element of unreliability was essential to temper any tendency in us to become besotted with our power and as arrogant as the fascist superheroes that have long populated Hollywood blockbusters. By 11.15, when we failed to feel any compulsion other than a slow-building need for a public lavatory, we returned to Ching Station which we had passed three times in our fruitless seeking. Now and then, Bridget revealed, I think my ability to see through the screamer's masquerades also isn't 100% reliable. I have the disturbing feeling some of them are better shielded, better disguised, and I'm unaware of them. Good to know, I said. I've been concerned that I'm not half as paranoid as I ought to be, but... You just solved that problem. 
Among the numerous products and services advertised on the extravagant signage mounted on the roof of Ching Station was the promise of clean restrooms. Only one other vehicle stood in front of the Enterprise, a faded blue pickup truck with a rifle in a rack and a bumper sticker that announced, I shoot tailgaters. The station was open 18 hours a day, and the lifestyle in this hot territory was laid back. There was no such thing as a rush hour with lines for anything. While Sparky stretched his legs and Bridget poured bottled water into a bowl for Winston, I went inside to request lavatory keys and to learn how to obtain gasoline from the antique pumps. A 57-year-old man, 5 feet 9, with brown hair and brown eyes, born on Christmas Day, was replenishing a depleted rack of candy bars near the first of two checkout stations. He had one of those friendly faces into which was also built evidence of a keen sense of humor and irony, the kind of face that would be a treasure to any stand-up comic who was graced with one. I recognized him from the photograph in the official state files of retailers who had been granted licenses to sell alcoholic beverages, which I'd perused in my aforementioned researches. John Kennedy Ching, I said, although I'd had no intention of speaking his name out loud. Seeing him in the flesh after learning about him and his family was, for me at least, a little like coming face to face with a celebrity. Holding a payday bar in each hand, he smiled. I have been known to answer to that name. And you? Me? Oh, I'm nobody. Bart. Bart Simpson. He raised one eyebrow. Your name must be even harder to live up to than my John Kennedy. I don't know why I'd chosen that name or why I was surprised that he had watched The Simpsons on TV. I wasn't yet accomplished at the level of deceit necessary for my new cloak-and-dagger life. Now I felt obligated to explain how I, a stranger to him, knew his name and recognized him on sight. My friends and I have been looking for property over in Winkleville. He nodded. A very competitive real estate market. Everyone in the world wants to live in Winkleville. Anyway, I said, digging myself in deeper, since they don't have anything like this place, like a general store, I wondered where they, you know, go to shop. Everyone spoke very highly of Ching Station, John Kennedy Ching, and in fact, the whole Ching family, from your grandparents to your children. His voice and expression were deadpan. They lay it on thick over in Winkleville. My difficulty in negotiating this encounter arose because, as a result of my research, I knew his family's history and admired what they achieved. His grandparents and their two sons, one five years old, the other seven, the latter, John's father, escaped from China in 1948 after the communists opened re-education camps and mass murders began. They made their way to Taiwan, which was then called Formosa and soon emigrated to the United States. For a while, they settled in San Francisco with its flourishing Chinese-American community. However, having fled a large city that was besieged by a violent ideology, they no longer felt safe in a metropolitan area, not even in America. I didn't know, couldn't begin to imagine, how John's grandparents found Pepto or how they were able to envision building Ching Station and making it into the mercantile center of the county. For seven decades, four generations of Chings had been serving the people of Pepto and Winkleville, population 802, and Sunny Slope, population 746, and Sulphur Flats, population 635, and several much smaller sun-baked settlements. The industrious Chings occupied five houses in the vicinity of the crossroads where their enterprise was located, and all five flew the stars and stripes from flagpoles. Deciding that I had best stick strictly to business, I said, Your gas pumps are older than I am. How do they work? I mean, how do I pay and everything? I want to pay cash. It's a mystery, he said, but we can solve it together. I'll switch on pump number one from behind the counter. You go out there and turn the crank until the meter shows only zeros. Then fill up with however much you need and come back here to pay me what the meter says you owe. It's just that in Phoenix you put your credit card or debit card right in the pump. Phoenix, he said, is a place of great wonders. 
Don't some people pump the gas and then drive away without coming back in here to pay? One such scofflaw did exactly that in 1996, John Kennedy Ching said, but we tracked him down to Cleveland, Ohio, and burned his house to the ground. I laughed and nodded. All right, you're pulling my leg. Stepping behind the counter to activate pump number one, he said, You pulled mine first, Bart Simpson. But unless you have excellent insurance on your residence, you better return to pay me. I know it sounds unlikely, but my name really is Bart Simpson. My cross to bear. Oh, and could I have the keys to the men's and women's lavatories? You do not seem to be a young man who is in doubt about his gender, Ching said as he passed the keys to me. I hope I may meet the lady traveling with you. She must be very interesting. By that point, I should have known that it was going to be a day of Ching with more twists than the woven chains of dried red peppers that were for sale in his store. Outside, where Winston had drunk a bowl of water and was busy peeing in the dead grass beyond the parking lot, I gave one key to Bridget and one to Sparky. All right, I told Mr. Ching that my name is Bart Simpson, so be careful not to call me Quinn or anything. Bart Simpson? Sparky said, favoring me with a look of pained incredulity. It was the first thing that came to my mind. There's actually a Mr. Ching? Bridget asked. I assumed that must be some Native American word meaning the end of nowhere. Mr. Ching thinks you must be very interesting. Why would he think that? I made quite an impression on him. Sparky snorted and gave me the key to the Explorer and headed toward the men's room. One more thing, I said. They turned to me. He thinks we've been over in Winkleville looking at property to purchase. There's actually a Winkleville? Bridget asked. It's about four miles from here two miles east of Sulphur Flats and three miles south of Vulture's Roost. If they ever want to build an Arizona Disneyland, she said, it won't be in this part of the state. After telling Winston to sit and stay, I drove the Explorer to pump number one. I cranked the numbers from the previous sale off the meter, filled the tank, and parked again in front of the store. In the men's room, Sparky had finished his business and was studying his face in the mirror. I said, Handsome fella, huh? How'd I ever get to be so old? You didn't die. I'm working on it, he said, stepping outside. I had once regretted being flippant when I remembered Bridget's prediction that not all of us would survive what might lie ahead. A few minutes later, refreshed, I found my three companions waiting for me in the shade of the scalloped green awning near the entrance to the store. Snakes of heat were writhing up from the blacktop highway. We're starving, Sparky said, and the sign on the roof says fresh sandwiches. It also says that well-behaved dogs are welcome, Bridget said. I'm thinking they might sell dog stuff. We need a leash. Just then a grizzled character exited the store with a purchase in each hand. A box of shotgun shells and a fifth of bourbon. Wild tangles of white hair flared out from under his cowboy hat and the length of his beard suggested that he might once have been a member of that old rock group ZZ Top. He looked as if he'd had a part in every Western movie ever made. As he passed us, he glanced at me and said, Tell Homer and Marge they done a nice job with you, and proceeded to the faded blue pickup truck with the I Shoot Tailgaters bumper sticker. Inside, Mr. Ching had concluded resupplying the candy rack and was engaged with small bags of salty snacks. I introduced Bridget as Vanessa, and Sparky as her Uncle Vernon, and I sounded pretty slick if I do say so myself. For a long moment, Mr. Ching stared at her with astonishment, and then regarded me for two seconds, and then looked at her again, as he said, "'Only in America.'" Excuse my saying so, Vanessa, but you do not look like Winkleville. Maybe not, she said, but I much prefer it to Vulture's Roost. Ching Station did indeed cater to dog owners, no less than to grumpy, grizzled old coots who needed ammo and liquor. We selected a nice red collar and leash, a can of tennis balls, and a white lamb squeaky toy for Winston, as well as a packet of teeth-cleaning chews and a case of gourmet dog food. 
A pretty teenage girl worked the small deli section that offered three homemade soups, potato salad, macaroni salad, cakes, cookies, and sandwiches. She said her name was Taylor Ching, that the sandwiches were made fresh every morning and stored in a cooler, that they sold out every day by two o'clock, and that she thought my sister, Lisa, deserved better treatment than she got from me. If I'd just used a name from Family Guy, no one would have known, and the Chings wouldn't have had so much fun at my expense. Sparky paid for everything with drug gang money, and Mr. Ching said he hoped to see us again once we'd moved to Winkleville and took up life along the Little Snake River. We sat in the Explorer, with the air conditioner blasting, to eat our submarine sandwiches, Italian cold cuts for Bridget and me, chicken for Sparky, and wash them down with cold bottles of flavored water. As we ate, we brainstormed ways to find one of the three men who had rescued me back in the day. We could drive thirty miles to the Indian casino where Caesar Melchizedek had been a blackjack pit boss and see if he still worked there. We could check out the wind farm where Bailey Belshazzar had repaired the expensive equipment that suffered regular grievous damage from the thousands of birds that threw themselves so recklessly into the giant chopping blades. We could go to the county office of the power company to learn if Hakeem Kaspar was still living out the Glen Campbell song. Or, Bridget said, we could save a lot of time and just ask Mr. Ching about one of them. After all, he must know everyone from Sulphur Flats to Vulture's Roost to Tarantulaburg. There's no town named Tarantulaburg, she said. I find that hard to believe. So we don't want word getting out that you're poking around here and suddenly... The ISA gets wise to us. We can't ask Ching about all three men because he surely remembers the baby being found on the highway, and he seems like a guy who can read the stitching on a fastball with his eyes shut. From the back seat, Sparky said, Our story could be that I'm an old friend of Akeem's. I lost track of him years ago, and I'm hoping of getting in touch while we're here. See if he has any advice about Winkleville. I said, that sounds simultaneously ridiculous and workable. Go ahead and give it a try. Not a good idea, Sparky demurred. Ching is an intuitive guy. He kept giving me suspicious looks, like he knows my kind. You mean he suspects you were once something, then something else, and then another something that you don't talk about? Precisely. That's amazingly intuitive, I said, as if he has a nose on him more sensitive than Winston's. Grandpa has incredible intuition of his own. I'd trust him on this, Quinn. Uh, Bart. Anyway, Sparky said, Son, you're the only one who has any kind of established relationship with Ching. Relationship? We aren't going steady, for heaven's sake. But he likes you, Sparky insisted. You amuse him. Go in there and amuse him, and get an address for Akeem Kaspar. When I went inside once more, John Kennedy Ching was moving large bags of water softener salt from a cart onto a display near the front door. I said, We wanted to tell you that those sandwiches were absolutely delicious. He cocked his head like a bird looking at something curious. You seem surprised. I would have thought, considering all that the good people of Winkleville had to say about Ching Station, they would have especially praised our sandwiches. I was no match for this guy, so I stopped trying to be clever. The thing is, my future father-in-law, Vernon, fell out of touch with an old friend of his who lives in this area. He's hoping to find him while we're here, pick up where they left off, share some stories about the old days. We thought you might know him, where he lives now. Who is this old friend? Hakeem Kaspar. Yes, said Ching. He is a lineman for the county. That's him. Ching said. He rides the main road. Vernon will be so happy. Like most days, he's been searching in the sun for another overload, Ching said. Do you have an address for him? His place is on the old Apache Trail. It's a dirt road with no signs. I'll draw you a little map. You'll be there in ten minutes at this time of day. At night, in May, with the spring insects at their peak, spattering your windshield and the bats swarming, you'd need twenty minutes, maybe more. Go while it's light. He went behind the checkout counter and took a small tablet from a drawer. 
He wrote directions on the front of a page and then drew a map on the back of it. When he handed the paper to me, I said, Swarming bats? From mid-May through mid-June. When the flying insects are most plentiful, the bats come to feed on them in flight. Thousands of bats, clouds of wings that hide in the moon. Wow, that must be quite a sight. Yes, Ching said, but not one that a sane man should want to see. We'll scoot right out there. I hope he's not on the job. Well, the lineman is still on the line. He starts before dawn, Ching said, but he finishes with that stretch down south about now. You'll probably catch him just as he's getting home. 20. John Kennedy Ching had not only written directions and drawn a map, but he also had sketched a perfect image of the mobile home in which Hakeem Kaspar lived. It was a handsome 50-footer, raised on concrete blocks. At one end was a covered patio, where you could sit during an afternoon and watch the desert vegetation wither in the heat as small animals and lizards dragged themselves across scorching sands. At the other end was a carport in which stood a Ford F-150 pickup with oversized tires. An array of three satellite dishes on the roof evidently provided him with TV and Internet access. Though I couldn't imagine why anyone would seek refuge from the maddening crowd in this wasteland and then subject himself to Twitter. Hakeem's front yard was dirt and gravel stone and a few sprigs of gray grass. I didn't feel that it was rude to park on it. When we got out of the Explorer, we heard a generator most likely fueled by propane. Hakim was beyond the reach of the public power supply, so he had to provide his own electricity in order to enjoy the amenities of civilization, as well as to pump water from his well. He evidently had added a muffler to the generator, because it labored softly, like a family of bears snoring in hibernation. I powered the windows of the SUV down an inch and left the engine running to ensure that Winston continued to have fresh and cooled air. Bridget gave him the lamb's squeaky toy for company. Maybe it was the first toy he'd ever had. He just stared at it as it lay there on the back seat until she picked it up and encouraged him to take it in his mouth. With what seemed to be a bewildered expression, the lambkin hanging from his jaw by one leg, he watched us walk toward the trailer. Considering that Hakeem Kaspar's residence was the only one in sight, and that, past his place, the dirt road seemed to lead into either a pre-human past or a post-human future, it was no surprise that he heard us arrive and opened the door as we approached and carried a pistol and a holster on his right hip. He appeared to be in his late forties, with decades of sunshine stored in his deeply tanned face. Judging by his name, I assumed his ancestors came from the Middle East, though he looked like a twin to the Cuban band leader who was married to Lucille Ball in that old TV series, I Love Lucy. His large eyes were open wide, as if something about us alarmed him. Instead of asking us who we were, he said, Stop right there, and come forward one at a time to be scared. I don't know you. I can't trust anyone I don't know, and I don't trust half those I do know. In his left hand, Hakeem held an object the size of a slim, hard-cover book, something rather like a Kindle, to which was wired an instrument resembling an infrared digital thermometer that he gripped in his right hand. Assuming the thing wasn't a weapon, I stepped forward. He needed perhaps half a minute to scan me, consulting a screen on the book-sized device. Bridget complied next, and then Sparky. Hakeem said, Okay, all right, you seem to be what you appear to be if that means anything. Now, who are you? ID, please. I saw no point in pretending to be Bart Simpson, or for that matter, Bugs Bunny. I'd come there to ask him about the morning he'd found me in a bassinet. When I held out my driver's license, his wide-eyed gaze widened further. The suspicion that had iced his every word now melted into astonishment. Qu qu Quinn? Qu Quicksilver? Not the one and same. The one and same, I assured him, from the bassinet. I outgrew it. They sent you away. I came back. My life was never the same. The same as what? I asked. Never the same after you. 
I've come to thank you for my life, I said, and to ask you about that morning. This is Bridget, who tells me she's my fiancé, and this is her grandfather, Sparky. Do you want to see their ID? No, that's all right. They passed the scan. I've got to trust the scanner. If I can't trust the scanner, then what can I trust? So very true, Bridget said. Is that a dog in your SUV? Yes, I said. You must be all right if a dog will associate with you. Dogs can always be trusted. He regarded us in silence, scanning our faces without using the scanner this time. Then he said, The only people I let in here are my best friend and my girlfriend. Everyone else I know, I either visit them at their homes or on neutral ground. You can understand that. We all agreed that we could understand, and I said we would be happy just to sit in the shade of the covered patio and ask a few questions. His voice, now hushed with awe, he said, But you're the baby in the bassinet. Yeah, that's me. I often dream of you as a baby. They're good dreams. In them, I'm famous and honored for finding you on the highway. You're always three days old, no matter how much time passes. And I never grow old as long as I'm with you. And all kinds of animals look after you, including a bear that feeds you honey with a golden spoon. I didn't know what to say to that. So, uncharacteristically, I said nothing. Finally, Hakim said, Well, I guess if you were going to spin me up in a cocoon or plant an egg in my brain or kill me, you'd have done it already. Come on in. Can I get you coffee or anything? I followed Bridget and Sparky up the three metal steps and into the habitat of a man consumed by an obsession. 21. Taped to the ceiling, walls, cabinet doors, and permanently lowered window shades were photographs torn from fringe magazines and downloaded from the Internet, images of classic flying saucers as well as UFOs or other configurations, some blurry or captured in half-light, others crisp and intriguing, many of them sure to be hoaxes. Crowding every surface, they were a claustrophobia-inducing collection of extraterrestrial mystery. The place smelled of clove buds that were piled in small dishes and placed strategically throughout the trailer. The essence was so thick in the air that I could taste it as well as smell it. In the living room, forward of the galley, I had settled on the sofa with Bridget, while Sparky occupied an armchair. Hakim sat in a second armchair, but repeatedly got up to pace restlessly, now and then patting the grip of the holstered pistol, as though to reassure himself that he was still armed in case one of us attempted to plant an egg in his brain, after all. What I'm going to tell you is between us. If you speak a word of it to anyone, I'll deny I ever said what I said. We didn't tell any of this to the sheriff when we brought you to him. We didn't want everyone in the county thinking we were either doing magic mushrooms together or cooking up a story or maybe getting a movie deal. Anyway, the sheriff is a good man, but he has no more imagination than a rock. He'd have thought we were liars or lunatics, and he might have sent us to county general for psychiatric evaluation. From under his pleated and beetling brow, he glared at us until we solemnly agreed never to quote him. I had no interest in UFOs before that day, said the lineman. Zero. Zip. Nada. They were a joke to me. Not anymore. I usually hit the road an hour before dawn, but I set out late that morning. I was heading north out of Pepto on the Federal, as the land took shape in the first light. I've got my punch sheet of inspections to make, and I'm always studying the lines so I don't speed. I was poking along like usual— when I noticed some white thing in the center of the three lanes. When I slowed almost to a stop, I saw a young girl, maybe in her late teens, out there on the flats, running away from the road, toward one of those three-wheel all-terrain vehicles with big fat tires like a tricycle for grown-ups. This young thing slips astride it and speeds away among the sage and mesquite, dust spewing up behind her. I suppose she was your mother. No mention of such a person had appeared in the news story about the baby on the highway. For so long I had accepted being an orphan and being never able to discover who had abandoned me, so I was surprised to be overcome by a 
sentimental yearning to know more about that young woman, if nothing other than the color of her hair, her eyes. But Hakim had seen her only at a distance, and not clearly enough in the early light to report any details about her with confidence. Bridget took one of my hands and held it in both of hers. Her hands felt unusually warm, so mine must have gone cold. Hakim erupted from his armchair and paced back into the dining area, into the galley, and then came toward us again. I parked on the pavement with the truck's emergency lights flashing and went to see what the girl had left in the basket. I didn't realize it was a bassinet. When I saw a baby, I felt sick that someone would be so desperate to throw away such a precious thing. Stopping at a set of bookshelves that contained volumes about UFOs and ancient astronauts, he plucked one of the many clove buds from a small dish on a shelf and brought it to his nose. He breathed deeply a few times and returned the bud to the dish. Just then, he continued, I heard engines approaching fast from both the north and south. The first was Caesar Melchizedek, on his way to work at the casino, and the other was Bailey Belshazzar in his Chevy pickup, headed for the wind farm. With my power company truck blocking one lane, something bad could have happened. I should have grabbed the bassinet and taken you off the highway, but I was kind of, I don't know, emotionally paralyzed by what I'd found. I wasn't thinking straight. I waved down both Caesar and Bailey. They pulled off on the shoulder of the road and got out of their vehicles to see what the trouble was. He sat once more, back stiff, arms on the arms of the chair, hands clutching the upholstery, feet pressed flat on the floor, as though bracing himself for an earthquake. He remained wide-eyed, and gradually it became clear that neither our unannounced visit nor my identity accounted for his expression of surprise, which seemed perpetual, as though every smallest thing he looked upon astonished him. We gathered around the bassinet, he said. I was on my knees. Caesar was on one knee, and Bailey was crouched down. They were facing me, so they didn't at first see what I saw behind them. Forty feet past them, right there on the highway, it was as if this large door opened, maybe fifteen feet wide and twice as high, an invisible door, a door in the day. It opened inward, and beyond it, there wasn't the highway or desert cobblestones, like an ancient road, dwindled away into darkness. Not just into night, but into a star-filled nothingness, as if the cobblestones were floating in space, with stars under and above and to all sides. Even one day earlier, I might have sided with Sheriff Moncton and the prescription of a psychiatric evaluation for Hakeem, but not after the screamers at the truck stop. He flung himself up from the chair and began to pace again, combing his hair back from his forehead with the fingers of his right hand, his left hand shaking like that of a man with a benign tumor. As if the weight of his revelations made him heavier, each footfall sent a soft, hollow thump through the crawl space under the floor, as had not been the case before. Weirder still, I get the feeling that someone or something is coming toward us along that cobblestone road. Coming out of the stars. No, wait, that's not right. It's not just some feeling. I know for sure that something's approaching along the cobblestones because I can feel it coming. Something powerful. The way you feel the air taking on weight when a thunderstorm is coming. And then I can almost see what it is. It's invisible, but I can see the space where it is, just inside the door in the day. It's like how... Heat rising off a highway distorts the air, so the air ripples and quivers. The air is quivering in the shape of a man, a very tall man or something like a man, but I can't see him, only the suggestion of him. I think I must be losing it, having a breakdown. But then somehow I know he's real, and that he's there because of the baby. Worried that the baby has been abandoned on a highway and wants to be sure it's safe. I don't know what I said then, but I must have said something because Caesar and Bailey turned to look. I expected maybe they wouldn't see anything, but they did. They did. He went into the kitchen, opened the refrigerator, and withdrew a beer. 
He popped the cap off the bottle and returned to his chair and took several long swallows. He didn't offer us a drink. Reliving the supernatural event on the highway probably so unnerved him that he expected to need every bottle he had before the day was done. After a silence, Sparky said, Around? Hakeem stared at him for maybe half a minute. He looked at the bottle of beer that he'd half finished. He took another swallow. So then, we all shoot to our feet. We're like, this can't be happening. I mean, it's a door in the day. Then a hissing sound and a gust of wind make us look up. Overhead, there's now a hole in the sky. A hole in the sky. Do I sound crazy to you? I'm not mental. Do you think I'm mental? As earnestly as we were able to, the three of us assured him that we did not think he was mental. Hakim said, So it's like somebody just opened a big lid on the day. Through that opening, maybe twelve feet in diameter, we see a night sky, darkness and stars going on forever, just like beyond the magic door. I think we're about to be sucked up into that night sky. Instead, these concentric circles of blue light come out of the hole, out of the stars, and wash over us. We feel them as well as see them, a tingling sensation in our bones, and something funny happens to time. I was pretty sure he meant funny scary, not funny ha-ha. He finished the beer. None of us has any memory of getting in our vehicles. The next thing we know, it seems like an instant later, we're in Pepto, me with the baby, that's you, in the power company truck, Bailey and Caesar following. We all had this terrible feeling that the baby was in great danger, that someone could come for him, for you, at any moment. Hell, not someone, something. Something that would kill us to get at you. I swear... We were flat-out terrified. It makes no sense how crazy frightened we were. We'd been made terrified. I think that weird blue light, those concentric circles, somehow they programmed us to guard you and get you quickly away from that lonely stretch of highway into the hands of the authorities, eventually to someone who would care about you as if you were their own child. I kept thinking that your vital thread had been broken, that the ends of your vital thread couldn't be tied together again until you were in loving hands. What does that mean, vital thread? I asked. I don't know what the hell it means, but I was in a panic about it. He raised the bottle to his lips and seemed surprised that he had drained it. Bridget's turn had come to say, And? No, I'm done. I'm empty. I have no more for you. Bailey and Caesar didn't see quite the same thing I did. You need to hear their side to get the whole picture. Where are they? Sparky asked. How do we contact them? Two months after what happened, Caesar quit his job as pit boss and split from the casino scene. Maybe he didn't get religion, but he got something. He went to Florida to work in a hospice his sister founded, taking care of people who were dying. Bailey still lives in the heart of Pepto. Wife passed away. He'll tell you his side, and Caesar's. He up and quit the wind farm back when, started making a living with music. He put the empty bottle on the table beside his chair. He stared at it, as if it were a mystical object filled with recondite meaning. And then he looked at me the way you might stare at a two-headed goat. He said, What is it with you, Quinn Quicksilver? What do you mean? What are you? Confused, I admitted. Why are space aliens so interested in you? I'm not aware of any space aliens, I assured him. We just came here because I was hoping, you know, I might get a lead on who my parents are. Maybe the best way to find out, Hakim said with apparent sincerity and no quality of menace in his voice, is to send your spit to one of those places like gettingtoknowme.com. That's an idea, I said. I'll definitely look into it. 
while Bridget took a pen and paper from her purse and wrote down the directions to Bailey Belshazzar's place that Hakeem gave her, Sparky went to the bookshelves to have a look at the titles on the spines of the volumes. He took a clove bud from the little dish and brought it close to his nose and said, Hakeem, why the cloves? I read somewhere that the smell repels the greys. It's like garlic with vampires. Greys? Sparky asked. Just then we heard a sudden bass throbbing that quickly became louder. The air-chopping clatter of a helicopter. Not a small two-man police helo, but something larger. Through the window behind Hakim's chair, I saw it coming, flying low and fast. Black twin engines, high-set mane and tail rotors. The big craft roared over us and away. As the sound of it diminished and the mobile home stopped vibrating, I didn't give the helo further thought. Military bases are a common feature of the Southwest. I assumed that some pilot was engaging in flight training. Grace, Hakeem said, are the most common types of ETs reported by people who were abducted and taken up to the mothership. Their skin is gray. You must have seen drawings of them. They're kind of short, sexless, hairless, with big oval heads and huge dark eyes with no whites. The grays are up to something. And it's not good. They want something from us that we can't begin to imagine. I hope to God I never find out what it is. I hope they don't get what they want from me. This was a haunted man. A troubled man. His life forever sent off the rails because he had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And had seen something that he could neither understand nor forget. If I had found him amusing, it was because I tend to find most people amusing, not least of all myself. After all, each of us is an eccentric in one way or another, to one degree or another. However, I was beginning to feel that Hakim was a tragic figure, a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder who was trapped in a spiral staircase of dread with no exit at the top or bottom, ceaselessly racing up and down and up. I indicated the scanning device that he had left on the coffee table. Is that a gray detector? No, no. Grays aren't shape changers. I got this from a techie flying saucer guru in Arkansas. He builds and programs them himself. It's based on a Chinese facial recognition system, LL Vision, but without the usual glasses. And it's not about facial recognition, but about scanning for structural anomalies. Anything that might indicate the human form is merely a costume. I'm not mental. Of course you're not, I said. Have you ever scanned anyone who's set off an alarm? Not yet. But with UFO activity increasing, it's bound to happen one day. Thank God for Miles Bennell. He's a genius. Miles Bennell? He's the guru techie in Arkansas who sells these things, Bridget said. Is UFO activity really increasing? Springing up from his chair with the kinetic energy of a jack-in-the-box, Hakeem Kaspar said, It always has been, ever since the 1940s. It's always accelerating. The activity, number of sightings, towards some end. Who knows what end? Many nights I sit out in the yard, in a lawn chair, and I watch the sky. Many nights. If you do that, you'll be surprised at what you'll see. You'll see things that never took off from an earthly airport and will never land at one. Immense craft without running lights, dark forms that blot out the stars as they pass. I've seen them. I watch and I see them and I'm not mental. His feverish gaze slid from Bridget to me to Sparky. He took a deep breath. Don't tell anyone what I said. My job at the power company depends on this being secret. My interest in... In these things is something they wouldn't understand. After we promised to keep his secret, we departed. I was the last to leave. At the door, I put a hand on Hakim's shoulder and said, I'm sorry. I looked around at the hundreds of UFO photos papering nearly everything. I didn't leave myself in the middle of that highway, but I feel responsible for what you've been through, for what you're going through. His eyes at last narrowed. He squinted at me, as if scanning for structural anomalies. Then he startled me by throwing his arms around me and saying, No, 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 no. 
He released me. His eyes were owlish again and now glimmering with unshed tears. Before you. Before baby you. Before that door in the day and that hole in the sky. I was just marking time. Just existing. There was no wonder in my life. No magic. Nothing to believe in except a paycheck and a six-pack. That day. What happened on that stretch of highway? After that... I understood the world wasn't just a movie screen, wasn't just flat. There was depth to it, strangeness and meaning. I don't know what meaning, but it's something big, and I'm a part of it. If there are evil greys, and there are, then there must be other ETs, good blues or some other color. Whatever's out there, it's anything you could imagine, everything you could imagine. Because the universe is that big. I owe you, Quinn Quicksilver. I owe you for my happiness. Well, even I, for all my limitations, discerned two lessons from Hakim's heartfelt response. First, it is a mistake to presume to know anyone's internal emotional landscape based on what external emotional signals they seem to be sending. Second, you can apologize for something you have done, but only a fool apologizes for things that other people have done, for he has no authority to do that. And so I felt like a fool as I left the trailer, though like a fool with the best intentions. I took solace in the fact that although I had inspired Hakim to pursue profound meaning where he would never find it, UFOs, greys, blues, motherships, abductees given rectal exams by freaky aliens— at least I had inspired wonder in the poor guy. In time, wonder might lead to that more elevated feeling that is awe. The yielding of the mind to the reverence of what is supremely grand and true. When I joined Sparky and Bridget in front of the Explorer, she said, Winston is going to be so excited. We smell like hams baking in an oven. What was that all about, the huggy thing? He says he owes his happiness to me. Baby me, to be specific. Sparky frowned. Happiness? It's contagious, isn't it? I said. I went in there glum and I came out so carefree I want to dance. Now we better go see Bailey Belshazzar. There's still plenty of daylight left, but I want to be sure to be out of Pepto before the curtain opens on the Bugs and Bats show. Looking past us toward the trailer, Sparky said, What's this? This was Hakeem hurrying toward us, holding a smartphone high overhead, as if carrying the Olympic torch. He enjoyed phone service out here. His connectivity must have had something to do with one of the satellite dishes on his roof. John Ching just called. You can't go to Bailey's place, Hakeem warned. Not now, not ever. That helicopter was carrying ISA agents, eight or nine of the bastards. They're already at Bailey's house. They've commandeered his SUV and two of the sheriff's patrol cars. No doubt they'll be here as soon as they can get anyone to tell them how to find my place, which won't be right away because the people of Pepto don't traffic with their kind. You've got to go straight to Panthea. Bailey would have sent you to her after you'd visited with him. Panthea has been expecting you for weeks. Weeks, Bridget said. We didn't know we were coming here until yesterday. Yes, but Panthea sees. Sees what? What a seer sees when a seer dreams. Well, of course. Silly of me not to understand. You must go to Panthea. She's waiting for you. You'll be safe with her. No one will think to look for you there. I was sure that was true, because even I would never have thought to look for me there, wherever there might be. Yeah, okay, but I don't know anyone named Panthea. Panthea who? Hakim regarded me with frustration and amazement unable to comprehend how the miracle baby from the stars could be so clueless. Panthea who? Panthea who? Panthea Ching, of course. 22. Winston had arrived at an understanding of the purpose of a toy. During our trip from Hakim's outpost to Panthea's home, to which the ufologist had directed us with extravagant gestures, the pooch lay on the back seat beside Sparky, incessantly squeaking the white lamb, all the while happily slapping the seat with his tail. 
I knew a guy, Sparky said, wanted to protect his children. He had an attack dog that lived up to its name. If you tried to give it a toy, it would have taken off your hand and eaten it. Seems dangerous. A dog like that around little kids, I said. Not these kids. They were tough little bastards. The dog had profound respect for them. With afternoon light slanting across the still and colorless land, short shadows of low cacti and mesquite prickled the earth. But the usually reliable sameness of a desert day would not sustain until nightfall. A tide of dark gray thunderheads stacked on squall clouds was surging in from the southwest, soon to drown the sun. In advance of the storm, the hot air began to cool, and its faint alkaline scent faded. Panthea, the daughter of John Kennedy Ching, didn't occupy one of the family's five houses in the vicinity of Ching Station. She lived beyond the vaguely defined limits of Pepto, in that otherwise unpopulated suburb that, I knew from my research, locals referred to as Dead Dan's Wasteland, though Dan was so lost in the dust storms of history that no one remembered who he'd been, when he'd lived, or how he'd died. Panthea's place was at the end of a gravel road in a large, insulated Quonset hut that she'd converted into a residence. The structure dated to early World War II, when the government had conducted secret experiments here that no one dared speak about, resulting in thirteen deaths and the toxic contamination of the soil that took over half a century to resolve. Rumor had it that an unintended consequence of the experimentation had been the mutation of six-legged Jerusalem crickets into terrors as big as dachshunds, with teeth that would shred bone as easily as flesh, creatures that had to be exterminated with flamethrowers and submachine guns and a desperate three-day bug war. Eighty years had passed since then, and no one had seen such a fearsome beast, so whatever else had happened here... The cricket business must be an apocryphal story with no more substance than the rumor that, in the same decade, an atomic bomb had been developed elsewhere in a program called the Manhattan Project. Three satellite dishes were fixed to the curved roof. Like Hakim, the resident considered connectivity a high priority. Now thirty, Panthea had moved at a distance from her family when she was eighteen because she had foreseen that eventually she would be murdered in the night by unhuman assassins, and she didn't want her relatives to be collateral damage. As he'd finished giving us directions, Hakim Kaspar, who'd seen a door in the day and a hole in the sky, who had shaped the previous twenty years of his life according to the belief that the territory hereabouts served as a hub of extraterrestrial activity, had winked when he'd told us about the unhuman assassins and had said, Panthea is a bit of an eccentric, but this territory produces more than a few. All in all, in spite of the unhuman assassin silliness, she's a great lady and true seer. Having heard the explorer approaching, Panthea was waiting for us in the open door of the Quonset hut. She was five feet one and weighed maybe ninety-five pounds, prettier than any desert flower, of which there are many that dazzle. If her ears had been slightly pointed, I would have been convinced that she had elf DNA, for her blue eyes were quite large and so limpid that you could see the radiant pleats of the layered muscles in her irises. Although she had the physique of an adolescent and the innocent face of a child, she was an undeniably powerful presence. Standing spread-legged, wearing a blood-red tunic and gray jeans tucked into black combat boots, her black hair was chopped in a short shag, her hands fisted on her hips, as if she was confident of being able to Jackie Chan us all if we proved to be a threat. As we got out of the Explorer, she told us to bring Winston. When he was freed from the SUV, he raced across the hard pan, past Panthea, and into the Quonset hut, as if he had once lived here and was excited to return home. Panthea looked each of us in the eye, nodding as if confirming our identity by some sixth sense. Quinn? Bridget, Silas, who calls himself Sparky, I knew you would come. The squad is now complete. Squad, I said. One squad of many, but no less important than the others. Each of us is an olive shell halakha, with a great responsibility. 
We're on a quest, I said. It's nothing as simple as a quest, Bridget said. Isn't it a quest? I asked Panthea, the seer. Perhaps a quest, but not only a quest. I was having none of that. We find the equivalent of the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the Elephant's Graveyard, and then it's done, Sparky said. What does that mean, Olive? whatever? When you know why you are here, Panthea Ching said, you will know what those words mean. Why I am? My mom and dad wanted a baby. That's why I am. Now please, Miss Ching, what does Aloof Shell Halibut mean? It means nothing to you now. In time, it will. Frustrated to be on the receiving end of the kind of enigmatic statements that he and Bridget had often dished out to me, Sparky said, It was a simple question. There are no simple questions, the seer replied. Only simple answers, some of which it's best you discern for yourself. Anyway, some squads prefer to say olive shell TV chalk. Still others say, Legus naturalis propagnator. The sentiment is the same. And what is the sentiment? Bridget asked. Resist, said Panthea. Resist what? You need not ask what you already know. Come in, come in. The ISA will be saturating the county with agents. But we have a few hours yet before they'll be breaking down my door. You must see what I paint in my sleep. You will recognize it. I began to realize that this was not going to be the date on my calendar when I would learn the identity of my parents, or even the least thing about them. The theme of the day was instead about the strange, cognizant destiny that links human lives in unexpected ways. The Ching Rain King Quicksilver Squad had been drawn together by something more than psychic magnetism— However, any attempt that I might make to define something more would lead me nowhere except to the insolvable mystery of human existence or into the cold waters of Akeem Kaspar's obsession. As to the latter, when we followed Panthea into the Quonset hut, she seemed to have heard my thoughts. Though she was merely acting in her role as the squad's seer, disabusing us of whatever credibility we might have given to the possibility of motherships and off-worlders who were gray or any other color. This isn't about extraterrestrials from other galaxies, or from a farther arm of our own, or from a moon of Saturn. That stuff is for the movies. If only our adversaries were evil ETs, I'd rejoice. But the war into which we've been drafted is older than Earth itself, and older than the stars, and we have no choice but to give ourselves to the current battle. The war predates the universe, as do our enemies. How like madness that sounded at the time Panthea said it. As I wrote earlier, I see every human being as an eccentric to one degree or another. This can be true only if our assumption that there is a standard for normalty is wrong. And I believe it is wrong. The human race is at the apex of all life forms because... No matter how strenuously sociologists and politicians and others of their persuasion insist on defining our species into interest groups and factions and classes and tribes, the better to control us, in truth our greatest strength is in the uniqueness of each of us. Einstein, in his genius, can reveal to us much about the workings of the universe, and a child with Down syndrome can teach us, by his or her profound gentleness and humility, how urgently this troubled world needs kindness. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone but sociopaths. Those empty souls possess no genuine human feelings other than a lust for power, but are excellent at faking them. Some say that as many as 10% of human beings are sociopaths. Some are street thugs who will kill you for the contents of your wallet or merely for the thrill of it. Others are among the most elite and privileged groups in society.